Symphony of Bones, a Cassie Quinn Mystery. Written by L.T. Ryan and K.M. Rott. Narrated by Patricia Santomasso and Sean Patrick Hopkins. Chapter One Senator Lawrence Grayson stood inside his Charlotte office and peered out the window at the dark clouds above him. He didn't have a scenic view from this side of the building, but it couldn't be helped. Someday he'd have a front row seat to the Rose Garden, and that was enough to get him through days like this. Grayson caught his reflection in the window and straightened his tie. He ran a hand over his gray-streaked, dark brown hair, long enough to provide some style, but short enough to give him a clean, groomed look. He smiled at his reflection in the window never dimming the bright blue of his eyes, which had won him favor from men and women alike. Even his beard, kept short and tidy, had turned more than a few heads. But these days, Grayson noticed his hair was more silver than brown, and his eyes had a few more bags underneath. Politics wasn't for the faint of heart, and if being in the state senate had aged him this much, he couldn't imagine what he'd look like by the end of his two terms as president. Then again, that's why hair dye and Botox existed. He'd resisted until now, because so far his looks had done him no disservice. It was only a matter of time before he would no longer be able to rely on what God had given him. Once nature had run its course, he'd turn to today's spectacular technology. Someone knocked sharply on the door. Senator Grayson turned to find his publicist, Anastasia Bolton, entering the room in a black leather skirt and a maroon turtleneck sweater tucked into the waistband. Her long, blood-red nails clutched a tablet in one hand and a pile of paperwork in the other, and perfectly matched her lipstick. She was an attractive woman. Pin-straight black hair framed her high cheekbones and dark eyes. Grayson had once asked her if she was seeing anyone prompting her to go on a five-minute tirade about how it was none of his business, and that if he wanted her to continue to work for him, he would never ask her a single personal question again. He was so taken aback, he'd simply nodded his head, and they'd carried on like nothing had ever happened. That was over a year ago, and it had proven to be the best decision of his life. Anastasia had not only made him the talk of the town in North Carolina, but she'd gotten him trending on Twitter more than once. His future aspirations were within reach. Good morning, sir. Anastasia set the paperwork down on the desk just as Grayson sank into his chair. You've got a full day ahead of you. Will there ever be a time when I don't have a full day? When you're dead. She didn't even crack a smile. First thing I need from you is a commitment to a charity. What will I have to do? Anastasia sat down opposite him and crossed her legs. She placed the tablet on her knee, swiping and clicking with fervor. She was probably checking emails, answering Twitter questions, lining up interviews, buying him a new suit, and coordinating dinner with his colleagues. All the while, he'd only eaten half his breakfast this morning. You'll need to make at least three appearances. One will be volunteer work in either casual attire or without your jacket and your sleeves rolled up. Get a little messy, real of the people vibes, she told him. Choices, he asked. Children's hospital, veterans, or animal shelter? You have a preference? Anastasia looked up, her finger paused an inch above the tablet's screen. Animals are a crowd pleaser, but it lacks depth, unless your aspirations stop at president of the American Kennel Club. Right, so children are vets. She went back to swiping. Children are always good, but they're unpredictable. You'll probably have to cry. I'm not good at crying. I know. I think we should go with the vets. You could have just said that from the start. It's better if it seems like your idea. Clients get defiant when they think their strings are being pulled, and that wouldn't be good for either of us. Grayson resisted the urge to roll his eyes. She was still looking at her tablet, but she'd know. She always knew. I'm well aware I sold my soul to the devil. Defiance wouldn't serve my purpose. This time, she smiled. 
It would surprise you how many people understand that and still can't help themselves. Grayson liked to think he differed from all the others, that he had more discipline. But trying to convince Anastasia of that was pointless. What will I have to do with the vets? She pointed a crimson-tipped finger at the paperwork in front of him. There are a few different organizations in there. Read through their mission statements and volunteer opportunities. Tell me what you like best. I'm thinking soup kitchens, meet and greets, maybe something with disabled vets. I have some friends in the tech industry. We can give a couple vets a new leg or something. Anastasia bobbed her head up and down. Perfect, I like that. Give me some company names by the end of the day. I'll see which one fits our image best. He hated the way she talked about his image that way. Sure, she'd catapulted him from a nobody to a national sensation within a matter of a couple of years, but it was still his face on everything, his voice, his policies. It made him feel a little better that Anastasia was just a cog in the machine, too. She didn't have any actual power. Her power came from the company she worked for, Apex Publicity, the real puppet masters. But in order to keep them happy, he had to keep Anastasia happy. No problem. Anything else? He asked. Anastasia didn't answer for a moment. She swiped her finger across the tablet's screen a few more times, then placed it on the seat beside her. Grayson sat up. She rarely let go of that thing. Your son. Grayson deflated. If there was one thing he couldn't control, one thing he couldn't keep locked down and out of the public eye, it was his son. What did he do now? Nothing, which makes me think we're due for another incident. The last thing Grayson wanted to do was admit she was right. But when it came to Connor, he couldn't deny the truth. What do you propose? Are you still going to family counseling? Yes, but I can't force him to go. And we've had to cancel the last two because of Mary's hospital visits. How is she doing? The question sounded robotic. It was like when someone asks how you are, and you're forced to return the inquiry, even if you couldn't give two shits about the answer. She's doing better. Grayson leaned forward. Look, I've done everything I can to handle Connor. I'm out of ideas. Ideas are our business. She tapped one of her crimson fingernails against her chin. Let's see, he's 19, good looking, going to school for computer science. A bit of a nerd, but has a rebellious streak. He's still doing drugs? Yes. The word came out through gritted teeth. He hated how she knew his son as well as he did, maybe better. She snapped her fingers. A girlfriend. He has one of those. She laughed. We'll set something up. Get him to dump her. No, she'll dump him, break his heart for a while. Then we'll introduce him to one of our girls. Someone who makes him feel like he's still rebelling, but who can keep him in line. A man in love is easier to control. Grayson wasn't sure what to say. On the one hand, he knew there were relationships of convenience out there. In his line of business, compatibility and common goals were more important than romance. Sometimes it was easier to get to the top as a power couple. And if you didn't care about the sanctity of marriage, it was the perfect solution. Senator Grayson loved his wife. From the moment he met her, he knew they'd get married. He'd always had political aspirations, and while she had been content as a kindergarten teacher, she'd given it up to become a politician's wife. Their marriage wasn't always perfect, but it was real. Was he capable of manipulating his son like that? Was having a shot at the presidency worth allowing Apex to play his son like a fiddle? Anastasia must have seen the gears turning in his mind. It wasn't a request, Senator. He swallowed the bile that had crept up his throat. I'm aware, Miss Bolton. I was momentarily considering the consequences should any of this come to light. It won't. She picked up her tablet again. Apex is where we turn your dreams into reality. You want a son you can control? We'll make it happen. Grayson's smile was tight. This wasn't what he'd had in mind when he had signed on with Apex, but he'd be lying to himself if he said he hadn't known who he was getting into bed with. Another knock on the door interrupted his thoughts. Come in. 
a man in a black suit entered the room. His name was Alex Murphy, and he was the head of the senator's security team. He was an imposing man with short cropped hair, a clean shaven face, and eyes as piercing as Grayson's. He stood a head taller than the senator, and every day, Grayson was happy the man was on his team and not someone else's. What's wrong? Grayson asked. It's your son, sir. Murphy didn't mince words. Another reason Grayson liked him. We can't find him. Grayson stood up behind his desk. What do you mean you can't find him? Murphy gave Anastasia a quick glance, but he'd learned long ago that no topics were off limits when discussing important matters in front of her. After your argument last night, he crossed the border to South Carolina and spent the night in Rock Hill. On his way home, he gave my team the slip. We weren't too worried about it until he didn't show up to any of his classes today. Anastasia finally turned in her chair. How did a 19-year-old boy give your team the slip? Murphy's face was neutral, but Grayson saw his eyes narrow. Unfortunately, it happens from time to time, ma'am. Telling someone is not an exact science. Grayson cursed under his breath. Do you know what he was doing in Rock Hill? Not yet, sir. I have someone retracing his steps. I wanted to inform you of the situation. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Everyone in the room knew that was a practiced lie. Anastasia turned to face the senator again and raised one perfect eyebrow. What did I tell you? Senator Grayson put his back to both of them. The clouds in the sky had darkened further, threatening rain. He hoped his kid was safe, but he also wanted his son to learn a lesson he'd never forget. Connor's last scandal had nearly cost Grayson his seat in the Senate. His opponent had brought up Connor's DUI, saying if he couldn't handle what went on in his own household, how would he ever handle an entire state worth of issues? Grayson had skated through by the skin of his teeth, appealing to people's humanity and spinning a story about his family being like everyone else's. Anyone who tried to present a picture of perfection was obviously lying, and he, Lawrence Grayson, was no liar. He was doing his best, just like his constituents. It had worked, barely. Grayson turned back to the room. Keep me updated, Murphy. Every hour, let me know what's going on. Murphy nodded and left the room. Grayson turned back to his publicist. Let's go through worst case scenarios. I want to be prepared. Anastasia was on the move. I'm calling Apex. They should be aware we might have a shitstorm ahead of us. Is that really nest? Yes. She already had the phone to her ear. You never win by keeping secrets from Apex. When she left the room, Grayson loosened his tie and pulled out the bottle of whiskey he had stashed in the back of his desk drawer. It was for celebrations and emergencies only, and there was no denying which one this was. Whatever Connor had done, Senator Lawrence Grayson knew deep in his bones it was about to change everything. Chapter Two Cassie's eyes opened as soon as she felt the car shift into park. It took a few seconds to remind herself where she was and what she was doing. Her neck ached and drool slid down the side of her cheek. She wiped it clean and brought the passenger seat to an upright position. Laura giggled to her left. What? Cassie asked. You're a mess. Fix your hair. We're just around the corner. Cassie's heart shuddered to a stop and then restarted. She pulled down the visor and checked herself in the mirror. Her sister wasn't lying. She had some dried drool stuck to the corners of her mouth. Her eyes were red, and her hair looked like she'd stuck her finger in an electrical socket. Cassie attempted to tame her appearance. The last thing she remembered was pulling away from her house a couple hours ago. And then she had that awful dream where Laura had told her Sarah Lennox's murder was all her fault. Cassie shook the memory from her mind. Why'd you stop? To make sure you were ready, Laura hesitated. Are you ready? You want the truth? Always. No. Anything I can do to change that? Cassie flipped the visor up and sighed. 
She admired her sister's perfect curls and bright eyes. Not unless you want to turn the car around. Not really. Laura laid a gentle hand on her leg. What's going through your mind? Cassie leaned her head back and stared at the roof of her car. Sometimes she hated that Laura was a psychologist, always trying to get her to talk about her feelings. And sometimes she was grateful someone pushed her out of her comfort zone. I'm nervous. Obviously, the plan was to surprise mom and dad, but I'm not sure how smart that is. What if they're upset we dropped in like this? They're our parents. They won't get upset. We have lifetime couch crashing credentials. You might. I'm not sure if I do. Look at me. Laura waited until Cassie met her eyes. I talk to mom and dad all the time. They ask about you constantly. And it's not like you haven't spoken in the last 10 years. It's just been infrequent. They don't hate you, Cassie. You know that, right? Cassie's eyes watered. She had to fight to keep her voice steady. I just hate that I might have disappointed them. And I'm not looking forward to having that conversation with them. You did just fine with me, didn't you? You're my sister. It's different. Laura's laugh was light and clear. It'll be fine. They'll be happy to see you, I promise. Cassie nodded, but the pit in her stomach didn't loosen. She felt guilty for pushing her family away for the last decade, but part of her still felt vindicated in doing it. She hadn't known how to explain to her parents what she'd been going through, both after Novak's attack and while she was learning more about her abilities. And she didn't want to burden them with that knowledge. And what if they didn't believe her? It hadn't taken Laura long to come around, but she'd also been involved in one of Cassie's investigations. She had a front row seat to Cassie's abilities. Beyond all of that, Cassie still harbored a kind of defiant independence. She loved her parents, but they could be suffocating. After the attack, all they had wanted to do was take care of her. It was nice in the beginning, but then it made her feel awful. She didn't want them to coddle her, and she didn't want to feel weak. It had taken her a long time to come to terms with the idea that pain and fear weren't synonymous with weakness. But that realization had happened long after her relationship with her parents had fallen apart. Have you figured out what you want to say yet? Cassie scoffed. About what? Why I'm showing up unexpectedly? Why I cut myself off from everybody? How I can see dead people? All of the above? Cassie sank lower in her seat. No. Laura patted her leg and then put the car into drive, but she didn't pull forward. You'll be fine. It'll be uncomfortable for a while, but I'll be there. They'll come around. We all want the same thing. I know. So maybe are you ready wasn't the right question. What about are you willing to do this even though it scares you? Cassie wanted to say yes with resounding authority, but right now she could only nod her head. Laura smiled and pulled away from the curb. She turned the corner and drove a quarter mile down Birch Street. Their parents' house was on the left. The sisters had grown up in Savannah, but when Laura went to college in California, their parents wanted a change of scenery. The family had always enjoyed Charlotte, and it wouldn't be too far from Cassie, so it seemed like a practical move. Cassie had visited the house a few times, but it had been a while. She'd forgotten how quaint it was. Walter and Judy Quinn owned a nice little white colonial home with blue shutters. It looked tidy from the outside, and Cassie knew without stepping a foot across the threshold that it would be the same on the inside. The gardens out front had been trimmed up for winter, but she could see how well her mother had taken care of the flowers. Time slowed as Laura turned into the driveway. Her mother's red Camry sat on one side, her father's silver Buick on the other. It had been a long time since they'd needed an SUV to haul their kids back and forth from sports practice, but Cassie still found it odd to see both of them driving sedans. Cassie's palms began to sweat, and her breaths came in shallow spurts. Spots erupted in front of her eyes. For a moment, she considered the practicality of finding her way to the airport on foot and flying back to Savannah. 
Laura parked and placed another gentle hand on Cassie's leg. It's gonna be fine, you'll see. Cassie pushed open her door. Her legs wobbled, but she took two deep breaths to clear her mind. The crisp air alleviated some of her worry. Worst case scenario, her parents didn't want to see her, and she'd have to drive straight back to Savannah. But at least she'd know where they stood. The girls pulled their suitcases out of the car and made their way up to the front porch. Cassie looked around to see if she could spot the ghost of the little boy. He'd been right next to the car when they'd left her house back in Savannah. Had he traveled with them? Would his presence extend to another state? Seeing him now would have been an odd sort of comfort. But if he was around, he remained invisible. Laura stopped at the front door and turned to Cassie. How do you want to do this? Just knock. Cassie was still breathless, and her voice sounded miles away. I'm gonna wing it. Laura rapped on the door. Cassie stood behind her, shifting her weight from foot to foot. Who would answer the door? What would Cassie say? How would her parents react? A million different scenarios raced through her mind until she was dizzy again. When the knob turned, Cassie's mind cleared. She stepped to the side as the door opened, pulling her suitcase close. Whoever it was, she wanted an extra few seconds to gather herself before she announced her visit. Laura shot her a look, but when she turned back to the door, a bright smile had replaced her confusion. Surprise! Their father's deep chuckles softened Cassie's heart. What are you doing here? We thought we'd surprise you guys. Hope you don't mind. No, of course not, he paused. Did you say we? Cassie knew this was her cue, and before she could talk herself out of it, she stepped into view. Her father's gaze shifted from Laura to Cassie, and their eyes met with what seemed like an audible click. Walter Quinn was a tall, thin man with silver hair and a mustache. His eyes were dark and gentle, and his face harbored countless years of laugh lines. He was the type of person who took refuge in the silences between conversations. He looked a few years older than Cassie remembered, but still every inch of the father she had idolized growing up. Cassie? His voice caught in his throat. Is that really you? Hi, Dad. Cassie's eyes watered. Surprise. Chapter Three the entire world paused while Cassie's father absorbed his daughter's presence. When he stepped forward with open arms, Cassie caught sight of his watery eyes. She buried her face in his chest and breathed in his spicy cologne. His embrace was warm and firm and everything she'd missed about him over the last 10 years. He was the first to pull away and Cassie was quick to wipe away her tears. He held her at arm's length and drank in her appearance. What are you doing here? It took a second for Cassie to find her voice again. We thought we'd surprise you. It's been a while. I was hoping we could all talk and catch up. His eyebrows knit together. Is something wrong? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I just thought it was time, you know? He took a minute to respond, but when he did... His words were heavy with meaning. I know. Their father led them through the front door and into the entrance adjacent to the kitchen, where they could kick off their shoes. He looked back and forth between them with an astonished smile on his face. It's nice to see you both in the same place. Laura shot Cassie a look that screamed, I told you so, to which Cassie rolled her eyes. She smiled back at her father. Thanks, it's nice to be here. Laura finished pulling off her shoes and stood up. Where's mom? Upstairs. He leaned his head back and projected his voice. Hey, Judy. A muffled voice answered from upstairs. We have guests. There was rustling, and the sound of her mother's footsteps made Cassie's palms sweat. As a kid, her father was the disciplinarian, but he was fair and just. He never yelled, and somehow that made everything worse. As an adult, Cassie could see how even-tempered he was. 
that made seeing him again after all these years much easier. Her mom, on the other hand, had a bit of that Irish temper. She was a kind, giving woman, but also passionate. Cassie had seen her mom take a teacher down a peg or two in one breath and invite them over for dinner in the next. She and Cassie had gotten into a few shouting matches when she was a teenager, but her mom could never stay mad for long. And neither could Cassie, especially when there was food on the table or ice cream in the freezer. Hey, Dad, Laura whispered. Yeah? I told Cassie. Their father frowned. Told her what? His eyes got wide. I thought you weren't going to say anything. She has a right to know Mom's sick. I agree, he leaned forward. But your mother is still going to kill me. Cassie's mouth went dry. Time to say your goodbyes then. Cassie's eyes met her mother's the moment she entered the room. A little gasp escaped Judy's mouth, and Cassie saw confusion, excitement, and apprehension cross her face in quick succession. Hi, Mom. Hi. She looked from Laura to her husband and back to Cassie, like she couldn't believe what she was seeing. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. Cassie stepped forward and hugged her mom, breathing in the scent of cherry blossoms and hairspray. Judy Quinn looked exactly the same as she had 10 years ago, short and round with bright red hair, deep green eyes, and a smattering of freckles across her nose. Hope you don't mind us dropping in on you, Cassie continued. Judy hugged Laura and then turned to her husband. Did you know about this? Not at all. It seems like they conspired against us. Oh, Judy turned to Laura. She couldn't quite look Cassie in the eye. What's the occasion? No occasion. Laura led the group into the kitchen and started rummaging through the refrigerator. We just thought it was a good time to catch up. Judy's face turned red, and she smacked her husband's arm. You told them, didn't you? He had the wherewithal to look abashed. Technically, I only told Laura, then Laura told Cassie. Thanks for throwing me under the bus, Dad. Hey, if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. Judy threw her hands up and walked over to the cabinet with the wine glasses. She pulled two down as Laura retrieved a bottle from the fridge. As an afterthought, she grabbed one more for Cassie. I didn't want you to worry, she said. So what was the plan? For the first time, Laura sounded more hurt than exasperated. Tell us after you had it removed? In an ideal world, yes. And what if something had gone wrong? Cassie's voice shook, and she hated the sound of it. Then you would have taken away any chance of us being able to say goodbye. The room fell dead silent. Cassie could feel the hypocrisy crawling across her skin. She'd pushed them away for 10 years. She'd never given them room to work through what had happened right alongside her. And her last run-in with Novak? She'd waved it off like it was nothing, despite the fact she'd almost died. Again. That was never my intention. Her mom's voice was quiet, angry, barely controlled. I just didn't want you to worry, that's all. Laura placed a hand on top of their mother's. We know, and we're not staging an intervention here. We just wanted to visit, have a little family bonding time. Which I think is an excellent idea, Walter said. When Judy shot him a look, he grabbed his keys from the hook. I also think picking up some more wine is an excellent idea. And cheese, and orange juice, eggs. We'll need two more steaks, Judy added. I'll be back soon. Walter leaned over and kissed Cassie on the forehead. I'm really glad you came. Laura scoffed. What am I, chopped liver? No one deserves to be liver. Their father scratched his chin. More like moldy cheese or watery sour cream. Soggy pizza, Cassie offered. Walter winked. You could do worse than soggy pizza. Judy tried not to laugh. Go to the store, Walter. Yes, dear. Get me chocolate. Yes, dear. The momentary easiness that came with their usual banter left the house as soon as Walter closed the door behind him. Cassie was too nervous to sip her wine, 
so she left it on the countertop to gather beads of condensation. Well, you girls look tired. Let me get your room ready so you can take a nap before dinner. The drive wasn't bad. I slept on the way here. Judy waved them off. It has to be done sooner or later. Might as well do it now. Cassie trudged up the stairs after them. The house was familiar enough, but the details were foreign. She remembered the banister being an ugly pine color. Now it was a dark mahogany. The downstairs bathroom was pale green instead of a faded mauve. She also could have sworn there hadn't been French doors leading out to the back porch. They had done a lot of renovating over the past 10 years. Judy led them to one of the guest bedrooms and pushed open the door. She fluffed the pillows and slid back the closet door. Laura, last time you were here, you left one of your sweatshirts. I washed it for you. Laura pulled out a gray hoodie with the words San Francisco embroidered across the chest. Sweet, I was looking for this. Judy turned to Cassie. Your room might take a little longer. That's okay, Cassie blushed. I can help. The second guest bedroom was piled high with yarn and empty boxes and a portable wardrobe. I turned it into my sewing room. I don't remember it being this messy. That's fine. I can sleep on the couch. You're not sleeping on the couch. I'll get the blow-up mattress. You can sleep on the floor in Laura's room for tonight. Then we'll figure something else out. Judy walked back down the hall and pulled the mattress bag out of the closet. How long will you be staying? Oh, um, we never actually discussed that, Laura chuckled. At least a few days, if that's all right. Of course. Her tone didn't betray her thoughts. You can stay as long as you want. You both are always welcome. The word sounded nice to Cassie's ears, but she couldn't help noticing something beneath the surface. Was she overthinking the whole thing? Or was her mom apprehensive about Cassie staying? Cassie didn't blame her. All four of them knew there was a tough conversation ahead of them. But for right now, it felt nice to pretend everything was normal. It'd only be a matter of time before reality crashed in. Chapter Four Laura sat cross-legged on the bed while Cassie paced up and down the tiny bedroom. They'd put away their clothes and shoved the suitcases in the corner along with the blow-up bed, and now there was nothing to do but wait. A nap sounded nice, but Cassie was too wired. The house smelled familiar. Lavender wafted up from the bowl of potpourri on the windowsill. She smelled the dryer sheets her mother had used when she'd washed Laura's sweatshirt, now haphazardly draped over the back of the desk chair. Smell was the sense most tied to memory, and Cassie had no reason to dispute that. Their house in Savannah had always smelled vaguely of lavender, and her mother hadn't changed her brand of laundry detergent in over 20 years. But if everything felt so familiar, why did she feel so out of place? Laura had been watching her the whole time. Worrying about it won't make it go away. Is that what you tell your clients? Cassie didn't stop pacing. Don't worry about it, then it'll just go away? That's not at all what I said. Laura's tone was even, but there was a bite to her words. You can worry or not worry, that's entirely up to you. But worrying won't make your fear go away. It'll amplify it. You know what will make the fear go away? Cassie stopped and rolled her eyes. Confronting it? Laura had a shit-eating grin on her face now. Yeah, it doesn't always work, but it's necessary. Cassie flopped down on the bed and buried her face in the blankets. They still smelled fresh. Her reply was muffled. What was that? Cassie lifted her head. I said, it's like you do this for a living or something. You didn't need me to tell you that, though. I still need to hear it. Before Laura responded, there was a soft knock on the door. Cassie sat up, and the girls called out in unison. Their dad peeked his head inside. He caught sight of the pile in the corner and smiled. Ah, just like old times. We'll clean it up, Cassie said. I just need a room first. Your mother is working on the sewing room right now. Unfortunately, you won't have a real bed. 
But at least you'll have your own space. And a lot of yarn to play with if you get bored. Laura chimed in. Does she need help? Cassie wasn't sure which answer she'd prefer. No, she doesn't even let me go in there. But I'll tell you what, I need some help with dinner. And your wine is still down there. Cassie couldn't take a single sip of wine a half hour ago, but now it sounded fantastic. She and Laura followed their dad downstairs, leaving behind the sound of their mother shuffling boxes around in the other room. Part of Cassie wanted to knock on the door and offer her help anyway, but part of her was glad her dad had let her off the hook. If Judy Quinn cooked you a meal, there would be no complaints, but Walter was the real chef of the house. Cassie had always thought he would open his own restaurant, but he had waved the idea away. Why turn something I enjoy into a job? It was a valid point. Walter piled ingredients onto the island in the middle of the kitchen. Steak, potatoes, asparagus, butter, onions, mushrooms, lettuce, tomatoes. The food was so fresh, Cassie swore she could smell what it was about to become. Laura rolled up her sleeves. How can we help? Give me a couple of pans, olive oil, spices. He pulled out some carrots and shut the fridge. I wouldn't mind a drink myself. Cassie pulled down a few pans hanging from a wire rack over the island while Laura made a beeline for the spices. When Walter looked over her selection, he gave her a satisfied nod. Laura beamed. I can get your drink, Cassie offered. Well, if you insist. Cassie had always loved pouring her dad a drink. He didn't partake often and only drank whiskey neat, but it was a routine she knew well. She'd been doing it since she was 16, and she still knew how to measure the exact right amount each time. When she was younger, it had made her feel mature and responsible. Now, it felt like a unique bond between her and her father. But after searching through three cupboards, she realized she had no idea where they kept the glasses, let alone where he kept his stash of whiskey these days. Over by the fridge, Laura called, pulling a cutting board out of a drawer. Whiskey's in the dining room. Cassie had to temper her annoyance with her sister. It wasn't Laura's fault that Cassie was a stranger in her parents' house. And it wasn't Laura's fault that she'd had to play the role of both sisters over the last 10 years. But the feeling of being replaced still stung. Cassie poured her father his drink and scooped up her glass of wine, draining it in a few sips. Her mother's wine was always sweeter than what Cassie kept at home, but it went down much easier. By the time Laura and Walter had finished cooking dinner, Cassie had consumed three glasses and was working on her fourth. Her mom appeared in the doorway. Smells good. It's going to taste even better, Walter promised. Been a while since both my daughters were here to help me. Cassie held up her glass and ignored the tingling in her fingertips. Laura's been doing the hard work. I'm just pouring drinks. Some would say that's the most important job in the kitchen. Judy lifted the empty bottle and shook it. Good thing we got more, huh? Sorry, Cassie said, but she didn't mean it. Judy pulled down plates, bowls, and water glasses and set them on the island. Then she stacked silverware and napkins on top. She caught Cassie's eye. Do you mind setting the table? No, not at all. The formal exchange made Cassie's skin crawl, but she escaped the feeling by grabbing the tableware and taking her time in the dining room. If she measured the distance between every plate and its accompanying fork, they'd be exactly the same. As a child, her father had taught her the proper way to set a table, and it was one of the few skills she hadn't lost over the years. Her cooking might be average at best, but she could make a mean table setting. Knives scraping against plates and compliments to the chef punctuated the first few minutes of dinner. Cassie had missed her father's cooking, and everything tasted a hundred times better than she remembered. The downside of getting some food in her belly was some evaporation of the wine's effect. Laura was the first to break the silence. You know what I keep wondering? What's that? Judy asked. Which elephant in the room we're going to talk about first? I don't think we need to talk about any of the elephants, actually, 
Judy replied. See, that's what got us into trouble in the first place. Cassie wasn't sure if it was the alcohol or the fact that she caught the mischief in her sister's eye, but a giggle slipped out as she took another sip of wine. A droplet escaped her mouth and slid down her chin, doing nothing to stifle her laughter. Can't we just enjoy one dinner together before it all goes to hell? Judy asked. An uncomfortable hush fell over the table before Laura broke the silence again. We're gonna have to talk about it eventually. And who says everything will go to hell? Cassie added. The wine had lit a fire in her belly. I'm not here to ruin anything. I'm here to fix it. I know that. Judy's tone had cooled, but she still wouldn't make eye contact with anyone at the table. Doesn't mean it won't. What I think your mother means to say, Walter added, looking directly at Cassie, is that there's a lot to talk about. And maybe it would be easier when we've had a little more time and a little less wine. He had a point, but Cassie didn't want to admit that. I'm not the only one who has something to apologize for. Judy's head snapped up at that. What's that supposed to mean? You didn't tell us you were sick. I'm not sick. Laura had to find out secondhand. Cassie paused. And I had to find out thirdhand. There's no such thing as thirdhand. Judy punctuated her sentence with the stab of her fork. You know, Walter, I really wish you hadn't told them. They have a right to know. No, they don't. Judy slammed her silverware back down on the table. The glasses shook. You broke your promise to me, Walter. You betrayed my trust. I know that, and I apologize. But Judy, she held up her hand. I'm still mad at you. Don't you think that's kind of hypocritical? The words left Cassie's mouth before she could stop them. You're still mad at me for pushing you away after my attack, and here you are doing the same thing to us. If I'm a hypocrite, then so are you. How do you figure? Judy threw up her hands. If you're so offended by my behavior, maybe you should look at your own. Cassie washed down her anger with more wine, but all it did was make the fire burn brighter. So what? You're punishing me because I almost died and didn't want to talk about it? Judy looked like Cassie had slapped her across the face. I'm not punishing you, Cassie. I didn't want you to worry about me. Didn't want anyone to worry about me. I wanted the surgery to be over with, and then we'd go on being normal. Laura snorted. This family is far from normal. Cassie shot her a look before turning back to her mom. And when were you going to tell us? After the surgery? What if something went wrong? What if we never got to say goodbye? Nothing is going to go wrong. It's going to be fine. Then we should have no reason to worry. Walter lay a hand on his wife's shoulder. Judy, she has a point. Judy's laugh sounded unhinged. I thought you said this wasn't an intervention. It's not, but we all have a right to worry, because we love you. I don't want to be alone in this. Don't you want our daughters to be here with us? Judy looked directly into Cassie's eyes now. I've wanted that for 10 years. The guilt and shame Cassie had felt over the last decade turned the sweetness of the wine into ash. A lump rose in her throat, and she knew if she didn't get a grip on her emotions, she'd have a panic attack while staring into her potatoes. We're here now, Mom, Laura's voice was gentle. Cassie's here to apologize and explain why she pushed us away. And we're here to ask you not to do the same thing. You saw what happened. Things didn't work out the last time around. Let's not make the same mistake twice. Lucky for you, I don't have a choice. My surgery is in a few days, so you win. Laura and Cassie sputtered in unison. What? A few days? Were you even going to tell us? How are you planning on keeping that a secret? Judy stood up and threw her napkin down on the table. Walter's hand dropped to his side. He looked hurt and worried and tired. Dinner was excellent, but I'm not feeling very well at the moment. I'll clean up later. She left the room, and stunned silence followed in her wake. Dad, Laura started. I'm sorry, I didn't mean- He started gathering plates. It's not your fault, honey. 
Cassie chuckled, but there was no humor in it. It's mine. Walter stopped to give her a pointed look. It's not yours either. It's not anyone's. Emotions are high right now. Your mother will be fine. She was cornered. We all should have handled this better. Cassie heard what he said, but didn't believe it. Laura gathered a handful of dishes to bring to the sink. Cassie slipped away while their backs were turned. She wouldn't have known where anything went anyway. Besides, she wanted to commiserate by herself for a few minutes before she had to share living space with her family for the next several days. Chapter 5 Senator Grayson pinched the bridge of his nose between his thumb and forefinger. He was counting backwards from ten and kept his eyes closed until he reached zero. When he opened them again, he forced himself not to blurt out the first thing that came to mind. He'd learned a long time ago that heightened emotions and rash decisions were not ideal characteristics of an influential leader. He stood in the middle of his bedroom with his jacket hanging off the bedpost and his tie loosened around his neck. His shoes were still on his feet, and if his mother were alive, she'd have given him a beating to remember, bless her soul. His wife, on the other hand, was in yoga pants and a loose t-shirt. She had a sweater wrapped around her shoulders, and it was so large on her petite frame, it looked like it might swallow her whole. The silence between them was deafening and yet it didn't drown out the tick of the clock on the mantle. He hated that damn thing, so old and useless, but his wife loved it, and that was all that mattered. Mary had always been a tiny person, but the chemo seemed to have shrunk her further. The doctors said she was healthy, in remission, and maintaining a good weight, but there was something about her now that seemed smaller. She smiled less and slept more. The cancer had taken a piece of her that was never coming back. The two of them had just gotten into a shouting match, which had once been a rare occurrence. Now it seemed to happen every other week. As soon as Connor hit puberty, Mother Nature had decided the two men could not live under the same roof. Through the haze of age, Grayson just about remembered what it was like to be in his son's shoes how often he had argued with his own father, how much he'd hated him back then. Mary did not see their son in the same light. He was her one and only, her perfect angel. She couldn't ignore the trouble Connor stirred up, but she figured if she just loved him harder, he'd straighten up and they'd go back to being a perfect family. It was a naive, albeit honorable, sentiment. But Grayson knew there was no honor in politics. He had an important role to fill, and Connor constantly stood in the way of those dreams. The public knew a fraction of what went on behind closed doors, and even that was too much information. Connor had broken off his leash a long time ago, and Grayson's fuse had gotten shorter. Lawrence. Mary's voice was soft, pleading. I know something is wrong. You don't know that. Grayson worked to keep his voice neutral. You fear that. There is a difference. A woman's instinct, a mother's instinct, is rarely wrong. But even that margin of error is worth holding on to. Grayson blew out a breath of air and joined his wife on the bed. He scooped her hands into his own and tried to warm them to no avail. He held her gaze until he had her full attention. He's done this before. You know that. She did not look away. Yes. He and I had a fight the other night. She didn't blink. Yes. He's just acting out. She pulled her hands back. No. Mary, don't say it like that. She stood up and straightened the items on her bedside table. She moved them one inch to the right, then one inch to the left, right where they had been to begin with. Don't say it like I'm crazy. I don't think you're crazy. That was the truth. But I think you're jumping to conclusions, and we can't do that right now. He'll show up in a day or two, 
hungry and tired and begging for money like he always does. Do you even want him to come home? Of course I do. That was a lie. Don't you think I want my son to come home safe? You told him never to come back. I told him not to come back until he's learned to control himself. Grayson stood and paced the length of the room. Mary, please understand how difficult this is for me. Everything is changing right now. Anastasia is working on setting me up for a presidential run. Every time he acts out, it sets us back another step or two. We can't afford that. Mary froze. When she turned around, her eyes held a fury he had never seen before. You can't afford that. Your career can't afford that. But this is our son. Isn't he more important than you and your stupid career? My career is not stupid. I'm trying to help people. I'm trying to build a better country for our kids, for Connor. Mary scoffed. Don't lie to me, Lawrence. You can lie to the media and your constituents and your colleagues, but not me. I know you. I've known you since the day we met each other. I fell in love with you because you were ambitious. You never took no for an answer. I used to think that was admirable and never stopped to consider what you'd push to the side to get what you wanted. I never thought it would be us. His wife's words hurt, but they ignited a flame inside his chest that burned away the pain. You think I'm throwing away my son for a presidential run? You think I'd be willing to lose my family for that? I don't know anymore. Exhaustion replaced the fury. Mary sat down on the bed and held her head in her hands. But something isn't right. He was so angry with you. Grayson had to fight to keep the politician at bay. He used to struggle to spin his stories, but now it was a habit he couldn't break. Connor doesn't like being told no. Like father, like son. Grayson sat with his back to his wife. It was easier to be vulnerable that way. Easier to turn off the monster he called the politician. I understand he hates me. He doesn't hate you. A soft chuckle. He hates everything you stand for. Grayson didn't even force a laugh. The years have taken a toll on him. It hasn't been easy having an absentee father. He paused, hoping she would correct him. She didn't. I guess I hoped he would eventually see what I'm trying to do here. And what are you trying to do? Grayson turned to his wife. He knew what answer he'd give a reporter, but this was his wife. He couldn't lie to her. He didn't want to. Before he formed a genuine answer, there was a sharp knock at the door. Mary pulled the sweater tighter around her shoulders. Grayson straightened his tie. Come in. Murphy walked through the door. He glanced at Mary first, then locked eyes with Grayson. We found his car, sir. Mary gasped and clasped a hand over her mouth. She wouldn't cry in front of the man, but Grayson knew she wouldn't hold the tears back forever. Tell me everything. Another glance at Mary, and then back at Grayson. His Mercedes was abandoned in a parking garage downtown. The window on the driver's side was smashed in, but there's no evidence your son was in there. No blood or signs of a struggle. The police are searching for more evidence now. You called the police? The politician was back, and Grayson turned its full fury onto his bodyguard. Why? Someone reported the damaged vehicle. A friend on the force notified me. Some of my men are with them right now on standby. They'll relay any information they can. I have to call Anastasia. Your publicist? Mary's voice dripped with venom. Grayson prided himself on never giving Mary reason to suspect him of any wrongdoing with Anastasia, but that didn't mean his wife liked her. Why? She'll find out sooner or later. Grayson loosened his tie again. There was no reason to pretend he was keeping it together anymore. It'll be better if she hears it from me. Chapter 6 Cassie's grip on the steering wheel loosened. She allowed the ache to dissipate from her hands. Her knuckles turned pink again. The panic faded away. 
She'd been here before, countless times. She now recognized the dream almost as soon as she dropped into it. The Yankee blackness, the pull of the car, the soft glow in the distance. The course of the dream was imprinted on her mind. The car would drift regardless of whether she tried to correct it. Figures would appear on the road before her. At the last possible second, she'd be able to yank the wheel to miss them. She'd tumble out of the car and come face to face with her sister, whose lips would whisper a portent that Cassie was desperate to hear, even if it crushed her heart. As Cassie let the dream take its course, a sense of peace filled her. Caught somewhere between resignation and determination, she was dead set on making the most out of this opportunity. When her sister appeared, she would ask her a question. Maybe she'd shake loose a memory, if only she understood how to trigger it. A single figure in front of her was the first indication something was wrong. It had always been the silhouettes of three people, her parents and her sister, age five. Cassie had learned to control the car enough to avoid hitting her family. She'd even accepted hearing those dreadful words come from Laura's mouth. You're the reason they took Sarah. You're the reason she died. But she hadn't expected to see the figure of the little boy standing where her family should have been. As always, he wore an oversized t-shirt and neon shorts. But the colors were vibrant and new. She had never seen him so solid. He looked normal. He looked alive. She wished she knew his name so she could call out to him. The fear from seeing him there made her lose control of the vehicle. It skidded to the left, the headlights illuminating the panic in his eyes, before she pumped the brakes and came to a screeching halt. Cassie pushed the door open and placed one foot on the ground, then the other. The world shifted under her feet, and she fell to her knees. Where were her parents? Where was her sister? She'd had so many questions. Now, her voice stuck in her throat. The little boy shuffled toward her. He held Laura's teddy bear as if it were his own. When he handed it over, Cassie received it with shaking hands. Do you remember that night? He asked. Her throat was dry, but she pushed a single word out of her mouth. No. Try to remember? His voice was clear and desperate. He sounded like a grown-up. It was the most she'd ever heard him speak. Please try to remember. Was it my fault? It wasn't the question Cassie had intended to ask, but this wasn't the person she had expected to see either. Did I kill Sarah? They need you. The little boy looked over his shoulder, then back at Cassie. His eyes were bright blue. She hadn't noticed that before. They need your help. Who? A shiver crawled down Cassie's spine and settled in her stomach, where it writhed in anguish. I don't understand. The little boy placed a gentle hand on her shoulder. At his touch, a rush of pain radiated from his fingertips through her arm, joining the shiver in her gut. Together, they scratched and bit at her insides until she could hardly breathe. Each lightning bolt of agony came with a cloud of fear that settled over her like a nightmare. She felt figures gathering around her, but when she looked, the void stood empty, except for her and the little boy. She cried out, half in desperation, half in fear. The boy removed his hand. The pain faded, but didn't disappear. It was a shadow of what it once was, and yet... It was still unbearable. It kept her on her knees. It kept her sobbing. It kept her from wanting to sleep ever again. They need you. The boy's voice was no louder than a whisper. They need your help. Cassie felt the dream slipping away. She desperately wanted it to be over. And yet, she felt as though all the answers were just within her grasp. She reached out to grab hold of the boy's arm, but he turned to smoke in her fingers. The ground gave way beneath her, and she fell through the bottomless abyss.
When Cassie opened her eyes, she did not expect to see the ghost of the little boy standing in the corner of the bedroom. He was once again faded, transparent, and unmistakably dead. She hated herself for the relief that washed over her now that he was back to normal. This shouldn't be normal, she chastised. He should be my age by now, with a career and a family and a life. The blow-up mattress had been unforgiving, and Cassie groaned as she sat up. Her entire body hurt, and she had a headache coming on. But for the moment, she was happy to be among the land of the living, so to speak. Cassie threw off her covers and crawled over to the little boy. She remembered how bright his eyes had been in her dream. In this reality, they were the color of ice. She held out her hand. He ignored it. Was that you, in my dream? She dropped her arm. Or was that my brain trying to tell me something? She half expected an answer, but didn't get one. The sound of his voice was fresh in her mind, and she wanted him to sound like that again, alive. He stared past her. Cassie looked from Laura's sleeping form back to the little boy. Do you know her? Does she know you? The little boy's gaze shifted back to Cassie, and with it came the memory of all the pain that had taken root inside her. The gasp that escaped her mouth was loud, and Laura's breathing shuddered in her sleep. Cassie froze, then released her breath when her sister didn't stir. Guilt consumed her, but Cassie couldn't risk looking back into the little boy's eyes. She didn't like what she'd felt, and even though the pain was a fraction of what she'd experienced in her dream, she'd had enough pain to last her a lifetime. She knew she shouldn't blame herself for wanting to avoid that, but she still would. Cassie pushed herself upright. She kept the figure of the little boy in her peripherals while she threw on her sister's sweatshirt and tiptoed over to the door. She slid into the hallway, but she couldn't help one last look at the ghost in the corner of her room. His gaze hadn't left Laura's sleeping form. Cassie shook her head and closed the door with a click. She felt like she had all the puzzle pieces, but no idea what the final picture should be. Putting it together would be an agonizing process, and the desperation in the boy's voice had told her time was running out. Chapter 7 The smell of coffee hit her when she reached the bottom of the stairs. Cassie steeled herself for whichever parent she'd run into first, but when she crossed the threshold, the kitchen was empty. The sound of a hammer, muffled by the door to the garage, indicated it was her father, so she poured herself a cup and followed the noise. When she stuck her head through the opening, it smelled of sawdust and smoke. Knock, knock. Her dad's smile lit up his entire face. Good morning, honey. How'd you sleep? Cassie slipped inside and found a wall to lean against. Better than expected. Worse than I wanted. Those air mattresses aren't exactly top of the line. Cassie stretched, and they both heard her bones pop. The air mattress could have been worse. I just had a rude awakening. She took a sip of coffee. Bad dreams. I see not much has changed then. What do you mean? Walter turned back to his project, and Cassie noticed he was using vices and wood glue to put together a small bookcase. When she looked around the garage, she noticed various projects in different stages of completion. Picture frames, a chair, even a rustic staircase meant to hold potted plants. He'd always been handy, but she didn't remember him being into carpentry. You used to have the most vivid dreams as a kid. Got kind of spooky once in a while. The things you'd say. He chuckled and shook his head. Sometimes I wondered if your dreams predicted the future or if you willed them into reality. Cassie took another sip of her coffee and let the burn of the liquid ground her back to reality. This was the perfect opportunity to ask her father about her abilities and if she'd had them her entire life, but she couldn't bring herself to do it, not before at least two cups of coffee. And even then, she'd find a good excuse not to ask. So, 
What's all this? A little hobby I picked up. He straightened and dusted off his hands. Pride beamed from every pore in his face. It started when your mom wanted a new shelf in the living room. I thought, I can make that. So I did. Then she wanted a wine rack. Then her friend wanted a little nightstand. Now I do projects for half the neighborhood. I enjoy keeping my hands busy. That's awesome, Dad. They look amazing. Made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, but I figured it out eventually. Everyone seems to like them. It was nice seeing her dad like this, and with a sharp pang, she realized she'd missed out on years of happiness because of the fear burrowed deep inside her. She had focused so much on what could have gone wrong that she hadn't even thought of what might have gone right. Walter must have caught the look on her face because he leaned against his workbench and folded his arms. He didn't look unkind, but he was a straight shooter, and that could hurt. Your mom was pretty upset last night. Cassie hung her head. She'd expected this conversation and wished Laura would have been by her side. I know. I'm not saying she was right to react like that, but we were pretty surprised to see you show up on our doorstep. Disappointed? Surprised. His tone was firm. Big difference. We're happy you're here, but I guess what we're both wondering is, why now? Cassie took a slow sip of her coffee. She didn't want to say anything she would regret. I wish I could tell you. I've wanted to visit a hundred times over the years, but I'd get scared. Scared of what? That you hated me. Tears stung Cassie's eyes, and she looked down at her bare feet. The chill of the concrete numbed her skin. That you didn't want to see me. If you're looking for forgiveness, you had that years ago. Walter didn't change his posture, but his voice was gentler now. We never hated you, Cassie, not even once. It hurt both your mother and me when you pushed us away, but we knew you had gone through an incredible trauma. People react in all sorts of ways. We would never blame you for how you handled it, but that doesn't mean it didn't hurt us too. I know, her voice came out as a whisper. I'm sorry. Walter crossed the garage and kissed Cassie on the forehead. We all could have done better. Your sister knows that. Your mother knows that. Does she? He chuckled. You two are more alike than either of you wants to admit. I'm getting that impression. Walter returned to his workbench and grabbed a bucket of stain and a brush. He walked over to the decorative staircase and popped the lid off the pail. She sees it too, but she's fighting for everything to be normal right now. She thinks you only came back because you think she's dying. Cassie rolled her eyes. That's not why. But you have to admit, that's what it looks like. He paused his painting to look up at her. She wants you to be here more than anything, but she doesn't want it to be because you feel guilty or think you won't have another chance. She wants you to be here because you want to be here. I do want to be here. Cassie heard the whine in her voice and cringed. Is she going to believe me when I say that? Walter shrugged and returned to the staircase. I can't answer for her. We all have a lot to talk about and I think everyone has a lot of work to do. We've ignored the separation between us for too long. Band-aids covered what was festering underneath. Now it's time to clean the wound and let it heal. That's going to be painful. Can I give you some advice from an old man who's made a lot of mistakes? Cassie set down her coffee to better absorb every word. I'd like that. He stared up at the ceiling to find his words. Don't ignore the pain. You understand better than most how much life can throw at you, how much it can hurt. But when you ignore the pain, you ignore the solution. You have to feel the pain to figure out what's wrong. Then you have to put in the work to fix it. It sounds so easy when you say it like that. He chuckled and returned to his work. Oh, it's not. But the best things in life rarely are. The door opened and Cassie's mom stood in the frame, looking between her husband and her daughter. 
Her face was inscrutable, and Cassie wondered how much of their conversation she had heard. Judy took in Cassie's pajamas and her half-empty cup of coffee. When you've got a minute, will you help me with something? Yeah, Cassie stumbled over her words. Of course, right now? When you've got a minute, no rush. That strange formality still hung in the air between them, but Cassie didn't have time to analyze it. Her mom had already retreated into the house. Chapter Eight Cassie drained her mug in three gulps and brought it inside. Her mother was chopping vegetables for an omelet with her back to her. The smell of onions mixed with the coffee, it wasn't an unpleasant scent, but Cassie's stomach didn't quite rumble. Rather, it tightened at the memory of the woman whose kitchen had smelled like sour onions. Not for the first time since that encounter, Cassie wondered if she had gone to the doctor. And if she had, did they find signs of stomach cancer? Cassie sniffed the air again, hoping she didn't catch the scent of sickness on her mother. Did you eat breakfast yet? Judy asked. Having only distinguished the additional smell of the peppers, Cassie breathed a sigh of relief. Does coffee count? Not really, no. I'm okay for now. Cassie waited for her mother to say something else, and when she didn't, she took matters into her own hands. What did you need help with? While I was cleaning out the sewing room, I came across some boxes with your name on them. I think it's stuff from when you were a kid. I was hoping you'd go through it. Tell me what you'd like to keep and what I can donate. Oh. Whatever Cassie had thought her mother needed her help with, it wasn't this. She wasn't sure if she was relieved or disappointed. Yeah, I can do that. They're sitting in front of the closet. You can't miss them. It felt like a dismissal, and Cassie had no interest in disobeying it. The strange charge between them that kept Cassie at arm's length was uncomfortable, and she was much better equipped at avoiding discomfort than pushing through it. After a beat of silence, Cassie turned and headed back upstairs. She passed Laura on the way, who gave her a sleepy nod as she followed her nose to the coffee pot. Cassie pushed open the door to the sewing room and stepped into her mother's haven. This room told her more about her mother's mental state than the woman would ever let slip. Piles of yarn sat in bins and on shelves. Stacked boxes were in a corner, threatening to tip over at a moment's notice. A small computer sat on a desk shoved against one wall, and there were sticky notes with her mother's cursive script plastered over the entire surface. From what she could tell, they were orders from friends and ideas she'd scribbled down lest she forget them. Both of her parents were tidy, organized people. Her mother, especially, enjoyed puttering around the house, straightening her knickknacks and fluffing the pillows. Judy Quinn took great satisfaction in being a homemaker, an enjoyment Cassie never would understand. But this sewing room was disheveled and disorganized. Cassie wasn't sure if it was because her mother's projects were taking on a life of their own, or if it was because her mother knew no one would step foot in this room. She could be as messy as she wanted in here, and no one would be the wiser. It was an odd sort of freedom. Cassie caught sight of the boxes stacked in front of the open closet door. There were four of them bursting at the seams. Her name was scribbled on each one, and she noticed Laura's boxes stacked behind them. Had Laura been required to throw out pieces of her childhood too? Or was that reserved for the least favorite daughter? Cassie shook her head to clear away the anxious thoughts. They lived like mosquitoes in her brain, buzzing and poking her with their needle-sharp comments. She knew her family didn't hate her, but sometimes the lies her brain told her were so convincing, she believed them despite evidence to the contrary. Cassie would wait a little longer before having a conversation with her mother about the last 10 years of her life. Going through her childhood belongings seemed like the easier option. Besides, she had another motive. Maybe she'd learn more about Sarah Lennox. When faced with the option to either confront the divide between her and her mother or delve deeper into the murder of her childhood best friend, Cassie chose the latter. 
What did that say about her? The contents of the first box were musty, but the delight in seeing her childhood toys overrode the annoying tingle in her nose. She pulled out a stack of Animorphs books and smiled. She only had the first six, minus the fifth one, but that hadn't mattered. Cassie had read them so many times, she still saw the stories in vivid detail through her mind's eye. Underneath the books were a pair of Barbies. One wore a scuba diving outfit, and the other wore a doctor's coat. When she was little, she had dreamed of being a heart surgeon, but soon realized she didn't have a stomach for it. Given her current trajectory in life, the universe clearly had a dark sense of humor. The box was full of what at first glance would appear to be a random assortment of junk. But for Cassie, it was a gateway back to her childhood. Lisa Frank folders and Tamagotchis were shoved to one side. On the other, a binder full of Pokemon cards she'd spent years collecting. One summer, she'd used a month's worth of allowance to buy as many packs as she could. Her mother thought she was irresponsible, but her father had slipped her an extra $10 to get a couple more. Cassie frowned as she realized she needed to decide which toys to hang on to and which to donate. The Pokemon cards were worth some money, but she wasn't sure she'd be able to part with them. Cassie opened the flaps on the next box and caught her breath. Laura's teddy bear was at the top, face down, waiting for her to rediscover him. It was the same teddy bear Laura used to give her when she got upset. The same teddy bear Laura had been holding in her recurring nightmares. The same one the little boy had handed her in this morning's dream. Cassie reached out, but stopped just short of touching the bear's matted fur. It didn't look dirty, but he had soaked up a lot of snot and tears over the years. His white ears were tinged gray, and she knew without turning him over that his stomach would look the same. The brown of his back and sides was less vibrant than she remembered, but he emanated the same warmth and comfort he always had. Cassie flipped him over and let her hand linger on his arm. She was half expecting a vision to hit her, but she found herself staring into his brown eyes instead. He'd seen better days, but his tattered appearance was nothing more than a sign he'd been well-loved by both sisters. What Cassie hadn't expected was a memory to hit her instead. It was almost as strong as one of her visions. As she stared into the bear's grungy face, she remembered one of the last times she ever held him in her arms. It had been the night Sarah Lennox disappeared. Laura must have thought Cassie had needed the bear's comfort, even if she didn't understand why. Their parents had separated the two and brought Cassie into the other room by herself. There, they sat her down and explained that Sarah wouldn't be coming over to play anymore. When Cassie asked why, her parents shared a glance and nodded their heads in unison, as though they'd been waiting for this and had practiced their answer ahead of time. Honey, something very bad has happened to Sarah. Her mother must have been tasked with the role of breaking the news. Someone did something they shouldn't have, and now Sarah is gone. But try not to be sad, okay? She's in a better place. A better place? Cassie knew what the phrase meant. She was old enough to understand death, but she'd never dealt with it personally. It would be another 15 years before she felt its icy breath on her neck. She died? Yes, honey, she died. Cassie remembered being confused, because when she looked past her parents to the other side of the room, Sarah Lennox was standing there, patiently waiting for Cassie to come out and play. Chapter nine. Cassie thudded down the stairs, fear and excitement racing through her veins in equal measure. She gripped Laura's teddy bear in one hand and had the other flung out for balance. The buzz of anxiety had ceased, replaced with the singular blare of an alarm that drove her to find her sister. She spotted Laura in the living room, gripping her coffee between her hands like it was the only thing holding her to reality. 
She opened her eyes when Cassie's weight shifted the couch cushions, and even then, it looked like the last thing she wanted to do. I'm giving you fair warning that I'm not in a good mood today. She slurped her coffee. Someone, I'm not saying who, kept talking in her sleep last night. Cassie already had her mouth open to rehash everything she had remembered, but this made her come up short. Wait, really? What was I saying? I don't remember. It was mostly mumbling. Do you always talk that much in your sleep? I'm not sure. It's been a while since anyone was in a position to tell me. Of course, that made Cassie think about Jason and how she'd be more than happy to offer him the opportunity. She'd texted him a few times since running into him at Van Gogh's, but their conversations had remained superficial. She kept promising herself that when she returned home, she'd do everything in her power to give them a real chance. Well, I'm in the position of telling you it's annoying. Maybe it was because of the ghost in my dream last night, which I guess is another thing I never told you about. More secrets? Unintentional ones, I promise. We had a lot going on. Am I going to need another cup of coffee for this? Probably. Laura held up a finger and drained her mug, then left the room and returned a minute later with a fresh cup. She settled back into the cushions and let the steam warm her face. You may proceed. Cassie took a deep breath. She and Laura were closer than ever, but it still felt strange to be so open about her abilities and all that accompanied them. David had been by her side for years, and there were still times she struggled to tell him everything. But if the last few weeks had taught her anything, it was that she needed to be more vulnerable with the people she cared about. David, her parents, Laura, and maybe even Jason. After Novak died, my abilities faded, but the one constant was the ghost of a little boy who would stand in the corner of my room every night. He never spoke, but he would stare at me for hours. Laura shivered. Creepy, but continue. Then one day, he spoke for the first time. He said the name Sarah Lennox. Not long after that, you visited, and he'd show up from time to time. He seems interested in you. Laura's eyes widened. Interested how? Should I worry? I don't think so. He's nice, still doesn't say much. I've never gotten bad vibes, even though Apollo doesn't like to be in the same room as him. Why do you think he's interested in me? Still trying to figure that out. Cassie shifted and tucked her feet underneath her to warm them. My nightmares have slowly transformed. At the end of the one I had on our drive over here, five-year-old you told me it was my fault Sarah died. Laura brought a hand to her mouth. I'm sure that's not true. It might be. Cassie ran a hand through her hair, picking apart the knots with her fingers. Either way, I don't remember what happened that night, but that's not the weird part. Oh, we haven't gotten to the weird part yet? Last night, I had the same dream, but instead of you standing there at the end, it was him, the little boy. She held up the teddy bear. Last time, you handed me this and told me it was my fault Sarah died. This time, he handed me the bear and told me, they need you. They? Who's they? I got this sense of people surrounding me, like ghosts I couldn't see. Then everything faded, and I woke up. He was standing in the corner of the room, staring at you. Laura swallowed and looked around the living room. Is he here now? No, she placed a hand on Laura's arm. I don't think you need to worry. He won't hurt you. I think he's trying to tell me something. I'm just not sure what it is yet. Maybe it has something to do with Mr. Brownie. Mr. Brownie, Cassie held up the stuffed animal like it was Simba. You really weren't clever with your names, were you? I was three. Laura took the bear and looked him over. He's seen better days. Speaking of those days, a memory resurfaced when I picked him up. Of what? Sarah Lennox. 
Cassie jabbed a finger at the bear. Specifically, about holding Mr. Brownie and being told she couldn't come over to play anymore. Mom and Dad were telling me she died. That must have been weird. Laura looked at Mr. Brownie like he had powers of his own. Do you remember anything else? Cassie's throat was dry, and she had to swallow before she could speak again. When they told me this, I don't remember being sad or angry. I was confused. I feel like I won't enjoy what's coming next. Sarah was standing in the corner of the room. More specifically, her ghost was standing there. She was waiting for me to play with her. Laura held up her arm. You're giving me goosebumps. That's super creepy. It wasn't creepy to me. Cassie shrugged and looked back down at Mr. Brownie. I knew she wouldn't hurt me. I'm not even sure she knew she was dead. Did you know she was dead? I don't think so. I guess I thought she was invisible. I knew mom and dad wouldn't understand, so I kept it a secret and probably didn't tell you because you were my little sister. Laura threw her head back and laughed. Yeah, that sounds about right. It wasn't hard for me to keep those kinds of secrets. I don't blame you. If you've had your abilities all your life, that means you saw more than you'll ever remember. I wouldn't go shouting it from the rooftops either. I bet you learned early on what you could and couldn't tell people. Now I've got goosebumps. It was strange not knowing how she dealt with her own abilities as a child. How did nobody notice? They did. Laura held up the bear. That's why I always gave you this. Yeah, people thought I was weird. But what about mom and dad? That's a question you'll have to ask them. I'll add it to the list. Now's your chance. Cassie followed Laura's gaze and saw their mom approaching. She wore a frown that deepened the lines around her mouth. Mom, are you okay? Her mom shook her head. I just got some bad news. What is it? Laura set her coffee down. Are you okay? I'm fine. She picked up the remote and turned on the news. I just heard about this. Cassie and Laura faced the TV. A man in a Navy suit sat behind a desk on the left side of the screen. Reporters on the front steps of a government building filled the right side. They waited for someone. The bottom of the screen read, Senator Lawrence Grayson's son missing. Foul play suspected. Sad news this morning. Sorrow laced the man's deep baritone voice. Presidential hopeful Senator Lawrence Grayson's son has gone missing. Police suspect foul play after they discovered his vehicle abandoned in a parking garage on East 6th Street in downtown Charlotte. Connor Grayson, age 19, has been the subject of many headlines over the past year, having publicly stated on social media that he does not agree with his father's politics. Mr. Grayson was arrested twice, once for possession of marijuana and once for unauthorized access of a protected computer. We do not yet know whether Mr. Grayson's disappearance is related to a similar crime. The reporter held a finger to his ear and nodded once. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just gotten word that Senator Grayson is about to address reporters who have gathered outside his Charlotte office. Nicole Rickman is on the scene. Over to you, Nicole. The first reporter's image disappeared as the second reporter stepped into the frame. She had bright green eyes and hair slicked back into a tight bun. Her smile was somber as she took the reins. Thank you, Colt. As you said, we don't know much at the moment, only that Senator Grayson's son is missing and his car was abandoned. Police suspect foul play as the car's driver's side window was smashed in, but there's no other indication that Connor Grayson was injured. Authorities here in Charlotte have pulled their resources to solve this case quickly and have even brought in the FBI to assist them. All hands are on deck, and the hope is that Connor is safe and sound. As murmurs in the background grew to hushed whispers, the woman turned and pointed to the podium erected outside the offices. The senator has just left the building and is about to make his first statement on the matter. We sincerely hope there is good news to share. Chapter 10 
Grayson squinted against the brightness of the outside world. The chill in the air caused goosebumps to erupt on his skin, but he ignored the discomfort and took a deep breath. They hadn't yet had their first snowfall of the year, but every day got colder. It was only a matter of time. Another inevitability was this press conference. As charismatic as he was, Grayson didn't enjoy public speaking. One-on-one, -on -one, he'd sell sand at the beach. But mob mentality was powerful, even for those who were well-versed in manipulation. As Grayson stepped up to the podium, he kept his head down. His mind was racing, but it wasn't because of the dozen reporters who had gathered to hear him talk about his missing son. It was because he knew Anastasia had three television screens in her office, and she was watching him speak on each one. They had rehearsed what he would say, but there was no guaranteeing it would come out of his mouth the way they had practiced it. After adjusting the mic, Grayson cleared his throat and looked up. The politician wanted to smile and smooth everything over. Nothing to see here, folks. Everything is fine. Boys will be boys, right? But Anastasia had dismissed that approach from the start. Grayson needed to be full of sorrow and hope. He needed to be vulnerable but strong. He needed to be a father before he was a politician. But he wasn't very good at being any of those things. Thank you for joining me today. Grayson cleared his throat again, surprised by the shake in his voice. As you have no doubt heard, my son Connor is missing. Yesterday I was informed that his car was abandoned in a parking garage in downtown Charlotte. As of right now, we're not sure why he was there or where he went afterward. We're also not sure if the window to his car was broken before, during, or after he went missing. Grayson resisted the urge to fidget with his tie. It constricted his throat, growing tighter by the second. He chanced a glance up at the crowd before him and saw a dozen impassive faces. One or two looked concerned, but the majority appeared bored. They were here to do their job. They didn't care about his son. The Charlotte Police Department has assured me they are doing everything within their power to find Connor and bring him home. He took a deep breath and shifted from foot to foot. Was it an act, or was it genuine discomfort at the idea his son may never return? Even he wasn't sure anymore. My team and I are working closely with Detective Calvin Davenport and fully cooperating with the investigation. As of right now, there is no indication my son's disappearance is a political matter, but the FBI has sent one of their teams to assist in the investigation. For this, I am grateful. Up until this point, Grayson felt relatively comfortable. He was reciting facts, after all. But now came the hard part, the part he always struggled with. How could he speak directly to his son at a moment like this? when he hardly did it in the comfort of their own home. Grayson wasn't sure if his wife would be watching, but he knew any sign the politician was in control would be catastrophic for their marriage. Grayson looked directly into the camera in front of him. It is hard to put into words the type of terror a parent feels when their son is missing. My wife and I are in an indescribable amount of pain and the only wish we have is to have our son back. Please, if you have any information, anything to help us find Connor, I ask that you call the police. Do the right thing and help me bring my son home. The pack of reporters launched questions at him. He did his best to ignore them, but their voices were like nails on a chalkboard. Anastasia had told him not to turn around no matter what he heard, but that was much easier said than done. Senator Grayson, you said you're cooperating with the police. Does that mean you're a suspect? Do you think your son ran away due to your strained relationship with him? Why isn't your wife with you? Do you think this is tied to your war on drugs campaign? Do you think this will affect your presidential run? Grayson clenched his fists and allowed Murphy to guide him back to his office. Even after the reporter's voices faded, 
Grayson heard their incessant questions buzzing in his head. He hoped his anger hadn't been caught on video. Anastasia would not approve. His publicist was waiting for him when he returned to his office. He ignored her disapproving stare and loosened his tie, then poured himself a drink and gulped it down in one shot. He poured another and stood in front of his floor-to-ceiling windows, watching the crowd below, but not too close, in case the cameras were aimed in his direction. Go on, I know you want to. We had agreed you wouldn't say fully cooperating. When he turned around, she was pouring herself a drink from his bottle of whiskey. It makes you sound like you're a suspect. You know what also makes me sound like a suspect? Not saying I'm fully cooperating with the investigation. She waved away the comment. They're going to suspect you either way. Otherwise, good job. Did you hear some of the questions they were asking me? Ridiculous. It's their job. I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's my life. It's my son. I don't want them thinking those things about me, about us. They're going to think them whether you want them to or not. Today, Anastasia's fingernails were painted jet black. They clinked against the glass whenever she picked it up or put it down. You can't control people's thoughts. You and Apex seem to be doing a pretty good job of it. She shrugged, but there was a smile playing around her lips. We do what we can. The press conference will help build sympathy for you and your family. We'll talk about how we can play this into your campaign down the road, but we'll save that for a day when you're less emotional. Grayson clenched his jaw. He was emotional, but could she blame him? His son was missing, his wife was heartbroken, and his political career, once so promising, was now a matter of public speculation. Connor's tendencies to grace the headlines of various newspapers, both local and national, had caused a few blips in the radar, but nothing to this extent. If Connor came sauntering back, Grayson wasn't sure what he'd do. On one hand, his wife would be beside herself with relief. On the other, the senator would have to fight the urge to kick him out of the house, permanently. If this was one of his son's stupid stunts, Grayson wasn't sure how he would react. He wasn't responsible for what the politician might do. You should have been down there with me. He wanted to blame anyone but himself. You could have taken questions afterward, set the record straight. It wouldn't have looked good. Her tone was a reminder that they had talked about this before, too. Me standing by your side with your wife nowhere to be found? It would have raised even more uncomfortable questions. Grayson knew she was right, but he wasn't about to give her the satisfaction of saying it out loud. Instead, he took another sip of whiskey and let the amber liquid burn his throat and warm his chest. If we do this again, your wife needs to be by your side. The only thing she hates more than you is a press conference. Grayson knew the dig wouldn't bother Anastasia, but it still made him angry when it washed right over her. Especially a press conference you're forcing her to go to. With any luck, we won't need to have another one, and your son will return home in one piece. Then we can talk about cleaning up the mess he left behind. Grayson ground his teeth together. He knew Anastasia didn't give a shit about his personal life, but he wished she'd at least pretend to feel sorry for him. It wouldn't bring him much comfort, but at the moment he'd take anything he could get. But when he turned around, he didn't see sympathy in her eyes, only indifference. He poured himself another drink. It was the only relief he needed. Chapter 11 As the press conference ended and the news moved on to the next story, Cassie looked over to find tears slipping down her mother's face. Before she decided if she wanted to give her a moment of privacy, Laura got up off the couch and enveloped her in a hug. Are you okay, Mom? Judy squeezed Laura, then stepped back to wipe her tears away. I'm sorry. I didn't think I was going to cry. It's okay. Laura gave Cassie a pointed look that got her off the couch, too. What's wrong? The poor boy's mother, the senator's wife, she volunteers at the hospital with me. Are you close? 
No, not really. But we're friendly. Whenever we work the same shifts, we talk a lot. We work pretty well together. I don't love her husband's policies, but he seems like a good man. Mary's a wonderful woman, really kind, cares a lot about helping people. She found out she had cancer last year. It's in remission now, but it'll keep coming back. And now this. It's terrible. Is it true what they said about him? Cassie asked. Getting into trouble and all of that? Judy nodded her head and retreated to the couch. The girls followed her. She hasn't talked about it a lot, but she's mentioned there being trouble at home. I told her I understood. Her gaze flicked to Cassie, then back to her hands, which were folded in her lap. But you never stop loving your kids, you know? No matter what they do. And he wasn't a bad kid. Connor is smart, maybe too smart. And he and his father butt heads a lot. Do you think he did it? God, no. Her mom looked disgusted, and Cassie was ashamed the thought ever came out of her mouth. Besides, he's just missing. For Mary's sake, I hope he shows up soon. Cassie placed a reassuring hand on her mother's shoulder, but immediately regretted the contact. A rush of sadness and pain entered through her palm like she'd touched a stovetop burner. The heat traveled up her arm, around her neck, and buried itself into the base of her skull. The force of the vision pinned her to the back of the couch. Her face went slack as the world around her disappeared. Cassie landed in the body of a man. His feelings were like whispers on the wind, foreign and cold. Satisfaction mingled with delight before they were whisked away, replaced with her own confusion and fear. She was seeing through his eyes, and the vertigo that came with being in a stranger's body made her stomach churn. She wasn't sure if this was the past, present, or future, but it hardly mattered. When she looked down at a figure in front of her, she wasn't the one controlling the body. Whoever was in the driver's seat had complete autonomy. When the man at her feet looked up, she recognized the senator's son, and even though he was 19, an adult in the eyes of the law, he looked like a child. Tears rolled down his cheeks as he begged for his life in a high, panicked voice. It had no effect on the other man. Where her heart would have broken, it remained intact. Where she would have kneeled down to help someone, the man in control of their shared body did nothing to offer his assistance. He stood there, lording over this child, feeling nothing. He lifted their collective arm. It was heavy with the weight of a gun against her palm. The ice-cold metal pierced her skin as she pointed it directly at the kid's face. No matter how much she fought and screamed and tried to close her eyes, she couldn't stop her finger closing around the trigger. She couldn't look away as she squeezed the shot off. As soon as she heard the bang, Cassie was flung back to reality. It took an immense amount of effort not to react to the vision, but she kept her breath even, despite the pounding of her heart. Relief washed over her when she realized her mother hadn't noticed her momentary absence. Laura, however, shot her a questioning look. Should I call her? Judy asked. We're not close, but I have a phone number. I don't want to bother her. She's going through so much right now. But you understand exactly how she's feeling. Laura rubbed their mom's back. That's helpful in a situation like this. You'll be able to comfort her in a way no one else can. What if she doesn't want to talk to me? Cassie had never heard her mom sound this unsure of herself. I don't want to intrude. She'll pick up if she wants to answer you. And if she doesn't pick up, it just means she's too busy or too sad to talk. But no matter what happens, I think she'll be happy to see a friend reach out to her. No matter what happens, Judy sounded exhausted. I hope that poor boy is okay. I'm sure he is. Laura helped their mom to her feet. If you stay positive, maybe she will too. Not too positive. Cassie regretted the words as soon as they left her mouth 
and she stumbled over the correction. I mean, you don't want to give her false hope, you know? Something bad could have happened to him. I'd rather not think about that. Mary's gone through enough. She needs hope more than she needs reality right now. Cassie looked down at her feet as her mother walked away and only looked up again when Laura punched her in the shoulder. Ow! What the hell? Laura hissed. Why would you say that? Because I had a vision. Cassie rubbed the pain out of her shoulder. You didn't have to hit me so hard. You were being a jerk to mom. I was being realistic. Right. Laura sat on the couch. What did you see? I saw someone hold him at gunpoint. Cassie shivered at the memory. And then I saw him pull the trigger. Laura leaned forward to whisper. You saw him die? Connor, I mean? I'm not sure. I heard the gunshot go off, and then I was back here. But the gun was pointing directly at his head. It'd be a miracle if he survived. Does this happen a lot? Getting random visions? Sometimes. Cassie hated questions like this because she never had a satisfactory answer. It depends on the day. I think mom gave it to me. Really? Laura looked toward the kitchen where she could hear their mom on the phone. How did she give it to you? Why? Cassie shrugged. I think I picked up on her emotions. She was pretty upset. When I touched her shoulder, I felt what she was feeling, and then it pulled me in. I'm guessing it wasn't too noticeable. You looked like you zoned out for a minute. I thought maybe you had a flashback or something. Or something. Laura pushed her curls out of her face. Mom's going to be so upset. Think she'll blame me for being too realistic? No. Laura rolled her eyes. But you could use a little more tact. Is this how you talk to the people who've lost their loved ones? Cassie's cheeks reddened. I have tact. I'm full of it. I'm just off my game today. I'm at half tact. You better figure out a way to refill the tank. Otherwise, this trip of ours is going to be a disaster. Laura picked up her coffee, took a sip, and made a face. Gross. She set the coffee down and looked up at Cassie. So, what does this mean? Do you have to investigate what happened to him? I had the vision for a reason, but I don't know anyone around here. Usually, I'd go to David, and he'd put me in touch with someone if he wasn't working the case himself. Otherwise, the authorities usually reach out to me. I'm not really sure what to do. You mean walking up to a random cop and saying you had a vision doesn't usually work? Believe it or not, I've never tried. First time for everything, I guess. I'll make that plan B. I'll see what David has to say first. Cassie pulled out her phone and sent him a text, asking if he knew anyone in Charlotte. His response was curt and immediate. No. She cocked her head at her phone, waiting to see if he'd ask how she was doing or how the trip was going. But when he didn't expand on his response, she sent him another text. How's it going back home? A minute passed, then another. Rather than waiting for an answer that might never come, she tucked her phone away and turned back to Laura. Want to help me go through all my childhood toys? Maybe it'll dredge up some embarrassing memories and you'll get to make fun of me. Laura's eyes brightened. Deal. Chapter 12 Cassie leaned Mr. Brownie up against the closet door so he could watch them go through the remaining two boxes. The musty smell from earlier still hung in the air, but it was less potent now, and her nose didn't tingle quite so much. Do you have a preference? Cassie asked, pointing between the boxes. Dealer's choice. Cassie pushed one box toward Laura and pulled the other one closer to her. When she opened the flaps, a layer of cassette tapes from her favorite artists greeted her. Oh my God, Spice Girls, In Sync, New Kids on the Block. Do you still have that Eminem CD we used to hide from Mom? Cassie saw the edge of it against the side of the box. She pulled it out with a flourish. I used to be so scared of getting caught with this. And it was the explicit version. We thought we were so badass, Cassie kept digging. 
The next layer was made up of knickknacks wrapped in newspaper. What's in your box? A couple of McDonald's Happy Meal toys. A couple of t-shirts from choir. She held them up with a grin. You were so bad at decorating these. Yeah, yeah, have your fun now. Next we go through your boxes. Oh no, I did that a couple years ago. Got rid of three of them. She pointed to the ones remaining in the closet. There was a lot I couldn't get rid of. Yeah, I think I'm going to be the same way. She felt better knowing their mom had forced Laura to throw away her old toys too. I'll probably never touch any of these things again, but I can't just give them away. I want to look back through them when I'm 80. Pass them along to my kids. Laura frowned. I'll never have kids. Cassie was halfway through unwrapping the figurine in her hand. Why would you say that? Laura shrugged. Just a feeling. I'm the only one around here allowed to have feelings, and my feelings say you'll have kids. Just wait. Laura laughed. I guess. I just feel like I'm getting old. Okay, now I'm offended, Cassie huffed at her sister. I'm five years older than you, and I'm still single, and I've got a lot more problems than you do. You'll have a much easier time finding a husband. Maybe I don't want a husband. Cassie tossed the newspaper to the side and looked over one of her precious moments collectible figurines. It was a woman dressed like a nurse. She cast Laura a sideways glance. A wife? Now it was Laura's turn to huff. Maybe I don't want a wife either. I don't know. I want a person. Someone who's nice and smart and funny and super hot. Cassie picked up another newspaper swaddled item. You're a beautiful woman. You're a psychologist. You live in California. It's only a matter of time. Oh, look, Beanie Babies, Cassie gasped. She dropped the figurine she'd been unwrapping into her lap and reached for the Beanie Baby in the form of a calico cat. It didn't quite look like Apollo, but it was close enough. Chip the calico cat. I'm definitely taking this one home. Maybe Apollo will adopt it as his child. Or bite its eyes off. Laura lifted another one from the box. It was a bear with angel wings and a halo. You should look these up. They might be worth something now. Cassie snatched the bear from Laura. Sell them, you monster. Laura rolled her eyes. What about those? She pointed to the figurine of the nurse. Do you still care about them? Grandma started my collection for me. It'd break mom's heart if I gave them up. She didn't seem to care when I threw them away. Cassie's head snapped up, and Laura cackled. I'm kidding. Yeah, she'd kill you. When we're both old spinsters living together, we can combine our sets and live in an entire house of them. Sounds like a plan. Cassie unwrapped the second figurine. This one was of a little girl on roller skates with a golden ribbon tied to a loop at the top of her head, one of several Christmas ornaments she'd received over the years. Nope, nope, nope. Laura scooted away from the box in front of her. I am not touching those. Cassie leaned over the box and gasped. My porcelain dolls. I haven't thought about these in years. Me neither. I think I had purposely forgotten you used to collect them. You were such a weirdo. What are you talking about? They're beautiful. Cassie pulled one out of its box. It had shiny red hair and wore an emerald and gold dress. Every detail was pristine. She held it out to Laura. You don't like her? Laura scooted back even further. No, the spirit of a dead little girl probably lives inside of it. It's going to come alive tonight and kill us all. Cassie looked into the doll's green eyes and let her mind defocus. She had never thought there was anything strange about her dolls, but who knew what could have happened over the years? Were the dolls capable of taking on spirits? Were the movies true? Cassie, Laura had stopped laughing. Cassie, don't joke around. Cassie let Laura's voice fade away. She searched every inch of the doll with her mind, probing every corner of its hollow interior to see if something sinister lived inside. Could it be possible? Was there something? Boo! Cassie leaned over and yelled in her sister's face. Laura shrieked and fell back, hitting her head on the floor with a dull thunk. Cassie laughed so hard she fell over. 
Even Laura couldn't stop herself from joining in. You're such a bitch. Oh my God, I thought you were serious. The dolls are perfectly normal, I promise. No dead kids trapped inside. Laura groaned and held her chest. I could have died. You could have killed me. Don't be so dramatic. Cassie was still laughing as she put the doll back in its box and set it to the side. She grabbed another knickknack and started to unwrap it when every muscle in her body seized. Holy shit. Okay, you had your laugh. You got me. Let's not make a habit of it. No, I'm not joking. Goosebumps erupted over Cassie's entire body. She let the figurine fall from her hand and roll across the carpet as she looked closer at the newspaper it had been wrapped in. I can't freaking believe it. Laura leaned over her shoulder. What is it? Cassie couldn't tear her eyes away from the image in front of her. It was a picture of the same little boy who had been haunting her for months. The same one who couldn't stop staring at Laura. The same one who had given her a macabre warning during last night's dream. When she said as much, Laura sat back on her haunches with wide eyes. What's it say about him? Cassie knew her voice would tremble if she tried to read it aloud, so she laid the paper down between them. She and her sister leaned in close to skim it together. Boy kidnapped from playground in broad daylight, Savannah, Georgia. Officials are looking for Sebastian Thomas, aged nine, who went missing from Forsyth Park on Thursday afternoon. His babysitter reportedly took him to the playground at his mother's request and states she was reading a book on a nearby bench when she noticed the child was missing. After unsuccessfully searching for Thomas, she called the boy's mother, who then contacted authorities. The investigation is ongoing. Officials have not disclosed any possible leads or named any suspects. Witnesses have stated they do not remember a disturbance, indicating Thomas may have been taken by someone he knows. If you have any information or think you have seen a missing person, please contact the proper authorities. Cassie and Laura sat back and stared at each other, processing what they just discovered. It was front page news, but the paper offered little information. Not that it mattered. Cassie already knew it had ended poorly for the little boy. Sebastian, she corrected. She knew his name now, and she was going to use it. Do you recognize him? Cassie asked, having found her voice. Is there any reason you might have known each other? Why he could be so interested in you? Not at all. Laura pointed to the date on the newspaper. June 7th, 1994. Even if I'd met him, I wouldn't have remembered him. If he was in my preschool class or mom took me to playdates with him, she'd remember better than I would. They heard the creaking of the staircase. Cassie tried to hide the newspaper, but Laura grabbed her wrist. You could always ask her, you know. Stop trying to hide this stuff from her. I will, Cassie said, but Laura didn't look convinced. Just not now. Laura let go of her wrist, and Cassie slipped the paper behind her just as their mom opened the door to the sewing room and popped her head inside. You're supposed to be making this place cleaner, not dirtier. Didn't think I'd have to tell you to pick up your toys once you made it to your thirties. Sorry. Laura and Cassie said in harmony. How did your phone call go? Cassie asked. Mary picked up. She's distraught, of course. I don't think anything I said helped. I'm sure it did, Laura offered. It might just take a minute to sink in. Judy nodded, but she didn't look convinced. Anyway, I have a doctor's appointment. Your father can't go with me today, so I was wondering if either of you girls would like to? Is everything okay? Cassie asked. Judy sighed. Part of the reason I didn't want to tell you both about this was because I knew you'd be constantly asking me questions like that. Her voice was light, and Cassie could tell she was trying to play it off, but it sounded like it bothered her. Yes, everything is fine. It's just a pre-op appointment to draw some blood and make sure nothing's changed since the last time they did it. Of course, Cassie lied. I'd love to. 
Chapter 13 As soon as their mom left the room, Cassie groaned and fell back onto the floor. Dust tickled her nose, and she had to rub at it to make the sensation go away. Thanks for nothing. Laura looked as smug as she sounded. You're welcome. Cassie picked her head up off the floor enough to glare at her sister, then thumped it back down. I hate hospitals. I'd hate them even if I didn't see dead people. Oh, the color drained from Laura's face. I'm so sorry. I can go instead. No, it's fine. Cassie's smile was tight. I need to spend more time with her, one on one. If I had a choice, I would have chosen the mall or something, but it's fine, really. Laura nodded, but she still looked apologetic. Then her eyes brightened, and she handed the newspaper back to Cassie. This might be a good time to talk to her about some of the stuff you've been experiencing. It's not exactly dinner conversation. I understand that. Laura stood and helped Cassie to her feet. But you need to give them a chance. Cassie rolled her eyes, but she didn't argue. What are you going to do while I'm gone? Look into Sebastian Thomas, obviously. When Cassie made a face, Laura shook her finger at her sister. Don't go telling me not to get involved. I already am. Old habits. Truth was, Cassie appreciated the help. Maybe there's more about him online. That newspaper article was pretty short. It didn't seem like they knew much at that point. I'm assuming that since he's still haunting you, his case is cold. With the internet and 25 years of information to go through, there's got to be something out there. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a podcast episode dedicated to him, or even Sarah. I'm just glad we have a name. Calling him Little Ghost Boy was getting annoying, and now we have a solid place to start. The question is whether it's enough. Cassie didn't have a response for that. She took a moment to look back down at Sebastian's photo, to cement a living picture of him in her head, before she ambled downstairs and out to her mother's Camry. Cassie was still wearing her sister's sweatshirt, which was heavy enough to keep the chill in the air off her skin. Her mother waited until they pulled out onto the main road before she broke the silence. How'd you sleep last night? Not bad. The blow-up mattress isn't too bad. Judy shot her a look that told her she didn't believe a word she said. Sorry about not having another bed for you. No, it's fine. Cassie's voice was too high. I like your sewing room. It's very full. Judy laughed. Cassie had almost forgotten what it sounded like. I've taken on a few too many projects, but it's a fun way to pass the time. Your father has the garage for his woodworking, and I have the upstairs for my sewing. Our own little spaces. How have you guys been doing? She laughed again, but this one sounded strained. Are you asking if our marriage is okay? No, of course not. She wasn't worried, but she was curious. I mean, maybe? We're fine, honey. Everything's peachy keen, really. There was a rough patch there for a couple years with everything going on, but there's no world in which your father and I aren't together. You don't have to worry. I wasn't. Cassie hated that everything going on was synonymous with that time you almost died and surreptitiously kicked us out of your life. You both seem happy. We are. She slid her gaze over to Cassie. Are you happy? Cassie hadn't expected that question. She could have lied, but she wanted to be better at talking through the hard stuff. I think so. Some days are bad. Some days are harder than others. But some days are good. I'm happy sometimes. And that's kind of cool. Judy nodded her head, and Cassie thought she saw the glint of tears in her eyes. But when she spoke, her voice was even. Did you find anything you wanted to get rid of? Not yet. Laura and I are gonna keep it all and look back at it when we're 80. I heard a lot of screaming up there. She found my porcelain doll collection. She says they're creepy. They are creepy. Judy laughed, and it was back to normal. But you love them so much. Cassie basked in the glow of having a normal conversation with her mother. It felt easy, 
even if there was an underlying tension and everything. She'd have to broach the subject eventually. Better now than never. Thank you for asking me to come today. I mean, you asked both of us. Cassie lost some of her momentum. She felt dumb. But you know, thanks for including me. Judy twisted her mouth to the side. She gripped the wheel until her knuckles turned white. Your father and I are both so happy to see you. I got a little overwhelmed at dinner, and I lashed out. That wasn't right. I'm sorry, too. Tears stung Cassie's eyes. There's a lot I want to tell you, a lot I want to say to you, but I'm still having trouble putting it all into words. Me, too. She took a deep breath and took a left. Traffic was light. It didn't give either of them much to look at. I know you don't like hospitals, but I appreciate you coming with me. Of course. Had she heard Cassie's conversation with her sister? I'm sorry your friend is going through a tough time right now. Mary's a wonderful person. It seems the best people get the shortest end of the stick, but come out the other side even more powerful. Sounds like you, Cassie said. She still remembered the strength her mother had after Cassie's incident. Judy never cried or got angry. She just got to work. Whatever Cassie needed, her mother was there for her at a moment's notice. Sounds like you, she said. Cassie scrunched up her face. There was no reality where she wanted to talk about how brave or strong she was because of what happened. How did you meet Mrs. Grayson? Did you become friends right away? Judy took another turn and shifted in her seat before she answered. I had already been volunteering at the hospital for a year or two. It made me feel better. I couldn't help you, so I was hoping I could help other people. Mom, I know that's not really what was going on, but it made me feel good to make other people happy. When Mary came in, everyone had their own opinion about it. She was Senator Grayson's wife, so it was obviously a political move. Half the volunteers either wanted to be her friend or wanted to be her enemy. I was just hoping she was willing to put the work in. I'm guessing she was. Mary is wonderful. She's such a kind person. Sometimes I forget who she's married to. I'll never understand how they make it work, but they do. She loves him, but she hates the politics. She always talks about him like he's two different people. One version is her husband, and the other version is the politician. What made you guys start talking? There was a patient in the hospital who had just died from a brain tumor. I had visited him quite a lot over the last few years. I knew his family. He'd had cancer before, and it went into remission. Then it came back. After three or four rounds of chemo, he was tired. He opted out of further treatment. It was only a matter of time. Judy sniffled, and Cassie gave her a moment to collect herself. After I found out he'd died, I broke down in a supply closet. Mary was coming in to get some cleaning supplies. She held me for a good half an hour while I sobbed into her sweater. That thing cost more than what I made in a week. But she didn't care. She just wanted to make sure I was okay. That's when I found out she had cancer too. What kind? Lymphoma. She's had treatment and it's in remission, but it's just a waiting game. I'm sure she has the best doctors. She does, but that doesn't always save a person's life. Judy shook her head. And now this thing with her son. Did you talk about him much? Cassie couldn't stop her detective brain from turning on but there had to be a reason she had that vision. A little. I'd see the newspapers, you know. But I never brought it up. She'd mention it a few times. Trouble at home. Her husband not knowing how to handle him. Her son not knowing how to talk to her husband. She was afraid Connor would leave and never come back. Cassie bit her lip to keep from saying anything she'd regret. I told her I understood that fear and it's the worst feeling in the world. She kept her eyes locked on the road ahead of her. I told her not to let it happen, no matter what. She had to hang on to her kid. Cassie felt the pain in her mother's voice, and it broke her heart. 
She hadn't given her parents or her sister a choice when she'd told them she didn't want them to stick around. She'd been too angry back then, too fearful of relying on another person to take care of her. That fear was still very much alive, but for the first time in her life, she felt strong enough to overpower it. Chapter 14 When the nurse called her mother's name, Judy turned to Cassie with a frown on her face. Are you sure you'll be okay out here? I'll be fine, Mom. Don't worry about me. That's never going to happen. But Judy patted her arm and followed the nurse through the double doors on the other side of the waiting room, leaving Cassie alone. Except, of course, she was rarely alone. The waiting room may have been devoid of any other living people, but several ghosts loitered, either pacing the room or sitting patiently in a chair, as though another nurse would call their name any minute. Cassie's fingers were ice cold, although her palms were sweating. Anxiety was a curious beast. The blood had retreated from her extremities to protect her vital organs from a threat that didn't exist. Her brain told her she was in danger, and her body reacted as though she were face to face with a bear in the middle of the woods. The telltale signs of a panic attack were all too familiar to her. If she could concentrate long enough, she'd be able to slow her racing thoughts, calm her shallow breaths, and pump the blood back into her fingertips. But that was when she was in the comfort of her own home. Hospitals were different. The sterile smell of antiseptic spray took her back to a time when she almost forgot what a home should smell like. Fresh baked cookies and hot coffee and her mother's ever-present lavender potpourri. Back then, it was lukewarm meatloaf and styrofoam cups and bandages that needed changing. But it was also the bright white lights that never turned off and the constant beeping of monitors and the way they woke you up every few hours to check your vitals. Cassie could sleep all day in a hospital bed and never feel like she'd gotten enough rest. And the waiting rooms. Sometimes they were worse than the patient rooms. The hushed whispers, the anticipation of bad news, and the skip of your heart whenever the door opened and the nurse called someone's name. The feeling of relief when it was not your turn offset the sinking realization you were just putting off the inevitable but it was so much worse for Cassie. No amount of bleach could scrub the smell of death from the air. There was something oppressive about hospitals, too. The building had seen an indescribable amount of death, and even though some had been accidental or even anticipatory, each soul left its mark until it felt as though the hospital took on a life of its own. Areas like this, waiting rooms and doctor's offices, were nothing compared to the emergency room. But Cassie could feel the darkness reaching out to her like icy fingers running their nails down her back. The ambient temperature was always a few degrees colder here, and she could never quite get warm. A young father and his son walked into the waiting room, glanced in her direction, then sat in a pair of chairs about 10 feet away. The boy was about eight, with dark hair and curious eyes. He stared at Cassie until his father took out a toy train and let him play out all the adventures living in his head. Sebastian Thomas was about the same age when he went missing, when he died. There was no mention of Sebastian's father in the newspaper article, just his babysitter and mother, and Cassie wondered if he had been in the picture, if he even knew his son was missing. Did he help? Did he do it? After all, Sebastian hadn't made a scene. If his father had told him to come with him, the boy would have obeyed. The irony of cases like this is that it is inconceivable a parent would kill their own child, and yet, they are often the first suspect, and for good reason. They would have the victim's trust, ample opportunity, and even motive, and yet, we never want to believe they would be capable of such a crime. Cassie thought of Connor Grayson. From what she'd gathered about the mother, the police would clear her as a suspect. 
Senator Grayson, however, would have more to prove. His poor relationship with his son and his political aspirations would undoubtedly come back to bite him in the ass. But was he capable of killing his own child? Cassie didn't know enough about him to make that determination. Over the years, she'd seen the lengths to which politicians would go in order to secure their futures, but their victims were typically strangers or colleagues, not their own kids. The little boy made train noises as he pushed his toy around the room and over to where Cassie was sitting. When he got close enough, he stopped, looked up at her, and handed the train over. Cassie took it with a smile on her face. Thank you very much. The metal train was hand-painted. Perhaps it was the boy's father's when he was growing up. What's your name? Devin? It's nice to meet you, Devin. My name is Cassie. Devin looked at the empty seat next to Cassie, then back up at her. Can Sebastian and I play together? Cassie's breath caught in her throat. She looked on either side of her, but didn't see the ghost of the little boy who had haunted her for months. Why did he seem to always be by her side, but choose to be invisible? Why was he showing himself to Devon and not to her? Please, Devon asked. His big brown eyes were hard to resist. She handed the train back to him. Of course. Thank you. Devon bounded away, and Sebastian presumably followed him. When Cassie looked up, her eyes met the father's who stood and walked over to her with a sheepish smile on his face. Sorry about that, he's pretty friendly. Oh, it's no problem at all, he's adorable. He's a handful, that's for sure. The man looked at his son, then back at Cassie. He lowered his voice. Did he say anything strange to you? Cassie's eyes widened. There was no way she'd be able to explain what had just transpired. The man held up his hands. You don't have to tell me what it is. It makes some people uncomfortable. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with him. I just want him to be okay, you know? Cassie's throat was dry, but she forced herself to speak. He might just have a big imagination. I think it's more than that. The man smiled and shifted his weight back and forth a few times. You'd think I'm crazy, but the things he's talked about... The things he says he's seen would shock you. I don't think you're crazy. If he was, then she was too. And I think your son is very special. Thank you. Cassie hesitated, but the pressure inside her built until she couldn't hold it back any longer. I think your son and I might share some interesting qualities. The man raised his eyebrows, and Cassie scrambled for her words. We're different. It's not always a bad thing. I just don't know if I should be worried about him, he laughed. You know, more than I already am. Worrying doesn't make things better, though, does it? She found it ironic that she, someone laden with anxiety on a daily basis, was imparting this particular wisdom to a stranger. But he didn't have to know any of that. What he could really use is your support and your love. No matter how weird things get, He's still your son. It'll be okay, as long as you two stick together. The door to the patient area opened, and a nurse led Cassie's mom back into the waiting room. Cassie stood, not wanting to be rude, but not wanting her mom to ask what she and the stranger had been talking about. It was nice to meet both of you. I have to run. She turned to leave, but hesitated. If I had one more piece of advice, it would be to trust him. Kids are more perceptive of the world around us than we give them credit for. I'll do that. Cassie waved goodbye to Devin and met her mother in the center of the room. What was that about? Judy asked. He apologized for his son coming over and bugging me. I told him it wasn't a problem. Did you get his number? Judy's eyes sparkled. This was the mother she remembered before the attack. He was cute. No, mother. Cassie pushed her mom toward the exit. It's time to go home now. Judy laughed and let Cassie steer her out of the hospital. But before they walked through the automatic doors and back out into the fresh air, Cassie looked over her shoulder. 
The father looked on as his son played with his train, presumably by himself. But as Cassie cast a final glance at Devon, she saw another figure pushing his own toy train around on the floor. Even in death, he had found a new friend. Once again, the horror of Sebastian's untimely death struck Cassie. Even Connor, who had lived long enough to reach adulthood, had been taken from his family far too soon. And it would be even worse to find out that his family had something to do with it. Chapter 15 When Grayson heard the doorbell ring, he could hardly contain his relief. He'd been sitting in his living room for the last hour as Anastasia lectured him on how to handle his son's disappearance. The senator had only been half listening, and she didn't appreciate his lack of focus. But when the doorbell rang, he was on his feet in seconds, buttoning his silver suit jacket and smoothing out the wrinkles. He didn't know who it was, but they must have had a good excuse to get past the security guard at the gate. Murphy was at the door, pulling it open, Grayson stopped dead. He recognized the first man right away. Detective Calvin Davenport was leading the investigation into Connor's disappearance. He was in his 50s and held himself like a man who believed he deserved more than he'd ever gotten. Grayson got the distinct impression he went home every night and drank himself to sleep. That probably accounted for the way his stomach bulged against the waist of his pants. The other two men were vaguely familiar to him, but he knew they were FBI. The older one was close to Davenport's age, but it was clear he took much better care of his body. He was clean-shaven, with a buzz cut that told Grayson the agent never stopped being a military man. His hair was graying on the sides, but dark on top. It came to a sharp widow's peak that accentuated his downturned eyebrows. He carried a perpetual look of contemplation and Grayson remembered him being quiet and professional. The younger one had the bright eyes of someone who had found his calling and was happy to do his job, no matter the price. Grayson knew the system would break him eventually, but it was refreshing to see someone who still had hope. His hair was short and bronze, and his well-kempt beard made him look his age. Grayson couldn't imagine anyone would take the man seriously without it. Senator Grayson, do you mind if we come in? It took a moment for Grayson to realize he was being addressed. He nodded, and suddenly his foyer was full of people. Anastasia had followed him to the front entrance with a scowl on her face. She typed something out on her tablet while looking at each of the newcomers in turn. Was she taking notes? Was she messaging someone at Apex? Thank you, Murphy, Grayson said by way of dismissal. Gentlemen, I can't say I'm excited to see you. Should we sit? That would be best. Davenport's voice was somber. Thank you. Grayson led them to the living room. The detective and two agents took the couch, which was barely big enough for the three of them. Anastasia returned to the overstuffed chair she had been sitting in earlier. Drinks? Grayson asked. All three declined, which was for the best. He'd have to send Anastasia to get them, and he didn't want to see the look on her face when he asked her to do some menial task like offer their guests refreshments. Besides, his heart was pounding in his chest, and it was nice to have a familiar, if not welcoming, face close by. Is your wife home? Davenport asked after Grayson sat in a chair opposite his assistant. She's upstairs, sleeping. Grayson hadn't been able to console her, and so he'd left her to cry herself to sleep. I'd rather not wake her. Davenport nodded, then gestured to the men on his right. You remember my colleagues? Yes, but I'm afraid I don't recall your names. Agent Robert Manis, the older one said. He gestured to his colleague. And my partner, Agent Christopher Vioto. Thank you. Grayson meant it. What can I do for you? I'm afraid we have some bad news. Grayson's pounding heart sent the blood rushing to his ears. He felt his vision swim and gripped the arms of his chair to keep him grounded. Is it about my son? Yes, sir. 
You found him? Yes, we did. Grayson swallowed. He's dead, isn't he? I'm afraid so, Senator. Even Anastasia had the sensitivity to put down her tablet. Grayson couldn't decide where to look. He hated the pity in his publicist's eyes, the apology in the eyes of the two agents, the mild interest on the face of the detective. How? The word was rough in Grayson's mouth. Why? We're still working through all of that. What can you tell me then? He needed a moment to absorb the information. I want to know. Davenport nodded to Manus, who leaned forward and clasped his hands in front of him. He still looked apologetic, but experience must have taught him that voicing his sympathy wasn't the right course of action. We found your son a few blocks away from his abandoned vehicle. He was at the back of an alley. Manus paused to alert Grayson that some hard news was coming. He was shot in the head. There were a few bruises on his arms and legs. He was shot? Grayson's mind raced. Do you know why? Not yet. That's what we were hoping to talk to you about. Davenport took out a pad of paper. Do you have any enemies? Grayson laughed and immediately regretted it. But the damage was done. Of course. I'm a North Carolina state senator. A lot of people hate me. Do you have a list of your most vicious contrarians? I can send it to you. The entire room looked at Anastasia when she spoke. She was wearing blood red again, but she had kept her nails black. Grayson hadn't noticed when she'd picked up her tablet again. I have a list of about 20 who have caused serious problems, but I have additional names if you need them. Appreciate it. Davenport let his eyes linger on her for a few more seconds before turning back to Grayson. Did your son have enemies? Not that I am aware of, but I'm sure you're familiar with the headlines, detective. He's gotten into some trouble in the past. Drugs and hacking, Davenport said. And Grayson wasn't sure if it was for clarification or to inform his colleagues. He didn't talk to you about any recent trouble he might have gotten into? We weren't on the best of terms. Grayson hated the way all three of them seemed to take a mental note of that information. He didn't confide in me. Would he have confided in your wife? I doubt it. He shook his head, but I can't be sure. Agent Viotto spoke for the first time. His voice was deeper than expected, given his lean frame and boyish looks. Could you tell us more about your relationship with your son? Did you have any recent arguments? Am I a suspect? At the moment, no, sir. Fiodo's tone indicated Grayson shouldn't get comfortable. We need to collect as much information as possible about the last few days. If you and your son had a disagreement, it might explain where we found him and why he was there. Grayson closed his eyes. He had pushed the memory out of his mind, and it took a moment to recall the exact circumstances. His mother found coke in his room. It wasn't the first time. She wasn't sure how to confront him about it. I lost my temper. It's not a moment I'm proud of. I went up to his room and started tearing it apart. I told him things would have to change. He could clean up his act or he could get out. He chose the latter. Is that the last you saw him? Davenport asked. No. He came back the next day, apologizing and telling me he'd do better. I didn't believe him. Why not? It was too easy. He never apologizes, and he's never begged for my forgiveness. Did he seem afraid? Fiotto asked. Could that be why he was acting strange? No, not afraid. Grayson searched for the right word. His apology seemed practiced. I felt like he had an angle, but I couldn't figure out what it was. Did you forgive him? I'm sorry? Fiotto shrugged. Did you forgive him? Grayson's mouth went dry. No, I didn't. Manus must have caught the look on Grayson's face because he cleared his throat. I think what my partner wants to know is whether you let him come home. Did he stay the night? Yeah. Grayson swallowed. Yes, he left by morning. I didn't think much of it. 
I figured I'd see him again that night. But you didn't. No. Were you worried? Fiodo asked. Grayson knew the man was just doing his job, but he didn't enjoy feeling as though he were in the hot seat. Not particularly. Connor came and went as he pleased. We'd done everything to get him to fall in line. Bribes, begging, asking my security team to babysit him. Nothing worked. We gave him space, but he ended up getting into more trouble. Mr. Murphy told us Connor was in Rock Hill the night before he went missing. Do you know why? Grayson shook his head. Maybe visiting friends? I'm not sure. Like I said, he didn't confide in me. There was a lull in the conversation, and the three officers exchanged looks. Davenport was the first to stand. Do you mind if we look at your son's room? Grayson matched his movements. What for? Anything that could indicate who did this to him. We're still in the preliminary stages of the investigation. Any piece of evidence helps, Theodo added. He and Manis stood too. Grayson's heart pounded. Not today, gentlemen. I'm sorry. The room froze. Even Anastasia looked up. Sir, it's important that we gather as much evidence as quickly as possible in order to solve your son's case. I am aware, thank you. Grayson buttoned his suit jacket. It felt akin to donning armor. But right now, I have to go upstairs and tell my wife that our only child is dead. We need time to mourn. I'll make sure his room is not disturbed. Sir, do you have a search warrant? Grayson looked directly at Vioto, channeling some of his ire at the younger man. Not yet. The words sounded foreboding. Then I kindly ask that you leave. You can return later tonight with your warrant or tomorrow morning with my permission. I'll leave that up to you. Murphy? The man materialized in the doorway. See them out, please. Make sure Miss Bolton finds her way home as well. Grayson didn't bother looking to see Anastasia's reaction. He'd deal with the repercussions of dismissing her tomorrow. Instead, he walked through the foyer and up the stairs knowing he was about to destroy his wife's entire world. Chapter 16 Cassie found Laura in the guest bedroom, cross-legged on the bed and bent over her phone. Her sister looked up with red eyes when Cassie knocked on the doorframe. You okay? Yeah, she sniffled. Spending the last couple of hours doing a deep dive into the life of a murdered child isn't fun. Understandable. How was the hospital? Mostly fine. When Laura quirked an eyebrow, Cassie settled in next to her. Mom's tests went fine. We'll find out in a day or two if everything is normal. If so, the surgery is officially a go. That's good, but scary. Did mom seem nervous or anything? Cassie shook her head. I don't know if it's because she's not worried or if it's because she didn't want me to worry, but she seemed normal. Laura narrowed her eyes. What else happened? Why do you think something else happened? Because I'm recognizing that introspective look on your face that comes whenever you have an encounter. That makes it sound like I talk to aliens. Laura rolled her eyes because talking to ghosts is way more normal. Fair point, Cassie shrugged. This little boy came up to me in the waiting room. He was there with his father. They were both alive, by the way. Good to know, continue. He asked me to play with Sebastian. Whoa, Laura sat back. He could see him? It's weirder than that. He could see him, and I couldn't. I think Sebastian is sometimes here, but I can't tell. It kind of freaks me out. Good, now you understand how the rest of us feel. Yeah, I guess, Cassie gestured to Laura's phone. What did you find? Unfortunately, not much. Laura sat up right now, grabbing her phone and flipping through a few different screens. Sebastian Thomas, age nine, kidnapped from the park, no witnesses, no connection that I can find to Sarah or the man they arrested who they thought had something to do with her disappearance. His name is Henry Fitzpatrick, by the way, 
Hank to his friends, if he even had any of those. Sebastian's parents waited two years before they held a funeral for him. They never found a body. As though they'd summoned him, Sebastian materialized in the corner of the room. He looked from Cassie to Laura with eyes a shade brighter than the last time she'd seen him this close. He didn't have a ghost train in his hand, and Cassie wondered where it went when he wasn't playing with it. Hi, Sebastian. Laura looked up at her. He's here? She nodded. He was staring at both of them, but he didn't speak. Did you learn anything else? His was a pretty high profile case. Other kids had already gone missing, but the idea someone could take a child from a busy playground in broad daylight freaked out a lot of parents. He became the poster child for making sure you always had one eye on your kid. Did they have any suspects? They didn't release anything publicly. Laura cast her gaze around the room, and Cassie got the distinct impression she was trying to see if she could spot him. No one was named. He's in the corner, she pointed to him, and he looked at her finger as if she caught him stealing cookies from the cookie jar. She dropped it. What about the parents, the babysitter? Sebastian's father died when he was two. His mom was a single parent working two jobs, the one job vouched for her. She was working when he went missing. So she had an alibi. Yep. And the babysitter? Laura sighed and stared into the corner Sebastian occupied. She was 18 when he went missing. The police grilled her and the public hung her out to dry, saying she'd been irresponsible, that she was the reason he died. Some of them even said she was in on it. They wanted to blame someone, so it might as well be the person who let him get kidnapped. That's awful. It gets worse. She pulled up an article on her phone. Exactly a year after he disappeared, she killed herself. She wrote a note and apologized to Sebastian's mother, but she maintained her innocence. I hope all those conspiracy theorists felt horrible about what they did. Some of them might have. Others probably thought they were still right. But there's no evidence she did anything. She was wrecked when she found out he went missing. And when they never found him, it haunted her. What I'd like to know is why he's haunting me. Sebastian blinked, and Cassie imagined him saying, come on, you're so close, just a little further. I still have no idea. Laura threw her phone back on the bed. Like I said, I can't find any connection between him and Sarah Lennox. I don't recognize the face at all. Dad said he remembers when he went missing and how afraid everyone was. Cassie whipped her head around. You asked dad? Yeah, I figured he'd remember, having two young kids at a time when a bunch were getting kidnapped. She scrunched up her face. Why, did you not want me to say anything? Not really, even if it could help us find the answer faster. Cassie wasn't sure what to say. Of course, she wanted to help Sebastian as soon as possible. But a part of her wanted to keep it a secret for as long as possible. She hadn't wanted to tell Laura because she didn't want to get her involved, to put her in danger. But with her parents, it was different. She wasn't quite ready to broach the subject of her abilities. It'd have to happen eventually. He mentioned Sarah Lennox, said she went missing around the same time, but couldn't remember exactly when. Did he say anything else about her? Nope, that was it. And he didn't ask why you were curious? You know, Dad, he lets you come to him on your own terms. He doesn't press the issue. I just told him we found the paper in a box upstairs and were curious. He left it at that. Okay. Cassie wasn't sure why her heart was pounding so much. She looked around the room for a distraction and spotted a small memory box on the corner of the desk across from them. It was covered in stickers. What's that? Laura followed her gaze to the box. A bunch of pictures from when we were kids. I saw a couple of Sarah in them. I thought you'd want to look through them. Or maybe they'd help bring back some memories. Oh yeah, good point. But Cassie didn't move. She wanted to solve the mystery of Sarah Lennox's disappearance, 
but she knew she wouldn't like the answer. No matter how it shaped up, her childhood best friend was dead. Even if it wasn't directly her fault, Cassie knew once she learned the truth, she'd carry the guilt of Sarah's death with her for the rest of her life. She'd always wonder if she could have done more. Before Cassie could muster up the courage to retrieve the box, Sebastian reached over and stuck his hand through the center of the box. As his hand disappeared inside, he closed his eyes in concentration. The box teetered and fell off the edge of the desk. Within the same breath, he disappeared. Laura was on her feet and across the room in a matter of seconds. Holy shit! Cassie was caught between laughter and shock. It's okay, don't be scared. What the hell was that? It was Sebastian, he's gone now. He did that? Cassie nodded, but she had to bite her tongue to keep from giggling. She'd never seen Laura so afraid in her life. Then again, if an invisible hand knocked something off the table, Cassie would have the same reaction, abilities or no abilities. I didn't know he could, she admitted. He usually just stands in a corner and stares. He's only spoken to me once. This is new. Is he getting stronger? Maybe. Cassie hated how she could never be sure of anything when it came to ghosts. We have his name now, more of his story. That could be why. Laura looked a little calmer now. Why'd he knock it over? Not sure. When the box had fallen over, most of the pictures had dumped out into a pile. A photograph had slid across the floor and landed in front of Cassie. Was this what he'd been searching for? She picked it up and turned it over. Laura leaned in close. The photo was like any picture taken of a pair of kids when they were younger, half blurry and out of focus. The two girls had their arms thrown around each other's shoulders, their heads tipped back in raucous laughter. They each wore baggy t-shirts and cut off shorts. Their hair was short and messy and windblown. That's her, isn't it? Laura asked. Cassie vaguely remembered her mom taking the picture of them. It had only been a few days before she disappeared. They both looked so happy. There was no way either of them could have known what the universe had in store for them. Yeah, Cassie swallowed back some bile. One of the last pictures ever taken of Sarah Lennox. Chapter 17 Morning came early for Cassie. When her eyes fluttered open, she could tell by the darkness of the room that the sun had barely crested the horizon. The pounding in her head and the soreness of her back made it impossible to fall back asleep, so she sat up and continued what she'd been doing all day yesterday. Thinking about Sebastian Thomas. She hadn't seen him since he'd knocked over the box containing photos of her and Sarah Lennox. It was clear Laura hadn't wanted to sleep alone in her room, but Cassie had a feeling Sebastian wouldn't return for a while. It had taken him such a long time to speak Sarah Lennox's name and so much effort to knock over the box that he was probably hanging out in that space where ghosts went when they weren't visible. Cassie liked to imagine it as an airport where the ghosts milled about until they were ready to fly off to their next destination. This gate leads to the great beyond. This gate leads to your childhood home. This gate leads to the medium in Savannah who'll put her life on the line to solve your case. Aren't the views amazing? The photograph he'd sent soaring across the room sat on the floor next to her blow-up mattress. She brought it close to her face, even though she had the entire thing memorized. Sarah was wearing a baggy black shirt with a wolf on it. Cassie was wearing a white shirt with a blue flower in the center. They had their heads tilted back at identical angles. Both wore the silly pink friendship bracelets they had made for each other earlier that summer. But she felt like she was still missing something. Was there a clue in their smiles? In the blurry trees that lined the background? Was Sebastian lurking just off camera? Was Sarah's killer somewhere nearby? What was it about this photograph that made it so special? Cassie had spent half the night going through the other photographs. There seemed to be a million of them, 
but none were any more or less interesting than this one. Most were of Cassie and Laura. A bunch also featured Sarah. Her mom or dad would show up here or there, along with other people Cassie had long forgotten. But none of those images offered her any insight into what Sebastian wanted. She'd called his name, repeated the story of his disappearance out loud, asked questions, but got no responses in return. If he was there, he couldn't or wouldn't make contact. It was up to her to figure out the next piece of the puzzle. When the sun had gotten bright enough to illuminate her room, there was a soft knock on her door. It was Laura. Are you up? Yeah. She pulled her sister's sweatshirt over her head. At this rate, she'd go home to Savannah in it. Come in. Laura popped her head through the crack in the door. Her face was somber. News just broke that Connor Grayson is dead. Mom is pretty upset. Oh no. Cassie got to her feet. Her stomach clenched at the news, although it wasn't really news to her at all. Are they saying anything else? They caught the guy. Already? Then why did she have a vision? Wasn't she supposed to help? Did they say what happened? They're running the story nonstop. You should come down. Cassie slipped on a pair of socks and followed her sister down the stairs. Her father handed her a cup of coffee, and she let the scalding liquid wake her up before she joined her mom in the living room. Judy raised her head when they entered. Her eyes were red, and her cheeks were puffy. She hadn't even tried to tame her hair. Did you hear? Yeah. Cassie wasn't sure how to console her, or even if she wanted to be consoled. Some people just needed a shoulder to cry on. Laura told me. Horrible. Judy was shaking her head. Her voice broke. Just horrible. Cassie sat down next to her mother and leaned her head against her arm. Laura sat on her other side. The room was silent as the final commercial played out before returning to the news cycle. If you're just tuning in, we have some terrible news today. It was the same man from yesterday, but this time he wore a maroon suit. Connor Grayson, son of North Carolina State Senator Lawrence Grayson, was found dead yesterday at age 19. After his car was abandoned in a parking garage, police began an investigation into his disappearance. A few hours later, his body was found in an alleyway a few blocks from his vehicle. He had suffered a gunshot wound to the head in what police are calling an execution-style killing. Cassie had to blink away the images flashing through her mind. The son begging for his life, the killer raising his hand, the gun going off like an explosion. She hadn't seen Connor's body crumple as he died, but it wasn't hard to fill in the blanks. This morning, we've learned that police have arrested their prime suspect. The screen split, and the image of the news anchor shifted to the left, on the right, a podium stood outside the police station. A small group of people exited the building and made their way over to the reporters. Nicole Rickman is once again on the scene, bringing us the latest information. Nicole? Thank you, Colt. The lead investigator in the Connor Grayson case is about to provide us with more details about the investigation. Let's listen in. The news anchor in the studio disappeared and the camera zoomed in on the cluster of people around the podium. One of the older men stepped forward. It looked like he held a few note cards in his hands. Two other men, one older and one younger, stood off to the right. They wore jackets with the letters FBI emblazoned on the front in yellow. A petite woman in black with stick-straight hair stood behind them, clutching a tablet to her chest. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us on such short notice, and so early at that. The man cleared his throat. It looked like it took all his willpower not to puff out his chest as he spoke. My name is Detective Calvin Davenport. I am joined today by Special Agents Robert Manis and Christopher Viotto from the FBI, as well as Senator Grayson's publicist, Anastasia Bolton. She'll be answering a few of your questions, but please keep them cordial and remember that the senator and his wife are grieving this terrible tragedy. Davenport took a moment to look over the reporters. 
Whatever he saw there must have confirmed his message had gotten across. He nodded his head and continued. As previously stated, Connor Grayson's abandoned vehicle was discovered in a parking garage. The window on the driver's side door was broken. There was no sign of a struggle, but due to the circumstances and his political ties, we treated young Mr. Grayson's disappearance as a missing persons case. Yesterday evening, after searching the area, we found Mr. Grayson in an alleyway a few blocks from his car. He had a single gunshot wound to the forehead, which had killed him instantly. Due to the location of the injury and the position of the body, we concluded Mr. Grayson's death was not an accident. Later that night, the murder weapon was found in a nearby dumpster. It was registered to a Mr. Anthony Jamal Lewis, who has a previous record of aggravated assault and possession of cocaine with an intent to distribute. Mr. Lewis was unable to provide an alibi. I, my colleagues, and agents Manis and Vioto worked through the night to corroborate our suspicions and have arrested Mr. Lewis on charges for first-degree murder. Cassie's gaze zeroed in on the young FBI agent with his bronze-colored hair and dark eyes. She couldn't place the look on his face. He didn't have the professional cool of his partner or the carefully controlled pride of the local detective. Even Grayson's assistant looked as though she were working to maintain a neutral expression. No, Agent Vioto looked pissed. He had his jaw clenched, his eyes narrowed, and she even caught him shaking his head ever so slightly. After a curt word or two from his partner, Vioto loosened his jaw and reset his face, but Cassie could still see the anger in his eyes. Ms. Bolton will now take your questions. Davenport stepped back from the podium while Grayson's publicist thanked him and adjusted the microphone to her height. She scanned the crowd of reporters, all of whom were shouting and raising their hands in unison. She pointed to one with a long, crimson nail. Does the senator have a statement? Not at this time. Her voice was firm and not unkind, but there was something unsettling in it. As you can imagine, Senator Grayson and his wife are devastated. They ask that you give them some privacy at this time. More shouting, more raising of hands. She pointed at another reporter. Does Senator Grayson plan to continue his run for president? Ms. Bolton smiled tightly. His presidential run is not on his mind at the moment, but I have not heard of any talk that would lead me to believe he has changed his mind. I would imagine Senator Grayson would be even more interested in making sure no one else experiences the pain he is going through right now. Another crimson nail picked out the next question. Senator Grayson has a history of being tough on crime, especially with drug-related charges. Will his son's death inspire him to propose new laws to prevent something like this from happening again? This seemed to be the question Ms. Bolton had been waiting for. She stood a little taller, and Cassie caught a sparkle in her eye. I have not spoken to Senator Grayson about specifics, but I have worked closely with him over the last few years and would like to imagine how he would answer this question. Senator Grayson feels strongly about keeping our streets safe, both here in North Carolina and across the country. The percentage of violent offenses involving drugs has risen in recent years, and it is Senator Grayson's ultimate goal and responsibility to combat these tragedies. I do not believe his mind will have changed on the subject after the passing of his son. I am not aware of any specific pieces of legislation the senator will want to work on, but I can guarantee he will write them with a heartfelt hope that no one will ever have to experience what he is going through right now. Thank you for your time. Ms. Bolton left the podium before anyone could ask another question. She, the local detective, and the two FBI agents walked back into the police building without looking back, but Cassie could still sense Agent Viotto's frustration in the tightness of his face and the position of his shoulders. The news cut back to the side-by-side -side spread of the station news anchor and the reporter on the scene. A mugshot of Anthony Jamal Lewis appeared on the screen as well. He was a black man, not much older than Connor. His hair was in cornrows, 
and Cassie could feel the anger and pain hidden behind his dark eyes, forever trapped in time by the photograph. We're still learning about Anthony Lewis's checkered past, the news anchor said. But for now, let's go through the details of the case we're certain of. Nicole? Judy turned the volume down. That poor family. They just lost their son, and all everyone can talk about is politics. She handed the remote to Laura and stood up. I need some air. She left the room before either of them could say anything. What do you think? Laura asked, nodding toward the TV. Does it match up with what you saw? The shooting? Yes. Cassie looked back to the TV, back to the picture of the man they'd arrested for murder. But that's not the man who shot the senator's son. Laura's eyes grew wide. How do you know? The man in my vision, the one who pulled the trigger. Cassie could hear the gunshot in her mind, just as loud and final as the first time. I didn't see his face, but I did see his hand. He was white. Anthony Lewis didn't kill Connor Grayson. The air hung heavy with revelation. It was a moment before Cassie could find her words again. They've got the wrong guy. Chapter 18 For the first time since she arrived in Charlotte, Cassie allowed herself to remember what the city used to mean to her. Family vacations, museums and parks, and eating ice cream until she thought she'd explode. It was their home away from home when she was younger, and now she hardly recognized it. That said more about her than it did about the city. For centuries, Charlotte had adapted and grown and changed. This would continue in the years to come. Maybe she'd get to witness a part of that now that her parents had chosen it as their permanent residence. But that was only if she could find a way to open up to her parents without getting committed to a mental institution. Despite her love of the city and an urge to revisit all her favorite haunts uptown, Cassie had popped out of the house under the guise of doing some shopping while she was in town. But she was really after a face-to-face -face with someone she hoped would hear her out. Cassie had been sitting in the police station parking lot for two hours before she spotted Agent Viotto leaving the building. She'd left after breakfast and was hoping she'd catch the younger agent on his lunch break. She'd prepared herself to deal with him and his partner, but her plan would be much easier to enact if she could get Viotto on his own. His partner looked like the skeptical type. Cassie stepped out of her car and slammed the door loud enough to get Viotto's attention. When he turned, she gave him a little wave and headed in his direction. He leaned against the hood of his black sedan and watched her approach. He looked confused, but intrigued. She was off to a good start. She stopped a foot or two away from him. Hey. Hi. A pause. I'm sorry, have we met before? No. She stuck her hand out. My name is Cassie. Cassie. She liked the way he said her name. His accent hinted that he was from somewhere up north. I didn't think so. What can I do for you? I was wondering if I could buy you lunch. Are you asking me on a date? She smirked. No. Too bad. I would have said yes. I'll keep that in mind. Cassie let her mind wander for a moment before pulling herself back to reality. I have some information about the arrest you made this morning. Anthony Lewis? He pushed himself off the hood of his car. What kind of information? I don't think he did it. Cassie let that hang in the air for a moment. And I don't think you do either. She had definitely caught Viotto's attention. What makes you think he didn't do it? The answer to that question is complicated, which is why I was hoping I could buy you lunch. Should I get my partner? It might be easier if we talk first. Have you had any barbecue yet? When his eyes lit up, she had her answer. I'll buy you some brisket if you listen to what I have to say. After that, I'll leave you alone. I just want to help. Viotto looked from Cassie to the building and back again. Was he debating on whether he should bring her in for questioning? 
Was he considering grabbing his partner anyway? When he turned back to her, she could see the interest in his eyes. You've got a deal. Mind if I drive? Not at all. Cassie got into the passenger seat with a sigh of relief. His car smelled like mint and vanilla with a hint of cigarette smoke underneath. Rental? How could you tell? She pointed to the three car deodorizers hanging from the rearview mirror. These things can only do so much. You should have smelled it a few days ago. I'm surprised the FBI didn't spring for something better. Money's tight, and my partner is cheap. He laughed. I'm Chris, by the way. Agent Fiotto, I saw you on TV. He hung his head. A lot of people did, apparently. Manus chewed me out for that. It's the only reason I'm here right now. He kept his eyes on the road, but there was good humor in his voice. At least there's a silver lining then. Cassie directed him across town, then down East 10th to Central Ave to Midwood. It was too chilly for the outdoor seating, so they found a table in the back. Cassie inhaled the sweet and spicy aroma of some of the best barbecue she'd ever had in her life and sighed. Viotto's stomach grumbled, and he flushed. I don't think I've had a proper meal since I landed. That's too bad. Charlotte has a lot of great food. You from around here? Cassie shook her head. Savannah, my parents moved out here a few years ago. My sister and I are just visiting. What about you? Originally from Portland. He opened the menu, but kept Cassie's gaze. First time I've been to the South. Gotta say, it's growing on me. It was Cassie's turn to blush. She opened her own menu and perused the offerings. What are you in the mood for? She immediately regretted the words out of her mouth. To eat, I mean, to eat. Viotto chuckled, but did her the favor of not lingering on her comment. Any recommendations? Brisket, ribs, you name it, nothing here is bad. That's the second time you mentioned brisket, so I think that's the way to go. You got it. When the waitress came by, Cassie was ready with their order. The young woman kept looking at Viotto like she recognized him, but didn't know from where. She thanked them, grabbed their menus, and returned a minute later with their drinks, before seating a group of four who walked through the door. Does that happen to you a lot? Cassie asked. What? People looking at you in awe and fear because you're an FBI agent? He laughed, and his eyes crinkled at the corners. Yeah, but it does more harm than good. I got a lot more people running away from me than running toward me. She shrugged. At least you're getting your cardio in. True, true. There was a beat of silence, and Cassie felt the need to say something, anything, to keep the conversation rolling. I'm not trying to be mysterious, by the way. Asking you to lunch, telling you I have some secret information. I don't even know if I can help you. I just can't sit around and do nothing. Viotto put his arms on the table and leaned forward. You said it's because you saw me on TV? Cassie took a sip of water before she answered. She already had her foot in the door, but she had to play her cards right if she wanted him to take her seriously. You don't think Anthony Lewis killed Connor Grayson? Viotto looked around, but no one was paying attention to them. His face was neutral, but his eyes were guarded. What makes you say that? Cassie shrugged. She didn't have an answer just a feeling. The way you acted during the press conference, how it didn't take much to convince you to have lunch with me. I'd be shooting myself in the foot if I turned down someone like you. I'm flattered, Agent Viotto, but I'm pretty good at reading people. You have doubts. I'm not at liberty, she held up a hand. I know the line. This isn't my first rodeo, and you're not the first cop I've dealt with. His eyes crinkled again. Agent. A rose by any other name. She was grinning too. They caught him awfully fast, don't you think? Found Connor yesterday morning, afternoon, then found the gun that led them to Lewis, arrested him that night. Something's off. Maybe he confessed. Maybe it was an open and shut case. You wouldn't have been so pissed off during the press conference. 
Maybe I was just mad I wasn't the one who got to announce it. Davenport's kind of a dick. I'm better looking anyway. We both know that's not the case, he grinned. So, you don't think I'm better looking? Cassie was finding it harder to stay focused. You don't think Lewis did it? Hypothetically, if that were the case, there's not much I can do about it. They made the arrest, the proof is there. They announced it, open and shut. Unless a mysterious woman materializes out of nowhere with some evidence to the contrary, my hands are tied. This was going to be the hardest part, and Cassie still hadn't figured out a way to tell Vioto she knew without a doubt that Lewis was innocent despite having no proof. The waitress arrived with their order, saving Cassie from having to answer right away. They both dug in, and there were a few moments of silence while each of them had their fair share of lunch. Vioto wiped his mouth to be polite, but Cassie could tell he was resisting the urge to lick all his fingers. This is incredible. Some of the best you'll ever have. I don't doubt it. Cassie leaned back for a breather. How often do mysterious women materialize out of nowhere with the evidence you're looking for? Today would be the first. Look, I don't want to get your hopes up. I don't have anything concrete, but I do think I can help. Vioto's phone rang. It turned more than a few heads as he scrambled to wipe his hands and answer the call. Luckily, his ringing phone offered her a few extra seconds to find her words. Vioto? A pause. You're kidding. He looked at Cassie, then down at his half-eaten brisket. Yeah, I'm close. Give me ten minutes. Cassie waited until he hung up. Duty calls? A complication. There was longing on his face as he pulled out his wallet. I'm sorry, Cassie held up her hand. Please, this is on me. You can pay for the next one. A second date? I wouldn't call it that. She grabbed a napkin and fished a pen out of her purse. She wrote down her phone number and handed it to him. My name is Cassie Quinn. The FBI will have a file on me. She pointed to the napkin. Look me up. Then call me if you want to hear what I have to say. Chapter 19 Senator Lawrence Grayson would have been three sheets to the wind if his mind hadn't been preoccupied by the day's recent events. He could feel the tingle of the alcohol in the tips of his fingers and toes, but he was as sharp as ever. On the day he wished he could forget everything, he had no choice but to focus on the way his life was crumbling around him. If Connor were still alive, would his son be pointing and laughing at him? Or would he show the barest hint of compassion for a father who had lost everything? Grayson took another sip of whiskey and felt the burn of the liquid as it slid down his throat. This bottle, and other ones like it, had been used to celebrate the highest of highs and mourn the lowest of lows over the years. But the senator had never felt like this before. He couldn't say he'd never envisioned a day like this. Connor had gotten into plenty of trouble over the years, and there had been several discreet trips to the hospital. The worst he'd had was a broken nose and a couple fractured ribs, but even through his fury, Grayson couldn't ignore those paternal instincts that drove him to protect his one and only son. Instincts that would serve no purpose in the future. Are you listening? The effect of the alcohol warbled Anastasia's voice. Lawrence, did you hear a word I said? No. The senator tipped his glass back again and drained the liquid, never taking his eyes off the overcast sky outside his office window. He didn't want to be here, but his wife didn't want him at home either. He had no choice. Anastasia uncrossed her legs and stood. She wore purple today, and though she looked as stunning as always, he hated her with every fiber of his being. She should be in black, in mourning, drowning her sorrows like him. She knew him, knew his son, and yet all of her condolences were a mere formality. Did she care at all? He knew she didn't. 
Anastasia approached his desk and swiped the bottle out of his hands before he could pour another glass. He rose to snatch it back, but one push against his shoulder sent him stumbling into his chair. It rolled backwards, and he had to scoot forward to regain his position. He felt like a child, probably looked like one too. You're a mess, get it together. She set the bottle on the corner of his desk, just out of reach. I understand you're in pain, but we have work to do. My son is dead. His voice cracked, and it lost all of its power. How can you say that? Your son will keep being dead, no matter how much or how little you drink. Let's be proactive about it instead. How? Anastasia sat down, crossed her legs, adjusted her tablet, looked him dead in the eyes. First, you need to make a statement. Are you capable of reading it yourself? I don't want to talk to the media. He shuddered at the thought of all those cameras picking apart every emotion. Did he cry too much, not enough? Did he look humble or apathetic? What about his wife? Would she be there too? You do it. Fine. She tapped twice on her tablet. The public won't expect to see you for quite some time. Too early and they'll think you don't care, too late and they'll forget about you. He hated that the politician stirred at the unacceptable thought of being forgotten. After the funeral services, you'll have a bereavement period. You'll work from home to better console your wife. We'll announce new legislation about being tougher on crime. Language will include honoring my son and ensuring no father feels this pain again. It'll connect. Great. She looked up at the sound of his detached sarcasm, but made no comment. A few months down the line, we'll get you into the public eye again. We'll have to change your volunteer work from veterans to children. Lower predictability with kids, but it'll play much better now. Do you think you'll be up for that? Grayson picked up his glass, remembered it was empty, then thunked it back down again. Does it matter? I may be navigating, Senator Grayson, but you're the one driving the train. I can't force you to do anything, but you understand the consequences if you step out of line. It's up to you to decide if you can live with them. Grayson couldn't imagine losing his career on top of his son. I'll make it work. Wonderful. She sounded genuinely ecstatic. That's fantastic news. Is it? He leaned across his desk and grabbed the bottle of whiskey, pouring himself a double. He didn't break eye contact with her. It was a challenge, and they both knew it. Tell me, Miss Bolton, do you have a heart of your own? Do you have a sympathetic bone in your body? When Anastasia didn't respond, he thought maybe he'd finally crossed the line. After a moment, she stood, walked over to his mini bar, grabbed a second glass, and poured herself a drink. She slammed it back in a single gulp and didn't even wince. When she turned to face him, her eyes held the hint of transparency. Your son was a spoiled brat who risked your career and his life on countless occasions without a thought to the consequences. That is precisely the reason we had a contingency plan in place should something like this happen. Do I think he deserved what he got? She paused, and Grayson saw the flicker of a lie in her eyes. No, I don't. It's a tragedy what happened to your son. But this is my job, Senator Grayson. Nothing more. I am human, and I feel for you. But this is what you pay me for. You have your wife to console you. Do not make the mistake of thinking that is part of my job. If you want me to step aside, I will. But I will not return as your publicist. Apex represents you because you had an impeccable track record, incredible charisma, and a dogged determination bound to take you to the top. We don't offer second chances. You're at a crossroads now. You can walk away from all of this, and we'll let you out of your contract with no strings attached. I personally guarantee it. But Apex will not get into bed with you again. And I don't think I need to emphasize just how difficult it will be to attain your goals without us. The politician was awake now. Anastasia had said exactly what he had needed to hear to snap Grayson back to reality. He had been a good senator before Apex had stepped in, but he'd been spinning his tires in the mud that was Congress. After he hired Anastasia, everything had changed. He'd finally gotten some traction, 
and his career had taken off like a bat out of hell. There was no way he was going to lose all that, too. I'm here, he said. My heart will be in it. Good. She picked her tablet up and swiped at the screen a few times. Now, our biggest concern is getting through this investigation. We're doing what we can to speed up the process, but we have to follow procedure. It'll be a few months before sentencing is complete, but your job is almost done. The arrest happened quicker than I expected, but I'm not complaining. I don't like Agent Vioto. Neither do I, but he's harmless. His partner is a lot smarter than him. Manus is keeping him on a short leash. I don't think we'll have any trouble. He was asking a lot of questions. That caught Anastasia's attention. What kind of questions? Grayson sipped at his whiskey, as if imbibing more alcohol would help recall the memory faster. He doesn't seem to think Lewis did it. He was trying to come up with alternative scenarios, but Davenport kept shooting him down. They've got the evidence on Lewis, she shrugged. I doubt anything he comes up with sticks. He was asking a lot of questions about my relationship with Connor. That's to be expected. Her eyes narrowed. Anything specific? He asked if I owed anyone money or political favors. He seems to think this was more than just a drug deal gone wrong. Anastasia made a few notes before she looked back up at Grayson. He doesn't have any proof, which will hold in our favor. I'll ask around, see if there's anything we can do. Until then, just lie low. Simple answers only. Don't give away more than they're asking for. It'll only get you into trouble, and that's the last thing we need right now. Grayson wanted to tell her he knew that. He wasn't stupid. He was aware of what was on the line. The last thing he would do is incriminate himself on top of all of this. There was a reason Apex picked him as their champion, and it was, in part, because of his discerning nature. But he didn't say any of that. He just sipped his whiskey and thought of the day he'd finally get everything he'd worked so hard to achieve. Chapter 20 when Cassie got home, she retreated to the spare bedroom and hunkered down with her laptop. Laura and her father were out in the garage building something, and her mom had laid down to recuperate from the morning's events. No one had asked why she hadn't returned with any purchases from her so-called shopping trip, but Laura gave her a look that said, you're gonna tell me what you were up to, right? For now, Cassie was winding down from her brief lunch with Viotto. There was something encompassing about the flirtatious, yet unassuming way he carried himself. He had seemed equally interested in getting to know her and talking about the investigation, or as much as he could without knowing who she was. Not for the first time, she wondered what was in that file the FBI kept on her. She knew her involvement with various investigations over the years had garnered her a place in someone's desk drawer, but she'd never seen the folder herself, only heard hints of it here or there. What kind of information did it contain? What would Viotto learn about her? Undoubtedly, it spoke of her encounters with Novak. Maybe it even mentioned Mitch Tanner. There was probably a note in there for every time an FBI agent encountered her at a crime scene. But would it talk about her abilities? Did it talk about the fact that she could see ghosts? Or did it just imply that she could speak to the dead and her delusions helped solve crimes? How would Viotto take that? And what about his partner? Cassie rejected the idea that she needed Viotto to approve of her skills, but she couldn't deny how it made her feel to hope he'd accept them without question, without doubt. But there was always doubt. David had doubted her. Harris had doubted. Her sister had accepted her abilities faster than most, but every once in a while, she caught Laura looking at her like she thought it was all a convincing lie. Hell, Cassie sometimes wondered about that too. She shifted the laptop into a more comfortable position and brought up the search engine, but couldn't bring herself to type anything out. Waiting for Viotto to vouch for her was more agonizing than she'd anticipated, she wanted to keep Anthony Lewis from going down for a crime he didn't commit, and she wanted to bring Connor's actual killer to justice. 
She also wanted to hear from Agent Vioto. Her phone, which she'd strategically placed right next to the laptop, lit up. It wasn't Vioto, but the name made her heart spike anyway. Jason Broussard. She clicked on the message without trying to conceal her smile. They hadn't spent that much time together, but there was something magnetic about him. Something that made her want to take a chance. It had been a long time since she'd had that feeling. Hope your morning is going well. Caught Tanya stealing sugar packets again. Cassie laughed. Did you say anything? Nah. Figured if she has to steal it, she needs it more than the rest of us. But if she starts stealing the coffee pods, then it's game over. I need a minimum three cups to function. Me too. How's everything else going? Good. Magdalena says hi, and that I should ask you out to lunch again. Cassie blushed. Did you tell her you're too afraid I'll sucker punch you again? Nah, I'm not afraid. I'll just bring my pads next time. Cassie's cheeks hurt from smiling too much, but she wasn't sure what to say next. She should keep flirting, make sure he knew she was interested in the next time, but she was afraid too. If I survive my mother and live to return to Savannah, I promise I'll behave. Why had it been so easy to ask Vioto to lunch, but she struggled with grade school flirting with Jason? She was attracted to Vioto, liked his personality, and respected his vocation. Her body reacted when he flirted with her, but her mind didn't go silent like it did when she was with Jason. Was that a sign? And if so, a sign of what? Don't make promises you can't keep, winky face. And there it was. Cassie's entire brain shut down, and she didn't know how to respond. There were a million different ways she could interpret that, and different parts of her body had their own ideas of what he meant. Instead of responding, she opened up her texts with David. He hadn't answered her last message. How's it going back home? David wasn't the best with technology or remembering to check his phone, but he typically answered her by the end of the day. Something in her stomach twisted, but she tamped down the anxiety. Savannah kept him busy, and she wouldn't bother him if it wasn't absolutely necessary. Still, the little boy's case wasn't unimportant. Part of her knew she was reaching out just to see if she could get a response, but the other part knew David was a resource she could tap into. She wouldn't be doing Sebastian justice if she didn't exploit all her options. Hey, I've got a quick question. Found out the name of the little boy who's been hanging around, Sebastian Thomas. Laura did some digging, but didn't turn up much. Was wondering if you'd have anything else on file. Hope everything's okay. Cassie hit send. The normally blue bubble turned up green with a note that it had been sent as an SMS text. Cassie's first instinct was that something was wrong, but she chided herself. David could take care of himself. More than likely, he was out doing his job, away from any towers with a signal. Once he got back into range, he'd see her text and answer. After tossing her phone to the side, Cassie hunkered down over her computer screen. So far, she only knew the basics. Someone had kidnapped Sarah Lennox when she was 10. The authorities had arrested Henry Fitzpatrick, and though he'd been a suspect in Sarah's case, they'd only convicted him for kidnapping one kid and sentenced him to 50 years. Someone had also kidnapped Sebastian Thomas, but the police had been unable to solve his case. The only proof the two cases intersected was that Sebastian had said Sarah's name. That wouldn't hold up in a court of law. It was heartbreaking to find so many websites dedicated to missing children. She clicked on one named Never Forgotten, dedicated to children who had been missing for 10 years or longer. They were gone, the website said, but never forgotten. And perhaps with your help, we can find out what happened to these little angels. Cassie took a deep breath before clicking on the first field box. She typed Savannah. In the next box, she wrote Georgia. She chose the year 1994 from the drop-down menu. 
That's when Sebastian had gone missing. It was a good place to start. She clicked search. The website reloaded, and seven faces stared back at her. She read them in order. Angelica Reyes, Omar Wilton, Jesse Breyer, Sebastian Thomas. Cassie's breath caught. She clicked on his name. It had his date of birth, the date he went missing, his age, and a brief description of what he looked like. Then, age today, 35. Cassie felt tears prick her eyes. Sebastian's entire life changed 26 years ago. That's when he became more than just a kid. He became a missing persons case, a file sitting on someone's desk in Savannah. But Cassie knew it was worse than that. He'd spent the last 26 years existing in limbo, forever trapped as a nine-year-old boy, until one day, a few months ago, he found someone who could see him, who could help him. And she'd spent weeks on end ignoring the fact that he even existed. Tears spilled down Cassie's face, and she swiped them away with the back of her hand. She had a million excuses for why she hadn't dropped everything to help him as soon as he'd shown up in the corner of her bedroom one fateful night. He wouldn't speak to her. She was afraid. She needed a break. She was trying to deal with her own tragic life. But none of them were good enough. None mattered. I'm here now, she whispered to the room. If he heard her, he didn't acknowledge the promise implicit in her words. But it didn't matter. Nothing would assuage her guilt. Cassie scrolled through the other names and clicked on each of their profiles. She read through all the missing posters. Other than the fact they'd all gone missing from Savannah in the same year, nothing stuck out as a common denominator. The ages ranged from six to 14. They were all different races. Their socioeconomic backgrounds were also widely different, though most of them had been from the poorer side of town. She went back to the drop-down menu and chose the year 1995. The page reloaded. Sarah's picture was at the top. She remembered the day it had been taken. It was at Sarah's 10th birthday party. The most recent photograph they'd had of her at the time. At least, the most recent photograph that didn't have Sarah connected at the hip with Cassie. Three other kids had gone missing that year. Tommy Whitmore, Chase Good, Annabelle Dodge. According to the website, all four were still unsolved. Just like the ones from the year before, that made 11 cold cases over the span of two years in a single city. 11 kids whose lives were taken before they'd even been able to live them. Cassie found the drop-down menu again. There were countless reasons why people trafficked children across the globe, but she would never understand how anyone could do something like that to another human being, let alone a kid. If Sebastian's case connected with Sarah's, that implied there were more cases related to their disappearances. There had to be a beginning to the thread. Cassie clicked on the year 1993. She'd keep going back until something jumped out at her. And if nothing did, then she'd keep searching. If she couldn't find a connection, then she'd ask for Laura's help. And David's, Viotto's, even Sebastian. He had more to say. She just had to be patient enough to listen. But after an hour of trying to figure out if the same person took any of these kids, she'd come up with absolutely nothing. David hadn't answered her, and Laura hadn't come back in from the garage. Cassie took to Google. She searched for other kids who had gone missing between 1990 and 1995. The police had solved some. Usually, it was someone close to the child, a mother or father or uncle, or family friend. Some of them had died, their bodies found discarded in a field or at the bottom of a river. A few headlines spoke of the children who'd been victims of tragic accidents. That's when she spotted him. Ethan Miller. He'd died in 1993 when he was 10. He'd drowned while his mother, Sherry Miller, had her back to the swimming pool. 
Police hadn't been able to prove negligence, so they didn't charge the parents. There was nothing about the case that appeared connected to the two Cassie was investigating. And yet, she couldn't take her eyes off the picture of young Ethan. His hair color, his eye color, and even the sad, faraway look on his face was hauntingly familiar. He was a dead ringer for Sebastian Thomas. Chapter 21 Cassie was so engrossed in her search that when there was a sharp knock at the door, she almost launched her computer across the room. After a deep breath to slow her pounding heart, she angled the screen away from the door. Come in, Laura nudged the door open with a large box in her arms. Hey, oh, it's just you. Gee, thanks, she set the box on the floor. Found this in the garage, guess mom missed it. Has your name on it. Oh, thanks for bringing it up here. Laura flopped down on the bed. No problem, I needed an excuse to get away. Dad driving you nuts? Did you know he works in complete silence? No music, no audiobooks, nothing, just silence. Cassie laughed and readjusted the computer. He likes to be alone with his thoughts. That sounds terrible. I hate my thoughts. Who would do that to themselves? Normal people? Laura pretended to shudder. What have you been up to? Trying to find out more about the missing kids. Look at this. She turned the screen so Laura could see. Three guesses who that is. Sebastian Thomas. Wrong. When Laura's eyebrows shot up, Cassie continued. His name is Ethan Miller but at least I'm not crazy for thinking they look alike. They look identical. Are they long lost brothers or something? Not that I can tell, but I don't have concrete proof on that. Did he go missing too? Maybe the kidnapper has a type. Cassie blew a piece of hair out of her face. That wouldn't explain the connection between Sebastian and Sarah though. Besides, Ethan didn't go missing. He died in an accident. What kind of accident? He drowned, as far as the police figured. There weren't any suspicious circumstances. Didn't even charge the mother for negligence. But there's gotta be some connection, right? They look crazy identical. Ethan died in 1993, Sebastian died in 1994. They both lived in Savannah at the time and were born about two years apart. Other than that, I can't find anything else. What's your next move? Cassie closed the lid to her laptop and sighed. I don't have one. I've looked at hundreds of missing kids from all over Georgia between 1990 and 1995. There are some similarities between a handful of them, like the time of year they went missing, or where they went missing from, but it's not enough to say they're connected. Have you asked David for help? Maybe he knows something you don't. I've tried. Cassie looked at her phone again, but there were no updates. He still hasn't responded. I'm sure he will when he can. Laura craned her neck at the phone. How's Jason? Fine. Cassie couldn't help the grin that spread over her face. He was just telling me about work stuff. I'm sure it was perfectly PG. Laura rolled her eyes, then narrowed them. Where did you go earlier? Shopping. Laura pinched her arm. Tell me. Ow! Cassie got up and checked the hallway, then shut the door. I talked to one of the agents from the press conference. The young one, Vioto. Laura sat up. Seriously? How'd that go? I wouldn't say it was productive, but it could have gone worse. We had lunch. Then I told him I didn't think Anthony Lewis killed Connor Grayson. I had a hunch he would agree with me. A hunch? Laura cocked her head to one side. Was it a special hunch? No, it was not a special hunch. The ghost of Connor Grayson did not whisper sweet nothings into my ear. Vioto looked frustrated on camera. I figured at best, he didn't think Lewis did it. At worst, he had doubts. What do you tell him? That was the trickiest part. 
I told him I didn't think Lewis did it. Then he got called away, and I gave him my name and phone number. Told him to look me up. I'm sure he enjoyed that one. I think he did. Cassie tried not to blush at the memory. Laura was already annoying enough, picking on her about Jason. The FBI has me on record. He'll find my file, see my history, and then hopefully reach out. And if he doesn't? Cassie hadn't thought about that. Let's just say I'll have a much easier time solving the case with his help. So what now? Cassie opened the flaps on the box Laura had brought upstairs. Nostalgia time. Maybe Sebastian will show up again. Laura looked around the room, as though she'd be able to see him if he were there. You haven't seen him since? Nope. Best I can figure, he's recovering. Or waiting. That doesn't sound ominous at all. He's not dangerous, I know. Doesn't mean I'm not a little freaked out. Laura looked around the room again. Sorry, Sebastian. If you're there, and can, you know, hear me. Cassie bent over the box. Sweet, old VHS tapes, Disney movies. Laura adopted a high-pitched tone. Ariel was your favorite, right? Cassie rolled her eyes. The number of adults who'd asked them that as kids topped out at about a thousand. And it was only because they had red hair. You know damn well it's Meg from Hercules. Laura threw up her hands. She's not even a real Disney princess. Cassie closed her eyes and took a deep breath. According to Greek mythology, Megara was a Theban princess. So, technically, she's a princess. Disney just doesn't have the guts to acknowledge it. You're obsessed. I'm right, that's what I am. Cassie returned to the box and pulled out a couple of troll dolls with gems for belly buttons, a few bows she used to wear as a kid, and an entire book of stickers that she'd carefully laid out across printer paper she'd punched holes into. And at the bottom of the box, crumpled into the corner, was the silly pink friendship bracelet she'd made with Sarah. They'd woven three strands of string, each a shade darker than the next, into a simple braid. In the middle, they'd threaded square beads that each spelled out a word. Sarah's said friends. Cassie's, now relegated to the bottom of a box that had been in her parents' garage for over a decade, said forever. The memory of the day they'd made the bracelets came flooding back. She hadn't lost it, but temporarily misplaced it. On one of the hottest days of the summer, rather than going outside to risk heat exhaustion, they'd stayed inside and made bracelet after bracelet. But this pair had always been their favorite. They'd kept them on for at least a year. Sarah had lost hers while swimming at the lake. She'd been so upset, she didn't tell Cassie at first. In solidarity, Cassie had taken hers off and tucked it away. Somehow, it had ended up here, at the bottom of this box. Could this have been what Sebastian had been trying to tell her? She couldn't remember if the bracelet had featured prominently in any of the other photographs in that box, but she remembered it from the one he'd worked so hard to place at her feet. Laura had spread out on the bed, but she sat up when she saw something had stolen Cassie's attention. What did you find? Cassie reached for the bracelet, opening her mouth to explain the little treasure she'd uncovered. But as soon as her fingers wrapped around the beads, the world dissolved. Darkness engulfed her. For a moment, she thought she was dreaming again. But she wasn't in a car or even on a road. Wherever she was, she knew she wasn't alone. There was heavy breathing and a rustling off to her left. A bright flash of light made her stumble. Stars danced in front of her eyes. The distorted sound of mechanical scraping followed. Each noise reverberated inside her chest like a gunshot. She whirled around, but there was nothing but blackness. Cassie? She recognized the voice, but it sounded like it was coming through a broken radio. Cassie, are you okay? Her legs went numb underneath her like she'd been running for miles. Cassie, Laura's voice, she knew it, 
could feel it, but it was still so far away. Cassie squeezed her eyes shut until everything else faded, and when she opened them again, she was standing in the middle of the spare bedroom. The sun shone through the windows, partially eclipsed by Laura's concerned face inches from her own. She still pinched the bracelet between her fingers. Then, the world went dark again. Chapter 22 Cassie woke to ringing in her ears, and her head cradled in her sister's lap. Laura's face was a mask of concern as she bent over her, calling her name. When Cassie's eyes finally focused, annoyance replaced Laura's relief. Why the hell did you pass out like that? Cassie sat up and shook her head. I didn't do it on purpose. What happened? Cassie took a moment to get her bearings. They were on the floor next to the bed. As far as she could guess, Laura had caught her when she fainted and eased her to the carpet. She was still gripping the bracelet in her hand. I think I remembered something else. Laura looked down at the bracelet. About Sarah? Yeah. Was it bad? Why did you pass out? Cassie hauled herself to her feet. Not sure. There was darkness, flashing lights, and this weird sound. Flashing lights like a cop car? No, not blue and red. Cassie checked her memory to make sure. Just regular light. From a flashlight? I don't know. She couldn't keep the frustration from her voice. It was bad enough she had missing memories, but now she had memories she had to interpret like a vision. I need some air. Do you want me to get mom? Should you get checked out or something? I'm fine. Cassie brushed past Laura, but then paused at the doorway. She couldn't look her in the eye, but she didn't want her sister to think she was mad. Thank you for staying with me. You're welcome, but I'm fine. Cassie was halfway down the hall already. I just need some air. Panic rose in Cassie's chest as she stumbled down the stairs. The walls were moving in on her, and she couldn't get to the backyard fast enough. When she hauled open the French doors, she didn't even bother to close them behind her before she launched herself into the chill of the day. She sunk to her knees, not caring if her pants got wet, and stared down at the bracelet in her hands. Why did everything have to be so difficult? Why did all her answers have to come with more questions? Why was each puzzle piece a miniature puzzle in its own right? She enjoyed helping people and solving these mysteries, but sometimes she just wanted them to be straightforward. Was that too much to ask? Cassie felt someone approaching her from the left. When she looked up, Sebastian was standing next to her. He placed a hand on her shoulder, and a chill went down her spine. It was not unwelcome. Nice to see you again, she said, and she meant it. You okay? Sebastian didn't answer but he didn't look away either. That was good enough for her. I'm sorry for everything. Her breathing came in shudders. The panic attack lingered. I'm sorry I ignored you for all that time. I was scared and frustrated. Not much has changed, I guess, but I'm ready to listen now. She held the bracelet up so he could see it. Is this what you wanted me to find? He looked down at her hands then back up at her and blinked once. She took that as a yes. Any chance you want to tell me what it all means? He looked away, somewhere behind her. That's okay, it was a long shot. She tucked the bracelet into her pants. Hey, does the name Ethan Miller mean anything to you? Sebastian's gaze returned to her, and for the first time since she'd met him, she could sense genuine emotion on his face. He wasn't excited, exactly, but hopeful. He looks just like you. Does he have something to do with Sarah's disappearance, too? If there's anything you can tell me, anything. Cassie? Her mother's voice rang out across the yard, and as soon as it reached them, Sebastian disappeared. There was no easy dissolving of his spirit or lingering wisps of his face, one second he was there, and the next, he wasn't. 
Cassie stood and brushed off her knees. When she turned, her mother was already halfway across the yard. Her face held concern, but there was apprehension in her eyes too. What are you doing out here? Judy looked from Cassie's knees to her face and then searched the yard for something she'd never be able to see. Are you okay? I'm fine. I just needed some air. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, Mom. The last thing she wanted was to be in a position where she needed to lie to her mother right now. I just felt a panic attack coming on. It's totally normal. Happens all the time. Panic attacks are not normal. They're normal for me. Cassie's frustration rose, and she had to work not to direct it at her mother. It's okay. I can handle them. That's why I came out here. I feel a lot better now. I thought I heard you talking to someone. Cassie's face flushed. Just myself. Sometimes it's easier to talk myself through the panic attack. I heard Sarah's name. Judy waited for Cassie to say something, but the silence stretched on. Were you talking to Sarah Lennox? Cassie's world tilted, but she stayed on her feet. What are you talking about? Sarah's dead. She's been dead. Are you seeing her again? This time, Cassie couldn't stop her jaw from dropping. What are you talking about? You used to see her when you were a kid. After she died, I mean. Judy's voice was slow and deliberate, like she had to be extra gentle not to break Cassie's fragile exterior. We took you to a psychologist. I don't remember that. Another one to file under the list of things she'd repressed. What did they say? It was a trauma response. Someone kidnapped and possibly murdered your best friend. How do you explain that to a 10-year-old? We could have done a better job. That's not your fault. Judy looked down at her feet. When she looked up again, there was something firm in her gaze. Do you still see her? After all these years? No, Mom. I don't see Sarah Lennox. It was the truth. Sarah's spirit had probably moved on years ago. I heard you say her name. Do you still have delusions? Hallucinations? Cassie hated that her mother called them that. She'd spent years living through the horror of seeing dead people around every corner. It wasn't a life she would wish on anyone, but those spirits deserved better than to be called delusions. I don't know what you're talking about, Mom. Judy took a step closer. She held out her hand. If you need help, I can help you. Me and your father, she gestured to the house. Even Laura, I'm sure she'll say the same thing the child psychologist said. That I'm delusional? She wanted to tell her mother that Laura already knew, that she believed her. Yeah, that'll make me feel great. You're not delusional, Cassie. But when you were a kid, you had delusions. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Why don't I remember any of this? The psychologist taught you to push them away, to convince yourself they weren't real, to ignore them until they no longer existed. I guess it worked. A little too well. She didn't want to hide her anger anymore. I don't remember any of that, Mom. I barely remember Sarah at all. I've lost entire parts of my childhood because of... She forced herself not to finish her sentence. Because of us? I never said that. You didn't have to. You don't get to be the one who's upset right now, Mom. Cassie looked up at the sky to keep the tears from spilling over. When she looked back at her mother, she tried to put her pain into words. She was my best friend, and there are parts of her that are missing. Judy took another step forward. Maybe it's for the best. Her mother could have slapped her across the face, and it would have hurt less. How could you say that? You might not remember, but I do. You were miserable, Cassie, completely beside yourself with anger and sadness. We were worried about you. We didn't have another choice. We had to do something. So you taught me to repress it. I wouldn't call that healthy, would you? We did the best we could at the time. 
Judy's voice held no warmth. And I don't regret it. I would have done anything to keep you safe. Cassie's head was spinning. Her mother might not have known what was going on, but she knew Cassie saw what others did not, and she kept it a secret. How much of Cassie's life would have been different if she hadn't repressed those memories of Sarah, if she hadn't repressed her abilities? Would she have been able to solve Sarah's case sooner? Would the ghosts of Novak's victims have warned her before he'd attacked? Well, it didn't work, did it? Cassie infused as much venom into her voice as she could. She wanted her mom to feel how much it hurt. You didn't keep me safe. The last thing Cassie saw before she stormed inside was the tears running down her mother's face. Chapter 23 Cassie pushed through the French doors and headed directly to the refrigerator. She grabbed the first bottle of wine she saw, but the wine glasses were another issue. She couldn't remember where they were, and she wasn't worried about being quiet while she searched for them. Her mother was on her heels, with her father and sister close behind her. What's all this racket? Her father asked. Laura caught sight of the look on Cassie's face, but had the wherewithal not to ask if she was okay. Just found out some interesting information from mom. Cassie poured herself a glass, but was shaking too much to lift it to her mouth. I'm still trying to digest it, so if I could have a moment alone with my wine, that would be great. What were we supposed to do? Judy asked. She'd wiped the tears from her face, and now she looked indignant. There was the Irish temper she was known for. What's going on? Laura looked from Cassie to their mother. What's happened? Mom just informed me I used to have delusions. They took me to a child psychologist. Guess what that person told me to do? Ignore it, repress it, forget about it. We never meant to hurt you. Judy's voice was hard, but Cassie could hear the pain underneath. We only wanted to help. Tell me, Laura. Cassie took a sip now that her hand was steadier. If a kid came to you, and said she was talking to her best friend's ghost, would you tell her to just ignore it until it goes away? Laura looked at their parents, then back at Cassie. I'm not a child psychologist. Go on, give us your best professional guess. But it's typically better to work through the issues than to tell a kid to just ignore what they're seeing. She looked at their mom. Did she recommend any medication or anything? For a little while. Judy looked guilty, but we stopped it. It turned her into a zombie. She wasn't the same. Cassie pushed her wine glass away and put her face in her hands. She wanted to pull her hair out, but she didn't understand why. Was she frustrated that she couldn't remember any of this? Absolutely. But did she blame her parents? Not really. She looked up and found all three of them staring at her. She must have looked unhinged. What would her therapist say at a time like this? Cassie allowed Dr. Green's voice to fill her head. If you're feeling as though all of your statements are reactionary, take a moment to do some inner reflection. Look at how you're feeling and try to discover why. Once you can explain those feelings, you'll have an easier time solving the problem. I feel like you've been lying to me my entire life. Cassie held up a hand when her mother tried to speak. Please, just wait. I'm not saying you did it on purpose. I understand you were trying to help me. But mom, there are blank spaces in my memory. There are things that Laura talks about that I have no recollection of. I don't remember ever seeing a psychologist. I don't remember taking medication. I don't remember seeing things as a kid. Is that so bad? Judy asked. Her voice was soft. She was treading lightly. It wasn't a pleasant time in your life, but it was part of my life. This was something Cassie had learned a long time ago. She could wish away the pain Novak had caused her, but those wishes would never come true. That man had forever marked her, and as much as she hated him with every fiber of her being, 
Her experience had led her to this version of herself, the one where she got to help people. I hate that I don't remember everything about Sarah. I hate that there's a piece of me missing. It was never our intention. Even her father looked close to tears. We just wanted to protect you. I understand that. I'm not blaming you. But those delusions, she faltered. Did she really want to have this conversation now? They weren't delusions. Her parents exchanged a look. Please don't look at me like I'm crazy. Cassie looked to her sister for help. Tell them I'm not crazy. Before Laura could answer, Cassie's phone rang. She'd forgotten she'd had the ringer on, and it made everyone jump. When she fished her phone out of her pocket, it took her a moment to realize who it could be. Hello? Miss Quinn? A deep, honeyed voice filled the other line. It's Chris Viotto. Agent Viotto, yes. She cast a quick glance at her family before turning her back to them. She desperately wanted to have this conversation, but not while everyone was staring at her. What can I do for you? My partner and I were wondering if we'd be able to speak with you. Your file was enlightening. She would have smiled if she hadn't been close to tears a moment ago. That's good to hear. I'd be happy to help. Would now be a good time for you? Now was the worst time, but she wasn't about to waste this opportunity. Now is perfect. Should I head to the station? I'll meet you out front. Give me a half hour, and I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. Cassie's stomach flipped at his words, but she squashed the feeling. When she turned back to her family, they were still staring at her. I need to go. Where? Her father asked. Her mom jumped in too. Did you say agent? Laura had a half grin on her face. Was that him? Was that who? Judy asked. She looked between the sisters. What's going on? Cassie had planned to break the news to her mom more gently, but now she didn't have the time or the energy. That was Agent Viotto from the FBI. I'm helping him with Connor Grayson's case. Everyone's jaw dropped except Laura's, who avoided eye contact with their parents by stealing a sip of Cassie's wine. Why is he calling you about that? Judy asked. I help the FBI sometimes, and local cops. I'm good at it. She hadn't expected the amount of pride in her voice. She wanted her parents to know what she did, and she wanted them to know she had skills no one else did. I've solved a lot of cases. You work in a museum? Her father was looking at Cassie now with such confusion, it was almost comical. Why would the FBI need your help? It has nothing to do with me working in a museum. I'm good at figuring out clues no one else can. You never told us this, her mother said. I guess I forgot. The words were out of Cassie's mouth before she could stop them. Now it was Judy's turn to look like her daughter had slapped her. I'll explain more when I get back. You can't go. Judy looked around like she was trying to pull a reason out of thin air. You've been drinking. I had one sip. I'll be fine. Judy looked to her husband. Walter, do something. It's the FBI. He wouldn't meet her gaze. What are we supposed to do? I'll be back later. Cassie knew she should explain more, relieve their anxiety. But her life was falling apart around her. If she couldn't help herself, maybe she could help someone else. And if she solved Connor Grayson's case, then maybe her mother would finally listen to her when it came time to tell her about her skills as an amateur detective. Not to mention her abilities as a psychic. Chapter 24 Senator Lawrence Grayson couldn't remember how many bottles of whiskey he'd consumed since he found out his son had died. He couldn't remember how many hours he spent staring into the void or how many hours he'd been conscious. He couldn't remember how many times Anastasia had tried to get him to focus on the big picture before she left to handle his business on her own. He knew the consequences of being less than cooperative, but for all she preached about her humanity, 
She didn't understand that sometimes you just had to drink away your sorrows and feel bad for yourself. So, that's what he was doing. Grayson wouldn't need to leave his office for some time if he didn't want to. He had a fresh bottle of whiskey thanks to his security guard, and there was a fresh shirt tucked away somewhere if the occasion called for it. But no one was expecting to see his face for at least a few days, maybe a week if he was lucky. How many bottles could he consume by then? Two a day? Three? The only thought the alcohol hadn't been able to numb was the image of his wife's face when he'd told her what had happened to their son. The scream that had ripped its way out of her mouth was a primal sort of pain that reached deeper than he'd ever be able to feel. Only mothers could know the depths of that kind of agony. She had howled and collapsed and cried and gone catatonic. He knew what she wanted, to have their son back, and he couldn't give it to her. There was no next best thing. After that, Grayson had retreated to his office. He'd had his meeting with Anastasia. There was a point at which he'd been coherent enough to offer his two cents on a plan of how to move forward. He'd lost his son, but he wouldn't lose his career. He'd even convinced himself that he could use his career to honor his son's life. But that was just an excuse to bury himself in his work. With a dull sort of panic, he thought about those FBI agents, especially the young one, Vioto. He'd been asking a lot of questions, had seemed suspicious. Anastasia told him not to worry about it. If he looked worried, then he'd look guilty. The problem was, Senator Lawrence Grayson didn't just look guilty. He was guilty. Grayson turned to his computer and pressed the button to light up the monitor. Fiodo had pushed him about his relationship with his son, about the arguments they'd had in the weeks leading up to his death. But Grayson was careful. He'd always been careful. He knew how to cover his tracks, knew how the government worked, knew which senators would look the other way, and which senators needed a little green in the palms of their hands. When Grayson's desktop appeared on the monitor, he took a moment to account for all the files he had stored there. Nothing was out of the ordinary. Nothing was incriminating. He wasn't so stupid as to store sensitive information on his office computer. His email dinged, and he clicked on the message out of habit. He didn't give a shit what it said, and even less so when he saw it was yet another condolence letter from one of his colleagues. They didn't care about him or his son. So many of them had gone out of their way to tell him he needed to learn to control his son, that his son's actions reflected poorly on the Senate, that his son would be the reason Grayson would never be president. Grayson scrolled through his emails, dozens of them from people whose names he couldn't even put to faces. He wondered how many genuinely pitied him, as disgusting as that was, and how many of them wanted to be able to say, I reached out to you when you were in a dark place. Shouldn't that mean something? Can I count on your vote for such and such? Politics was a dirty business, and there was enough handshaking going around that ensured no one was clean. Grayson was about to close out the window when he caught sight of a name that made his heart shudder to a stop. Sender, Connor Grayson. Subject, surprise. The timestamp on the message was mere hours before his death. Given the chaos surrounding his disappearance and abandoned vehicle, Grayson hadn't seen the email come in. It was likely no one else had either. Nobody had access to this inbox, not even his secretary. Detective Davenport hadn't asked for permission or gotten a warrant. Even that pain-in-the-ass FBI agent Vioto hadn't let slip that he knew his son had reached out to him on the day of his death. Before Grayson knew what he was doing, he dragged his cursor over to the message and clicked on it. Was he incriminating himself by looking? Would they be able to tell when he opened it? It didn't matter. He had to know. With his heart in his throat, Grayson scrolled down. The email was short, but far from sweet. Got a surprise for you. Might be a day or two before you know what it is, but I wanted to make sure you knew it was coming. 
there's nothing better than watching someone try to duck a bullet they can't dodge. You sit up there in your ivory tower like you're better than everyone else, but you're not. I always knew that, but now I have proof. At first, I thought about taking your money and running. You seem to have a pretty lucrative way of getting more, but I couldn't do that to mom, couldn't leave her behind. Instead, I think I'll watch you burn, show her who you really are. This could have been so much easier for you. You could have just left me alone. It would have been that easy to avoid this, but no, you needed me to pretend everything was perfect, that you were perfect. You should have known I would never lie for you. I was never going to be the son you wanted. You should have accepted that years ago. Maybe then you could have avoided this. Better get your shit in order. Time's running out. See you in a few days. Grayson read the email from start to finish, then read it a second time, then a third. By the time he finished, his palms were sweating and his heartbeat was playing out a staccato rhythm in his chest. He understood every word of what he had just read, and yet he didn't want to believe any of it. His first instinct was to delete the email and pretend like it had never existed. But the internet was forever. And if Agent Viotto and his partner did a little extra investigating, it was only a matter of time before they discovered this. Grayson's second instinct was to call Anastasia. Apex would find out, and it was always best to bring it to their attention before they had to drag it out of you. They rewarded loyalty and proactivity. Most of their clients weren't exactly saints. But even Apex cut their losses at some point. And after everything he'd been through, everything he'd put them through, Grayson wasn't willing to take that risk. But if there was a third option, Grayson wasn't sure what it could be. What were the chances Connor had made a threat like this and wound up dead the next day? The police had said it was a drug deal gone wrong, but the senator had a pretty good idea what Connor was threatening him with, and it was a lot worse than drugs. With his son dead and gone, he wasn't sure who else had that information and what they would do with it. And before he told Anastasia about their brand new problem, he had better find a solution of his own. The first place he looked was at the bottom of a bottle. Chapter 25 As soon as Cassie slammed the door behind her, she regretted the way she'd acted in front of her family. Laura had come to her defense, and while she'd appreciated it, Cassie's cheeks warmed. She knew her parents had meant well, but sometimes intention didn't matter. The pain was real. The drive to the police station in downtown Charlotte was a blur. Cassie was on autopilot, and her mind was busy playing the scene in the backyard and the kitchen on repeat. A pair of worried parents and an inept psychologist had cost her a piece of her childhood. It had taken away decades of experience for dealing with and understanding her abilities. How many people could she have helped in that time? The answer was hundreds, if not thousands. Cassie pulled into the parking lot outside the police precinct. She blinked the building into focus. On the drive, her anger had dissipated, but she'd replaced it with despair. She'd had the perfect opportunity to explain to her parents that her abilities were not delusions and that it was something she had been born with but hadn't understood until recently. Now, she had to convince her brain it wasn't too late to have that conversation. She would get through this interview with the FBI, she would tell them what she knew, and maybe it would lead them to Connor Grayson's killer. Then, she would go home and have a calm discussion with her family. Cassie hooked two fingers around the door handle and pushed it open. She was still in a daze as she made her way across the parking lot, but as she stepped through the front door of the precinct and made eye contact with Agent Viotto, she snapped back into focus. He held out his hand. Miss Quinn? She shook it. Agent Viotto? He turned to the man next to him. My partner, Agent Robert Manis. She shook his hand too. Agent Manis? 
Manus returned the handshake and gestured to a door on her left. Shall we? Cassie nodded and followed the two men down a hallway and into an interview room. It didn't matter how many times she'd been inside one, or how many times she told herself she wasn't a suspect. The effect of the room was too great. Over the years, she had learned how to avoid looking guilty. Don't squirm in your seat. Don't look up at the camera in the corner. Make eye contact. Be polite. Never, ever lie. But as they sat down across from her, a binder and a file folder in front of each, she had the urge to throw it all out the window. Despite being on the right side of the table for so long, Cassie had trouble not feeling like she'd done something wrong. Can I get you some water? Agent Viotto asked. Coffee? Since she didn't know how long she'd be there. Water, please. Viotto grabbed a bottle of water from under the table and placed it in front of her. Thank you. She unscrewed the top, took a sip, and set it back down. Her movements felt robotic, practiced. I believe you said my file was enlightening? Viotto and Manus exchanged a look that Cassie couldn't quite read. When Viotto looked at her, he tapped a single finger against the folder that sat in front of him. Was that it? Was that her entire life story narrowed down into a few pages? I don't want to ask you anything that might make you uncomfortable. It's fine. Cassie smiled, one she had practiced countless times before. People were curious about what had happened to her, why she had her scars, why the most mundane of experiences could send her reeling. She had tried avoiding the topic in the past, but she found being open about it was easier, cathartic in a way. The irony was that people were only curious to a point. If you got too detailed, too graphic, you'd make them uncomfortable. And then you were the one who had to apologize. Wasn't that bullshit? The look on Viotto's face told her he saw through her deception, but he played along regardless. Manus looked like he was on the verge of boredom. He was attentive, but in a passive sort of way, like half his brain was thinking about a gruesome murder and half was running football plays. We don't meet a lot of survivors in our line of business. Cassie lifted the corners of her mouth. What about psychics? One or two. Viotto turned to Manus. He's met a few more than me. But none of them have a track record like you. Manus's full attention was on her now. You've done some incredible things. Thank you. She looked between the two men. I'm not used to someone taking me at my word about that. Viotto tapped the file again. More than a few people have vouched for you. She wondered who. There were so many people over the years. So many agents and detectives and cops that she'd needed to convince. Who had gone to task for her, and who had tried to forget what she'd shown them. Your abilities developed after Novak? Cassie forced herself not to squirm. Funny you should ask that. New, uh, evidence came to light that makes me believe I've had them my entire life. They disappeared for a while, but after Novak's attack, they resurfaced. Viotto flipped open the file, made a note, then closed it again. How accurate are they, typically? Pretty accurate. Sometimes I misinterpret them, but on the whole, they don't lead me astray. Manus cleared his throat, and Cassie got a sense they were entering sensitive territory. What can you tell us about the Connor Grayson case? Preferably anything the public doesn't know. Cassie took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Connor Grayson died while on his knees, begging for his life. The shooter was only a foot or so away when he fired the weapon. The bullet entered Connor's head right between his eyes. I also know Anthony Lewis did not kill Connor Grayson. And you know this because... Cassie got the sense that Manus knew the answer, but needed her to say it anyway. The shooter was white. And how did you come to this conclusion? We were watching the news. I saw the press conference. It upset my mom, she knows Connor's mother, and I put my hand on her shoulder. I only saw a few seconds of what transpired, but I know what I witnessed. 
I saw Connor Grayson die, and Anthony Lewis didn't pull the trigger. Did the shooter have any other identifying features? Manus asked. Did you see his face, his hair, any tattoos or scars? Cassie shook her head, but she did them the justice of closing her eyes and exploring the images that were forever seared into her brain. The shooter was wearing a dark coat. It was like I was inside him, seeing everything from his perspective. I couldn't see his face, just his arm, his hand, and the gun. Was there anything in the background that might identify this person? No. Cassie opened her eyes. Sorry, no reflections or logos or cars, just the alleyway where you found him. That's okay. Thank you for doing that. Vioto turned to Manus. What's your take? Manus had the wherewithal to shoot her an apologetic look. I like you, Miss Quinn, even though I have a lot of trouble believing what's in that file. But I know a lot of the people who've signed their name next to yours. They're professionals, hardened agents. They don't take their jobs lightly, and neither do I. I can't pretend to understand what you do or how it works. But at the very least, I'm choosing to believe it means we have more work to do before we wrap this case up. Cassie turned to Vioto. And you? I don't understand it either, but I believe what you're saying is true. This hasn't sat right with me since Detective Davenport arrested Mr. Lewis. It all happened so fast, Cassie shook her head. You'd think someone who'd just killed another person would at least be trying to lie low. That's part of it. Vioto looked at Manus before he spoke again. When his partner gave him a curt nod, the younger agent continued. The other part is that Mr. Lewis is adamant the police confiscated that gun months ago. The gun used to kill Connor? The same. Vioto shrugged. There's a record of Lewis being brought into the station, of local authorities taking some weed off of him and letting him go in exchange for some information, but no record of them taking a gun off him. And there are no weapons registered in his name. He is a convicted felon, Manus added, so he wouldn't be able to purchase a gun legally. Although, that doesn't mean he wouldn't find a way around that. So he's lying? Cassie asked. I don't think so. Manus sat back and crossed his arms over his chest. But there's no way to prove otherwise. Cassie's detective brain was kicking into high gear now. Is there any reason they would take his gun and not make note of it? Only if they're terrible at their jobs. Some officers were, but Cassie wouldn't say that out loud. Would they really have taken his gun and not arrested him in exchange for information? Depends on the information. Menace checked the file. Lewis had some insight into a pretty big shipment of drugs that was about to change hands. It all depends on whether the locals cared more about that than nailing him to the wall. Miss Quinn, Vioto said, leaning forward. We would appreciate your insight into this case. I've read that it works best when you're able to touch or be in close proximity to the evidence. That's correct. Would you be interested in helping us? I wouldn't want to take you away from your family. Cassie had promised herself she'd hear what the agents had to say, that she'd tell them what she knew and be on her way. She wasn't ready to leave the case behind, and she could tell herself it was because she knew she'd be able to help them further. But the truth was, she didn't want to go home and face her family just yet. It's no problem, she smiled at the two agents. What's the next step? Vioto clapped his hands and stood up. Let's go introduce you to Detective Davenport. Chapter 26 Manus led them to Detective Davenport's office. It was a short 60-second walk, but the unfamiliar station meant Cassie couldn't remember which way was out by the time they reached his closed door. The older agent paused with his knuckle raised to knock. Any questions before we go in there? What kind of person is he? Manus shrugged. He won't take you seriously. It's not personal. He's got an ego, but he puts it in the work. Can't say I like him, but can't say I don't respect him either. He sounds charming. She squared her shoulders. 
but nothing I haven't dealt with before. Manus nodded and knocked. When a voice called from inside, he pushed through the door and made room for the other two to step in behind him. Cassie closed the door behind them, giving herself a few seconds before she had to bear the detective's scrutiny. The office had no bells and whistles. Davenport's desk and chairs were standard issue. The walls had no decorations, and there were no photos of his family anywhere in the room. Stacks of papers and empty coffee mugs littered his desk. Cassie thought she could smell the faintest trace of cigarettes in the air. Davenport looked up. He was around Manus's age, but life had been crueler to him. Wrinkles lined his face, his eyes were dark and cold, and his stubble did not appear to be intentional. The bags under his eyes looked like bruises. What can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm on a time crunch here. His drawl was light, like he had maybe grown up elsewhere. He spotted Cassie. And who's your friend? Manus took the lead. This is Cassie Quinn. She's a consultant for the FBI. Oh, yeah? What kind of consultant? He returned to his paperwork. Do you study the bugs that come crawling out of people's mouths? Sorry, but Grayson didn't have any. We found him too fast. I'm afraid you've wasted your trip. He waved her off without even looking up. Bug people, I'd rather just put in the legwork. No, I don't study bugs that come crawling out of people's mouths. Then what is it you do, Miss Quinn? The exasperation in his voice was not well concealed. I'm a psychic. Cassie swore the entire room froze. Vioto and Manus took in a collective breath and held it. Davenport looked up, first at the agents to search their faces for some kind of joke, and then at Cassie, as though he was seeing her for the first time. You're bullshitting me. Cassie took a seat with a smirk on her face. It had been worth it just to see his jaw drop like that. Manus joined her in the other chair while Vioto leaned against the wall. He looked like he was trying to smother his laughter. Cassie leaned forward. Don't you wish I studied bugs now? Davenport ignored her. He turned to Manus. You believe this horse shit? Doesn't matter what I believe. The agency believes it. She's got a file two inches thick. She does good work. We solved the case. Davenport shook his head. We caught the killer. What do we need a psychic for? Cassie opened her mouth to respond, but Manus beat her to it. She came to us with doubts about Anthony Lewis's involvement in the murder. We found the murder weapon with his fingerprints all over it. Davenport threw up his hands. We have motive, no alibi, and proof. What more do you want? Manus held up his hands in surrender. I wouldn't be here if she didn't have at least some credibility. But this is a career-making case. Solving the murder of a prominent local politician's kid? We both know you're headed up the food chain with this. It wouldn't surprise me if the senator takes you with him on his way to the White House. Cassie was surprised Manus was laying it on so thick, but it seemed to achieve its intended purpose. Davenport glared at Cassie, but he sat back in his chair and linked his hands behind his head. What are your doubts? Vioto stepped forward. Actually, they're my doubts. When Miss Quinn approached me with her own, they made me nervous. Nervous? Davenport sat back in his chair and crossed his arms. Kid, you're gonna have to take care of that. Can't be nervous in this line of work. Humor me, Vioto smiled, but it didn't reach his eyes. This is a high profile case. It needs to be airtight, right? We want it to go to court without a single doubt that they'll convict this guy. That's the plan? Great. So we're on the same page. Vioto ran a hand through his hair. My issue is that it all happened so fast. The abandoned car, then the body, then the murder weapon, then the arrest. This kid isn't smart. Davenport's laugh made Cassie's skin crawl. It's not the first time we've arrested him. I've talked to Mr. Lewis. Vioto's voice was firm, unwavering. He's an intelligent man. Those arrests were 10 years ago. He hasn't had any run-ins with the law since then. Then he jumped straight to murder. He started with aggravated assault, Davenport countered. It's not that much of a jump. 
He's adamant that the gun the police found on him, which he says he only had for protection in case one of his old friends paid him a visit, was confiscated months ago. Newsflash, kid. Criminals lie, Davenport looked at Manus. You guys gotta keep them in training longer or something. Manus smiled. Viotto's relentlessness grows on you. He's got a good eye. Saved my skin on more than one occasion. So what are you asking for? Davenport gestured around the office. I've got enough work on my plate as it is. And we wouldn't dream of putting more on there. Manus gestured to Cassie. Ms. Quinn has a hunch there's more to this case. Oh, well, as long as the psychic has a hunch. Davenport rolled his eyes, then glared at her. How much are you getting paid? Cassie couldn't keep the disgust off her face. Nothing. That's too bad. Then at least one of us would benefit from all the time you're wasting. Mena stood before either Cassie or Vioto could say something they'd regret. Tensions are high. This case is important to all of us. We want Mr. Grayson to get the justice he deserves. We're only here for another day or two. We could use that time to kick back and watch daytime TV in our hotel rooms, or we could ensure there are no blank spots in the investigation where the defense could poke a hole. Davenport folded his hands in front of him. The gears were turning behind his eyes as he looked at all three of them. Fine, but keep a low profile. The public thinks we've got an open and shut case. I want to keep it that way. Deal, Mana smiled. Anything else? I want to stay informed. He unlocked his hands, grabbed his pen, and took up his paperwork again. Regular updates, you got me? And if you don't find anything new by this time tomorrow, you're done. We're wrapping the case, and that's that. You got it. Manus reached across the desk to shake Davenport's hand. Thanks for humoring us. No problem. Davenport eyed the door. Good luck on your wild goose chase. Chapter 27 As soon as the trio made it back to the interview room, Cassie sank into her chair with a groan. Well, that was painful, she eyed Manus. Any reason you're keeping specifics from him? Because then he'd have more to discredit. Manus dropped into his own chair with a groan. He doesn't like to be second-guessed. Viotto was pacing. As I found out firsthand, so it's more about making sure he comes out looking as good as possible, or at least convincing him that's what we're trying to do, Manus said. Anthony Lewis is not the killer, Cassie looked between the two agents. He's going to look like a fool when we figure out who really is. That's a problem for a different day. Manus flipped open his binder and skimmed the pages. The question now is, where do we start? The agents both looked at Cassie. You're the detectives, I'm just the psychic. There's nothing else you can tell us? Viotto asked. You know everything I do. Cassie folded her hands on top of the table. What would David say at a time like this? We need to start at square one. If Lewis didn't kill Grayson, then any supporting theories might be incorrect. It was a drug deal gone wrong, right? Are there other reasons someone would have wanted him dead? Take your pick. Manus tossed a couple pieces of paper toward her. They were printouts of various headlines of which Grayson had been the subject. He was causing trouble for his father's political career. He'd gotten in trouble with the police a few times. His father paid them off, of course. Social media didn't like that too much. He had a history of drug use and petty theft. It would surprise me more if he hadn't pissed some people off over the last several years. Okay. What does the evidence say? Cassie asked. Taking away anything related to Lewis, what are we left with? Manus flipped back through his binder. Police found him in the back of an alleyway, a few blocks from his abandoned car. Someone had shot him between the eyes. From the angle, we can tell the shooter was standing above him while Grayson was on his knees. Manus glanced at Cassie. He wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. There were no defensive wounds and no sign of a struggle. Someone stole his wallet and keys. He didn't have any other effects on him, including drugs, besides his phone. 
No defensive wounds. Cassie tapped her chin with her finger. So the shooter either surprised him at gunpoint, or he might have known who it was? Both are plausible. Stolen wallet, stolen keys, but didn't take his car, didn't take his phone. It's easy to track, Vioto offered. They might not have wanted to risk it. Same with the car. They could steal it, but it'd only be a matter of time before local authorities found it. Cassie shook her head. That's why illegal body shops exist. They do it in Savannah. I'm sure they do it here, too. Maybe the shooter didn't have those kinds of connections. Vioto sounded more contemplative than defensive. Or didn't have the time? Someone busted the window, Manis said. If it was the shooter, he must have done it before he'd gotten the keys. He could have been trying to get Grayson out of the car, or it was someone else who noticed the abandoned car and tried their luck. Either way, the alarm would have gone off. Cassie shook her head. It would have drawn attention, unless, her eyes lit up, someone wanted it to look like a mugging. Break the window, then use the keys to turn off the alarm. Manus nodded his approval. It's a possibility. The car is important, Vioto suggested. If we can figure out whether Grayson had something the shooter wanted, we can figure out why he died. On the one hand, if the break-in was real, the shooter killed Grayson and got what he wanted. On the other, if the break-in wasn't real, or if someone else did it, then the shooter's main objective was to kill the senator's son. Manis shrugged. Unless Grayson saw the shooter's face, he could have recognized him. Maybe the initial goal wasn't to kill Grayson, but after that, he had no choice, Vioto finished. We need to know the real reason someone killed Grayson, Cassie said. She eyed the folders on the table, but figured she didn't have the clearance to look at all the details. Whether it was drugs, or political, or something totally unrelated. Who did you guys interview? Vioto continued his laps around the room. His father, Senator Grayson. What was your read on him? He was mostly in shock. His wife was in hysterics, couldn't even speak to us. The senator was calm. Too calm? Cassie asked. Vioto shook his head. He's used to dealing with crisis. Plus, some people take longer to break down than others. He didn't seem like he was dodging questions. He made us come back the next day before we could search Connor's room, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary like it had been moved around. There was a beat of silence while Cassie looked between the two agents. That's it? Just his father? You didn't interview anyone else? Didn't need to. Manus's voice was even, but his shoulders had squared up. Later that night, we arrested Lewis. Cassie had no interest in picking a fight with either agent currently on her side. Is there anyone else we can talk to? Preferably someone who might know Connor a little better than his parents. We could track down some of his friends from school, Manis said. His teachers might know who he hung out with. Vioto straightened. His girlfriend? Ex-girlfriend, Manis turned to Cassie. They had just broken up. The senator didn't know why, only that they'd been together for almost a year, and then, one day, she just called it off. Right before he died? Cassie asked. We looked into her briefly, but she seems to be a good kid. Never got into any trouble. No record of her having any trouble with Connor. She would have been our next stop on the list if we hadn't found the gun that linked Lewis to the murder. Cassie didn't get the impression that Manus was a prideful man, but she was also painfully aware that he was the senior agent and therefore the one calling the shots. Do you think she's worth talking to now? He sat back in his chair and stroked his chin. Yeah, I do. If nothing else, she can tell us how Connor was acting in the days leading up to his death. Was he depressed, paranoid? Had he been doing a lot of drugs? Maybe he'd made plans to meet up with someone and she knew. Cassie stood. I guess we know our next step then. Manus didn't move. I'm going to stay here and make some calls to Connor's friends. Keep me informed, 
and I'll relay the message to Davenport. Vioto narrowed his eyes. You're not usually one to sit behind a desk rather than do some field work. Davenport might not be trying to rush us back home, but he definitely wants us out of his hair. I want to stay here and keep an eye on him. If anything develops on his end, he's not going to go out of his way to tell us. It'll be better if I'm here to find out for myself. Good call. Vioto turned to Cassie. You ever interviewed a witness before? Cassie had to hold back her laugh. One or two. Chapter 28 Long silences punctuated Cassie and Agent Vioto's drive to the Queen's University of Charlotte campus. They kept it casual, talking about where they'd lived over the years, what they'd like to do in their spare time. Cassie realized that for all the experiences she'd had in life, much of them had kept her in the same place, Savannah. There was nothing wrong with that. Savannah would always be her home. She couldn't imagine living anywhere else, but when Vioto had talked about the year he'd lived in Australia, she could envision what it would be like to get away from all the complications that awaited her when she returned to her regular routine. Not that it was regular compared to most. Vioto was an easy person to talk to, and he had a million questions about her time working with local detectives. There were one or two cases he'd come across in her file that he was particularly interested in, and she was happy to revisit them so many years later, knowing she'd helped the victim's families find closure. She wanted to ask about the cases he'd solved, but something stopped her. The more she got to know him, the more she realized she'd miss him when they parted ways. If Vioto were back in Savannah, they would have become fast friends, maybe even something more. And she couldn't afford to think like that, not right now. Maybe not ever. There was a sense of relief when they arrived at the campus. Cassie had given her carefully controlled answers, and Vioto had been cautious not to push his questions into territory that would have made her uncomfortable. Just because she'd solved the case didn't mean Cassie hadn't held on to the terror she'd faced while investigating it, and Vioto seemed to understand that. When he stepped out of the car and placed a pair of aviator sunglasses on his face, the congenial man she knew disappeared. The cool professionalism of an agent from the FBI was in his place. Unlike most men with authority, Vioto didn't carry it like a badge of honor that allowed him to do whatever he wanted. He carried it like a promise. Vioto knew where he was going, so Cassie followed in his wake. A few heads turned here and there, but mostly the students were busy rushing from one building to another. She never would have been able to afford to go to a university like this when she was applying to schools, so she figured she'd soak up the atmosphere while she could. The hilarious part was that as soon as they entered the elevator that would lead them up to the girlfriend's dorm room, the school mirrored every other campus Cassie had ever visited. There was a strange, sticky substance on the walls, and it smelled of pasta and weed. Cassie took one deep breath and held it until they stopped on the right floor. Her name is Mara Young. Vioto looked like he wasn't trying to breathe too often either. She was the same year as Connor, both working toward a computer science degree. She's also minoring in French. She's a straight-A student, no sports, but lots of clubs. History club, language club, food club, you name it. Got it. The elevator dinged, and Cassie followed Vioto onto Mara's floor. As they turned left and made their way down the hallway, Cassie let out her breath and took another one. The smell from earlier dissipated, and a fruity scent replaced it. She could only describe it as a dozen different body sprays combined. Vioto knocked on the door to room 717. There was shuffling as a shadow passed by a gap under the door, a sharp inhale of breath, and then the door handle twisted open. Mara Young? Vioto asked. His voice had dropped an octave. Yeah. Mara Young was short and thin, with a severe bob that stopped bluntly at her chin. She wore heavy eyeliner and black lipstick. 
Her nose was pierced, and there were several studs in each ear. The look was offset by the fact that she'd obviously been crying. She wrapped her fluffy housecoat around her and looked between the two of them. Who are you? Vioto removed his sunglasses and produced a card. His voice was gentler now. My name is Agent Chris Vioto. This is Cassie Quinn. We're here to talk to you about Connor Grayson. Can we come in? Mara sniffled as she stepped to the side to let them in. Her room was an explosion of color, with a bed pushed to one side and an immense desk against the other. Cassie's knowledge of computers was basic, but Mara's setup didn't appear typical for a sophomore in college. Do you want to sit? Mara asked. She brushed some clothes off her bed. I'm sorry, I didn't know. It's okay. Cassie knew how to talk to someone in mourning. She sat down. Don't worry about it. My room was a disaster in college. Yours is pretty cool. Thanks. She looked at Vioto. Am I in trouble? Vioto's voice was gentle, but he didn't go out of his way to comfort her. Is there a reason you would think you're in trouble? Connor is dead. A fresh set of tears fell from her eyes. I know they said they caught the guy, but I figured someone would show up to talk to me eventually. We broke up right before, and I didn't know if, I wasn't sure if it could be my fault. Vioto gestured for Mara to sit down in her desk chair before he retreated a few steps to sit next to Cassie. I don't think it's your fault, Mara, but we do have some questions for you. It's important you tell us the truth, okay? We want to get to the bottom of what happened to Connor. Mara wiped her tears and took a deep breath. Cassie couldn't tell if the dark circles under her eyes were from a lack of sleep or her running makeup. Maybe a combination of the two. Okay. Vioto took out a little notepad. You were together with Connor for almost a year? Yes. How would you describe your relationship? Mara thought for a moment, and then a small smile crept over her face. Interesting. We weren't really each other's type. Why do you say that? Mara gestured to herself. I'm not the type of girl he could bring home to his parents. We came from different backgrounds. I'm here on a scholarship. He's here because his father is a senator. Do you think that's why he liked you? Because the two of you were so different? Cassie wanted to slap a hand over Vioto's mouth, but it was too late. Mara's face fell. If you're asking me whether he was dating me because it'd piss off his dad, the answer is most likely yes. We both knew it. Sometimes it bothered me. Sometimes I liked how that made me feel. Vioto nodded, but didn't make any notes. Did you guys fight a lot? Have any arguments in the last week or two? We fought sometimes, she shrugged. Everybody does. He had shitty communication skills. I had trouble telling him how I really felt. And how did you really feel? I loved him. Tears welled in her eyes again, even though I knew it wouldn't last forever. Why not? Mara shrugged. He was destined to end up in jail or in Congress. There was no in between for him. In Congress? Theodo sounded genuinely confused. Didn't he hate his father and his occupation? I heard this thing once. The things you hate about other people are the things you hate about yourself. They were more alike than he wanted to admit. Vioto stared at her for a few seconds, like he was sizing her up. Why did you break up with him? Mara looked away. She sniffled. It had to happen eventually. So you woke up one day and figured it was time? There was nothing that pushed you to make that decision? Mara twisted her fingers together. Not really. Vioto and Cassie exchanged looks. She wasn't a good liar. Mara, we want to help you, Cassie said. Right now, it looks pretty strange that you broke up with Connor days before he died. We know you had nothing to do with it, but we need to understand why you broke up and if that had anything to do with his death. I can't talk about it. Cassie leaned forward. I know it's hard. No. Mara looked her dead in the eye. Her stare was heavy with fear 
and loss. I mean, I can't talk about it. Fioto sat up a little straighter. You mean someone doesn't want you to talk about it? She nodded. Now they were getting somewhere. Was it his father? I've never spoken to his father. His lawyer? His publicist? When Mara diverted her eyes, Vioto leaned forward. Okay, his publicist. Did she make you sign a non-disclosure agreement? Mara stood up. I'm scared. I don't want to talk about this. Vioto stood up too. Okay, okay. We don't have to talk about it. You won't get into trouble, okay? Thank you for telling us that. We won't say anything. He exchanged a look with Cassie. But we need to know something else. Mara looked between them. You want to know if his father killed him? We have to ask. Was Connor afraid of his father? Do you think his father would be capable of that? Capable? Mara laughed and fell back into her chair. Yeah, the way Connor talked about him, it's like he was two different people. I guess it wasn't always like that, but as soon as he set his eyes on running for president, everything changed. They had to be the perfect little family. Connor hated being told what to do. Was he afraid of him? He didn't act afraid, Mara thought for a minute. Mostly he just wanted to teach his dad a lesson. What kind of lesson? Mara glanced at her backpack and then back to Vioto. If I tell you, will I get in trouble for keeping it a secret? I was just so scared, and nobody came to talk to me. I didn't think it was related to anything, I just- Vioto tucked his notebook away and knelt in front of Mara. We're more interested in finding out who killed Connor than getting you in trouble for being afraid, okay? Mara looked at Vioto and then Cassie. It was only after Cassie gave her a reassuring smile that Mara got up, walked over to her backpack, and pulled out a USB drive. She cradled it in her hands like it was a precious gem. Connor and I had a similar sense of humor, dark but harmless. I guess you could call us hacktivists. She rolled her eyes. I thought it was a stupid word, but he liked it. Made him feel like he was sticking it to the man to his dad. Did you target anyone in particular? Mostly we just like to be annoying. We hacked the school's website once, drew mustaches and all the admins pictures and re-uploaded them, stupid shit like that. She laughed, but it was strangled with sadness. Then we started looking at major corporations, total shitbags. We talked a lot about figuring out ways to take them down, to give money to all the workers and leave the CEOs with a minimum wage salary, but we never did it. Okay, that's understandable. Can't say I blame you for wanting to do that. Vioto pointed to the USB drive. What's that? Mara looked at the object in her hands and held it out. She waited until Vioto took it, then walked over to her computer. She opened up her email and clicked on a message. Cassie couldn't read it from her vantage point, so she stood and crossed the room. Mara stepped to the side. If it wasn't for the house coat, she'd look like she was ready to give a presentation. The day Connor went missing, he sent his dad this email. He basically tells him he's going to take him down a peg. It's something he talked about a lot. Connor wanted to be the one to expose his dad. He said it would hurt so much more. He sent you this email? Vioto asked, even though this was after you broke up? He gave me that flash drive too. I don't know what's on it. He found me outside the library the day before he disappeared. I tried to walk away from him, but he grabbed my hand and put this in it. Said he finally did it, what he'd been talking about for ages. She was crying now. He looked so sad, so broken. I wanted to take it all back the breakup and everything, but I knew I couldn't. I tried to ask him what was on it. He told me I'd find out soon enough, that I shouldn't look at it. Do you have any idea what's on here? She shook her head. But whatever it is, it's probably enough to destroy his father's political career, permanently. Chapter 29
Cassie held her hands in front of the car's vents to thaw her frozen fingers. The trek across campus had gotten her blood pumping, but the bite of winter air was enough to pierce her jacket and chill her to the bone. It took her fingers as its first victim. Once feeling returned to her hands, Cassie looked over at Vioto. What are we going to do now? He reached into the back seat and retrieved a slim laptop, placing it on the dashboard between them. I'm not waiting to see what's on this drive. The sooner the better, Cassie said. Hopefully, this exonerates Anthony Lewis. Something tells me it will not be that easy. Once the computer's desktop appeared on the screen, Vioto connected the USB. A second or two ticked by before a window popped up containing four folders. Video, emails, evidence, plan, Vioto read. He looked at Cassie. Lady's choice. Video, she said. Hopefully that'll give us something to start with. Vioto opened the folder to reveal a Word document and an MP4 file. The document was a duplicate of the email Mara had shown them. The video, however, was something new. Connor's face filled the frame. He hadn't quite inherited his father's good looks, but he had piercing gray eyes that betrayed his intelligence. His jaw was a little soft, and his hair was unkempt, but he'd dressed in a button-down shirt with a salmon tie. It made him look older than 19. He had hung a white sheet as his background, Light entered from the right side, and Cassie wondered where he could have filmed this. Mara's dorm? His own bedroom? A room in the library? There was no way to tell. Connor adjusted his tie and sat up straighter before he began talking. My name is Connor Grayson. My father is Senator Lawrence Grayson. I am sending this video to several news outlets, in addition to local and federal authorities. With it, you should have received a zip file attachment. This folder will contain the evidence you need to convict my father of a multitude of crimes. Connor paused, leaned forward, and moved something around off camera. He made himself cue cards, Viotto said. Means he's doing this alone. That's good for Mara. Both of them went silent when Connor sat back up, shifted around in his seat, and cleared his throat. Cassie got the sense that if he'd had enough time, he would have edited these videos to ensure they came out smooth and professional. I have discovered that my father, Senator Grayson, is guilty of insider trading. I don't know how long this has been going on, but I have proof that for the last several years, he has been buying and selling stock under the advice given to him by various insider friends. We have always lived comfortably, but it wasn't until the last five years that my dad started bringing in more money. For a while, I thought it was because of his job, but now I have proof it was a lot more than that. Cassie leaned toward Vioto and whispered, he sounds nervous, unsure of himself. He's making a pretty big claim, Vioto whispered back. This would destroy his father's career. He's trying to find a seat at the big kid's table. Cassie's heart skipped a beat when she realized he'd failed. Whether his death was connected to this video and the evidence Connor had uncovered was yet to be determined. But either way, he'd already suffered consequences, either for his own actions or his father's. In the attached folder, you'll find hundreds of emails sent between my father and various friends, discussing which stocks to buy and which to sell. Most of this communication was in code and I've decrypted as much as I could. I assume the FBI will get a little further than I did. He let a small smile slip through before he reeled himself back in. I gained access to my dad's email through his personal laptop. The people he's talking with never reveal their names, but between the companies they're discussing and my personal knowledge of my father's relationships with people in those companies, I've been able to guess about a dozen of their names. I'll leave the rest up to the authorities. Connor leaned forward, changed his cue card, and sat up again. You may wonder why I'm doing this. Connor stared off into space for a moment before coming back to the present and looking directly into the camera. Living with my father hasn't been easy, and we haven't always gotten along. 
However, this is not a personal vendetta. What my dad is doing is wrong. I've done my fair share of bad things in the past, and I've had to pay the price. Now it's his turn. Connor's gaze lingered for a few more seconds before he stood up and turned off the camera. Vioto and Cassie exchanged a look. She was the first to break the silence, but all she could think to say was, wow. Yeah. Vioto rubbed a hand down his face. I'm not sure I believe him. About what? That this isn't personal. He gestured to the screen. That email he sent his father was personal. Maybe that's not all it was, but it was a large contributing factor. Mara said he liked the idea of being a hacktivist. Maybe this was where he cut his teeth. If he could take down his father, he'd gain some respect. Maybe get a career out of it, or at least some accomplices. Cassie nodded. He wanted to be someone great, but he didn't want his father to choose his path forward. So, he'd take him out of the equation and get a little revenge while he's at it. They sat in silence for a moment while they both contemplated the likelihood of that scenario. Vioto leaned forward, closed out of the video, and clicked on the folder labeled evidence. More folders awaited them. Connor had arranged them alphabetically according to the company's name. There had to be at least 20 here. Vioto clicked on the first one, best bet. Have you heard of that company before? Cassie asked. No, it's gotta be on the smaller side. It wouldn't make him a ton of money, but sometimes it's better to steal pennies instead of dollars. They scrolled through the documents inside. Screenshots of emails, pictures of Senator Grayson having dinner with the same man over the course of two years. Donations made to charity for oddly specific amounts. He was acting like his own private detective. Theoto shook his head, but he looked impressed. There's gotta be hundreds of documents here, if not thousands, this is going to take some time to go through. Do you think this was enough of a motive to have him killed? It certainly is compelling evidence. But his own father? Do you think he'd be capable of that? Everyone is capable of murder, Vioto said. It's whether or not we're pushed to do it. Cassie looked back at the laptop. She didn't like that answer, but she couldn't fault him for thinking that. She'd experienced plenty of horrors over the years, had seen what humans could do. They could be wonderful, giving, incredible creatures, or they could be evil, disgusting monsters. So, what's next? Vioto pulled out his phone, hit a few more buttons, and put it on speaker. Manus picked up on the second ring. Any updates? Yeah. Vioto looked at the computer and shook his head. Do me a favor and bring Senator Grayson in. He's got some explaining to do. Chapter 30 Cassie and Vioto crammed themselves into the tiny room on the other side of a one-way mirror, where they could watch Davenport and Manis interview Senator Grayson. It was hot and stuffy, and she was all too aware of how close Vioto was. Their drive back to the station was full of unanswered questions. She had sensed his excitement as they trekked closer to the truth about what had happened to Connor Grayson. She still had her doubts. Maybe the senator had killed his own son, or maybe one of his so-called friends had gotten wind of what Connor was up to. Maybe his death had nothing to do with the information Mara had given them. But as more time went on, that last one seemed less likely. The vibration of Cassie's phone interrupted the silence. Laura's name appeared on the screen. Cassie was less angry with her mother now that there was some time and distance between them, but she wasn't quite ready to have a conversation with her. She wanted to hear what Grayson had to say. Then she'd go home and fix things with her parents. Vioto gestured to her phone. You need to take that? No. Cassie slipped the phone back in her bag. It's just my sister. Vioto nodded toward Senator Grayson. You picking up anything from him? Cassie looked at the man on the other side of the glass. The room was stark white and barren. 
He sat behind a desk and fiddled with a bottle of water someone had given him. It was already half gone. She wasn't sure how long he'd been there, but he'd already put his jacket on the back of his chair and loosened his tie. He kept looking at the door in anticipation of someone walking through it. Psychically? No. Cassie watched as he glanced at the door for the hundredth time. But experience tells me he's nervous about something. I'm surprised his lawyer isn't in there. He could have called him and chose not to. Vioto crossed his arms. He looked relaxed, except for his fingers drumming against his arm. Davenport told him we had additional information about Connor. He either doesn't think this is about him, or he doesn't want to look guilty by calling in his lawyer. He's about to get a rude awakening. The door to the interrogation room opened, and Manus and Davenport walked through. Here we go. Senator Grayson? Davenport's earlier air of annoyance had disappeared. He seemed congenial now, like he was sitting down with an old friend. How are you? Do you need some more water? No, I'm fine. Then, as an afterthought, he added, thank you. You're welcome. Davenport gestured to Manus as the other man sat down. You remember my colleague? Grayson pushed his water to the side and folded his hands on the table. It looked like it took all of his willpower to appear as stately as usual. The bags under his eyes seemed even more pronounced in the fluorescent lighting. Yes, it's nice to see you again, Agent Manus. Likewise, Senator Grayson. We appreciate you coming down here to talk to us. You said it was about Connor? He looked between the two men. Something about additional information? Davenport sat back in his chair. He wouldn't have looked out of place if he'd had a cigarette in his mouth and a beer on the table in front of him. We had a chat with Connor's ex-girlfriend, Mara Young. Do you know her? Not really, Grayson shrugged. I never met her. My publicist did a little digging on her when they started seeing each other. She seems like a good kid. She is. Good grades, never got in trouble. I'm a little surprised she linked up with Connor. He seemed to be more interested in making headlines than she was. Grayson pressed his lips together in a thin line. So it would seem. Davenport smiled. She shared some interesting information with us today about your relationship with Connor. Guess what she told us? Grayson's eyebrows came together, and he looked at Manus as if to confirm that Davenport was telling the truth. When he turned back to the detective, his eyes were harder. I've been quite open about my strained relationship with my son. The headlines haven't kept it a secret. I have nothing to hide, detective. Are you sure about that, Senator? Davenport was taking his time, toying with Grayson's emotions. Ms. Young tells us your son was afraid of you. He was biding his time. He wanted to watch you burn. Does this sound familiar? Something changed on Grayson's face. Cassie could see him running calculations while he methodically opened his water bottle, took a sip, replaced the cap, and set it back down on the table. Yes, that does sound familiar. Davenport must not have expected that answer. He was silent for a moment. Does it? Where have you heard that before? Do me a favor, Grayson said, and don't insult me. I won't sit here and incriminate myself. If you have something to say, detective, then just say it. We're all big boys. Manus hit a smile behind a cough while Davenport's face turned red. He squared himself with Grayson. We have credible evidence that you've been buying and trading stocks illegally, Senator Grayson. Is this true? If my lawyer were here, he'd tell me not to say anything about that. Why isn't your lawyer here, Senator? Manus asked. You seem like a smart guy. You knew we were going to have some tough questions for you when we asked you to come down here. My lawyer doesn't always have my best interests in mind. I'd rather talk to you by myself before I get him involved. Sounds like you need a new lawyer, Davenport said. Grayson's smile was tight. It's not that easy, detective. Trust me. We have enough evidence to put you away for insider trading, Senator Grayson. 
We don't need your confession. Davenport leaned forward. He had a slimy, greasy smile on his face. I'd rather talk to you about the reason you killed your own kid over it. Grayson looked like Davenport had slapped him across the face. It took him a few seconds to find his words again. I didn't kill my son. He was threatening your career. Davenport shrugged like it all made sense to him. He was going to expose you for the criminal you are. No more White House. That's more than enough motivation for most people to kill another person. I did not kill my son. Grayson looked to Manus like he was the only sane one in the room. I saw the email this morning, a couple of hours ago. I had no idea what he was planning to do until after he was already dead. Why should we believe you? Manus's tone was kinder than Davenport's. It was a genuine question. Where Davenport was only interested in riling up their suspect, Manus knew you could catch more flies with honey. We can build a solid case against you. There's plenty of motive here. Why should we believe you had nothing to do with it? Grayson searched the top of the table like he would find the answer etched into its surface. Cassie saw the second he found what he was looking for. When he looked up again, his eyes were wide. He was terrified, but determined. What if I can offer you a better alternative? We're not interested in making deals, Senator, Davenport said. Not a deal. Grayson looked directly at Manus. An alternative theory. Manus leaned back in his chair, crossed his arms. I'm listening. I admit someone has given me a heads up once or twice for buying or selling certain stocks. I had a little money growing up, and I found it hard to resist since gaining a position where it was so readily available. We're not interested in your sob story. Davenport interjected. Grayson glared at him. But I'm not a murderer. I didn't have the best relationship with my son. Have I ever wished he'd learned a lesson he'd never forget? Yeah, of course. But you have to be alive to never forget it. I'd never kill my own kid. Just because you didn't pull the trigger doesn't mean you didn't kill him, Manus added. Grayson wilted. It was clear the thought hadn't occurred to him and it was a devastating train of thought. I'm not saying this isn't my fault, one way or another. Maybe it is, because of who I am, what I do. But I didn't kill him. I never told anyone to kill him. You said you had an alternative theory? Manus gestured for him to go ahead. Let's hear it. Understand, there are many people who want to see me succeed. If I succeed, then they succeed. There was sweat on his brow now. If I don't fall in line, then I'm out of the race. If my kid is in too many headlines, they find a way to control him. If they can't control him, then they deal with the problem. I just didn't think, I didn't think they'd go this far. Manus looked concerned now. What are you trying to say? Someone's pulling your strings? Not just mine. He looked manic. Everyone. All the biggest politicians in North Carolina, in DC, maybe even the world. I don't know how far their reach is, but they have the motivation and capability of killing Connor. Who? Manus asked. He leaned forward. Who would have that kind of reach, that kind of power? Grayson took a deep breath. For a second, it looked like he didn't want to say the name out loud. When he finally did, it came out as a whisper. Cassie almost missed it. Apex Publicity. Chapter 31. The room was silent as everyone absorbed Grayson's words. Cassie imagined their thoughts mirrored her own. Apex, the publicity company, arguably one of the most successful businesses in the United States, the guy who ran the company was a self-made billionaire who had clients from politicians to celebrities to sports heroes. That one, capable of murder? Cassie and Vioto exchanged glances, and he looked just as confused as she was. Manus was frozen. Davenport was close to laughter. You're shitting me, 
He shook his head. If you're gonna pick a fall guy, pick one that makes sense. Why would Ellis Arnaud want the son of a nobody politician dead? Grayson's head snapped to attention. I'm not a nobody politician. Look, I respect you and your policies, but you're in the North Carolina State Senate. You might have presidential aspirations, but so do 90% of the guys in Washington. What makes you so special? I never said Arno wanted him dead. Grayson took an angry swig of water. I said Apex. So the company wanted him dead? Davenport wasn't hiding his laughter now. Not the guy running it? Manus finally came out of his stupor. Let's give him a chance to explain. Grayson unbuttoned the cuffs on his sleeves, rolled them up, and then leaned forward on the table. Cassie could hear the desperation in his voice, but there was something more to it, a point he needed to prove. Maybe it was about his son, or maybe it was something more. When Apex first approached me, I was young. This was about 10 years ago. They asked if I wanted them to represent me, showed me the work they'd done, the people they'd helped put on the front page of various newspapers, how they'd gone from a bunch of nobodies to the top stars in their fields. Politicians, Manis asked. Everybody, actors, musicians, football players. But yeah, a lot of politicians too. Overnight sensations, all because of Apex. And you believed them? Davenport asked. They were very compelling. Grayson shook his head as though he were chiding his former self. It was one of the most intense meetings I've ever had, even to this day. They would show me one of their clients, then show me how they had tracked their success over time. Most companies would be ecstatic to see their numbers rise like that. It was exponential, and they'd done this thousands of times. So you said yes? Not at first. I thought I was a hot shot. Didn't need anyone else. He laughed, but it was the kind of laugh that came with age and perspective. I already had a publicist at the time. She was great, nothing to complain about. But after that meeting, everything started to fall apart. How so? One day, my publicist quit. Out of the blue, just like that. She was an old friend, too. I'd told her so many times I was gonna take her to the top with me. When I asked her why, she said she'd gotten a better offer, one she couldn't refuse. Davenport snickered. What, from the mob? He looked to Manus, waiting for the joke to land, but it never did. I have no idea who the offer was from, Grayson said, but I have a good guess. Apex, Manus offered. Grayson nodded. What happened after she left? I fell into obscurity. Couldn't get airtime, couldn't get interviews. No one was listening to me, let alone voting for me. I was a nobody. Then Apex approached me again. With the same offer? A better one. They asked me what I wanted. I told them the presidency. They said sign here, and I did. The rest is history. Not for us, Manis shrugged. You're gonna have to fill in some blanks. Davenport held out a hand. I'd like to get back to the murder. Stop dodging our questions. I'm not dodging. Grayson ran a hand through his hair. He was falling apart at the seams. I'm trying to explain to you how dangerous Apex can be. They treat people like chess pieces, except they control both sides of the board. Every time they remove someone from play, they replace them with someone better. They never lose. Manus' voice was much more even than Davenport's. What does this have to do with Connor? My son was a pain in the ass, okay? I'll be the first one to admit it. But I would never hurt him. I was ready to ride out whatever little rebellions he threw my way. I figured, worst case scenario, I send him to a school across the country, and we're out of each other's hair. Best of both worlds. Sending evidence of your criminal activities to every major news outlet and the FBI is not a little rebellion, Davenport said. You're trying to tell me you would have just let that slide? I'm not sure what I would have done. Grayson gulped down more water until he had drained the bottle. Deny it, try to cover it up, find a way to stay out of jail. 
but I never would have killed him. That was all Apex. I know it was. Do you have any proof? Davenport asked. No. Grayson tilted his head back and laughed. No way. They're smarter than that. Then how do you expect us to believe you? The detective punctuated his words with the tip of his finger pointed at Grayson. How do you expect a court to believe you? That's your job, isn't it? Making sure the innocent stay out of jail and the guilty are put away? You are guilty. Of insider trading, of stealing money. Grayson threw up his hands. Not of murdering my own son. Okay, okay, let's calm down for a minute. Manus put a hand on the detective's shoulder until Davenport leaned back in his chair. You must have some reason to suspect Apex did this. Can you give us anything to go off of? If not, then I have to be honest with you, Senator. It's not looking good. You said you talked to my son's girlfriend, right? Agent Vioto spoke to her, yes. She broke up with my son a few days ago, right? That's what she told you? Manus's eyebrows knit together. Yes, that's what she said. A couple days ago, right before Connor disappeared, my publicist asked me what we were going to do about him. She suggested they find someone he'd fall for, someone they could use to manipulate him. She said, a man in love is easier to control. But he already had a girlfriend, Manus supplied, Mara Young. I said the same thing. Anastasia laughed it off. My guess is Apex offered Mara enough money to get her degree and then some. From what I know about the girl, she didn't come from a wealthy family. She wouldn't have been able to say no to money like that. Would that money have come from Apex? Manus asked. Or your bank account? Apex is on retainer. He sounded dejected. So it'll look like I did it. Let's say we believe it was Apex. What would have happened next? They would have told her to sign an NDA. Then they would have left her alone. They'd find another girl Connor's age, send her to school with them, find a way for them to get introduced, and she'd play the part they paid her to play. This seems like a lot of string pulling for a 19-year-old kid, Davenport said. All this just to keep his name out of a couple local newspapers? Remember. Apex asked me what I wanted, and I said I wanted the presidency. They were willing to put me there because they knew they could control me. They probably control this president too, and the last one, and the next one. Don't underestimate them. But still, Mena said, rubbing his chin. Davenport has a point. All of this to keep a kid out of the headlines? Why not just pay off Connor? I doubt he would have taken it. Besides. This isn't hard for them. It's a game, and they've learned to play it very well. They'd be able to use Connor's girlfriend as leverage against me. They would have used the payoff against me. Every fiber in their web of lives serves multiple purposes, and they know exactly when to pull on them. Manus rubbed his forehead. What would have made them go from pulling strings to murdering Connor? If he was going to go public, and there was nothing they could do to stop him, I wouldn't put it past them. Grayson's manic stare was dissipating, replaced with a deep-seated fear. There are rumors. People talk. Not loudly and not very long. But those of us who have employed Apex, despite our good intentions, understand that we've gotten into bed with the devil. We know our success was off the backs of other people's failures. Some of those failures came with permanent consequences. If Apex is as big and dangerous as you're making it out to be, then why are you telling us all this? For the first time since Cassie had set eyes on Senator Grayson, he looked like a genuine person. Because I won't go to jail for killing my own kid. He slapped his hand on the table. My wife can leave me. She can divorce me. She can erase every memory she has of me, and I'll learn to live with that. Those are the consequences of my actions but I'll be damned if I let her believe I killed our son. Cassie's phone vibrated again, and it sounded like machine gun fire in the silence that followed Grayson's statement. Who can we talk to about this? Manus asked. Who would have information on what may have happened to Connor? I want protection for me and my wife. 
Grayson's eyes were wild again. People you can trust. People who couldn't possibly be under Apex's thumb. You have my word. Mana sounded sincere. But we need a name. Talk to my publicist, Anastasia Bolton. Cassie's phone stopped vibrating for a few seconds, then started up again. She couldn't ignore it any longer. She stepped away from the one-way mirror and held the phone to her head, cupping her hand around her mouth, even though she knew Grayson wouldn't be able to hear her. Hello? Cassie? Where the hell have you been? I'm a little busy. Laura cut her off. I've been calling for ages. Why didn't you pick up? What's wrong? Cassie's heartbeat tripled in speed. What happened? It's mom. Laura's voice sounded pained and far away. Cassie finally took notice of all the noise in the background. A muffled announcement, phones ringing, a person shouting. She's in the hospital. Chapter 32 When Cassie passed through the doors to the emergency room, it felt like she had walked into a different world. When she had visited the hospital previously, she'd been able to resist the ghostly tendrils that reached out for her help. Now, she didn't have the strength to stop them from pulling her under. Here, it tasted like fear. It oozed like a black, amorphous mass as it sucked her in, threatening to obstruct her airways. Its icy fingers trailed up her arms, along her neck, and down her back, until her entire body erupted into goosebumps. All hospitals held energy from the spirits that passed through them. It was inevitable when so many had died in the same place over the years. The older the hospital, the more that energy had concentrated and transformed into something else, something that touched the edges of sentience. The ghosts here in the emergency room were different too. Few spirits were stronger than those who had met a tragic and sudden death, and they lined the walls in this area. Cassie could hardly believe the building was still standing. The dead pushed against the walls as though they thought touching the frosty night air would be enough to bring them back to life. She stumbled as she approached the main desk, dizzy and weak. She had to catch her breath, slow her heart, clear her mind. If she let them get too close, she'd have too much trouble shaking them. They'd burrow into her mind, attach themselves to her body, and she'd be dragging their spirits behind her until she cast them out or they took her completely. One deep breath followed another. A woman approached. The sound in Cassie's head drowned her out. Concern lined her mouth. The shape of her words carried a heavy burden Cassie could feel rather than hear. My mom. Cassie could barely make out her own voice. The pulsing of her blood was too loud. I'm looking for my mom. The woman said something else. Cassie shook her head. She couldn't concentrate, couldn't hear what the woman was saying. The noise was crippling. It threatened to crush her skull beneath the weight. She felt her knees give way. Strong arms kept her upright. She turned to see her father's face inches from hers. Cassie felt the world rush back to her. Laura was there, her eyes wide and her lips parted as though she could see the ghosts too. The grip of the spirit realm retreated, not gone, but just out of reach. Cassie, her father still held her. Are you okay? Mom? She's okay, come sit down. Cassie let them take her over to a corner of the waiting room where they'd made a little nest out of jackets and tissue boxes. She collapsed into a chair, but refused to let go of her father's hand. Her sister handed her a bottle of water, and Cassie felt it refresh every cell in her body, making her come alive once more. What's going on? Laura's question held meaning only the sisters understood. Are you okay? I'm fine, better now, sorry. Cassie swallowed, her mouth still tasted like ash. Got a little overwhelmed. Are you sure? I'm sure. She did her best attempt to smile. I just need a minute. Your mom is fine. Her dad patted Cassie's hand reassuringly, 
They're running some tests right now, but we should be able to see her soon. I called you like six times. Laura tried to keep the blame out of her voice, but Cassie heard it anyway. Where were you? I was with Agent Viotto. We interviewed Connor Grayson's girlfriend. Then they brought the senator in for questioning. She looked to her dad. Anthony Lewis didn't kill him. Let's wait until your mom is a little stronger before we mention that to her. Cassie nodded. I'm sorry. I thought you wanted to talk about the fight, but I was still mad and upset and embarrassed. You have nothing to apologize for. He patted her hand again. You had a right to be upset. But I shouldn't have stormed out. That's in the past now. He looked at a set of doors that Cassie presumed led to her mom. They think she had a panic attack. She was complaining about chest pain and a racing heart. They're just making sure she didn't have a heart attack, but it doesn't seem likely. Oh, God. Cassie bent over and put her face in her hands. What if I'd given her a heart attack? What if she had- No. Laura's voice was angry enough that it made Cassie look up. Don't do that to yourself. You can take responsibility for the way you reacted, but you can't take responsibility for something that didn't happen. That's half the reason why mom's in here. What? Cassie looked from her sister to her father. What are you talking about? She was scared you weren't coming back. She started freaking out, crying and yelling. Laura shook her head as though trying to dislodge the memories. She convinced me to go after you. I was halfway out the door when she collapsed. Before Cassie could respond, a nurse came up to them. Mr. Quinn? He stood immediately. Yes? Your wife is fine. You can go see her now. When Cassie and Laura stood up, she shook her head. One at a time for right now, okay? She's tired and sedated. We don't want to overwhelm her. Walter squeezed his daughters and kissed them each on the top of their heads. I'll be right back. Laura sat back down, but Cassie watched as he walked through a pair of doors and down a hallway into the bowels of the hospital. Cassie felt stronger now, strong enough to keep the hospital's crawling fingers at bay. But she could feel them waiting in the wings, hoping for her to let her guard down. Laura waited until their dad disappeared before turning to Cassie. You freaked me out earlier. Cassie put her face in her hands. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. Things got kind of intense. Laura lowered her voice. Did the senator do it? I don't think so. Cassie sat back in her chair. But something weird is going on. Either way, he's going to jail. Wait, really? Why? Insider trading. Cassie shook her head. He didn't even try to deny it. But he was adamant he didn't kill his kid. And what was that when you first got here? You looked like you were about to pass out. Cassie gestured to the room around them. It's overwhelming for me. Laura followed her gaze, but she would never truly know what Cassie experienced. Will you tell me about it? Cassie quirked an eyebrow in her direction. Do you really want to know? Yeah, I do. Cassie sighed. How many people do you see? Laura did another quick scan of the room. Maybe 15? I see twice that. She pointed to a young couple on the opposite side of the room. That woman's mother is sitting beside her, with her hand on her stomach. I'd say the woman is pregnant and doesn't know it. She pointed to an older woman and her son. That lady's husband follows her wherever she goes. My guess is that her time is close, and he's just waiting. She gestured to a young mother and a pair of kids. There's a man hovering around her. Not sure who he is, though. He keeps looking at the kids like all he wants is to be alive again. Laura took a moment to ingest everything Cassie said. Wow. But it's so much more than that. Cassie closed her eyes and defocused her mind. She could feel the hospital all around her. It had its own heartbeat. It pulsed with the spirits of the dead. So many people have died here. Some moved on and some stayed, but they've all left an imprint. If I concentrate hard enough, I can feel every one of them. 
I have to work to ignore it. I have to actively turn them away when they reach out to me. It's exhausting and horrible and overwhelming. Laura looked close to tears, but she let Cassie ramble. And there's a woman sitting across the room. She keeps looking at me. She's not here with anyone else. I'm not sure how long it's been for her. Maybe a few days, maybe years. But she looks just like mom. Cassie let the tears spill down her face. And I keep wondering if it's her. If something happened and they didn't tell us. And even if it's not her, someday it might be. What if I have to watch her stand by dad's side until it's his turn? Or you? What if I get a few extra days or months or years with one of you, and then one day you stop showing up? How am I supposed to say goodbye to you twice? Laura pulled Cassie into a hug and let her cry into her chest. I'm so sorry that this chose you. She stroked Cassie's hair. After a minute, she forced Cassie to look at her. I know it's not fair, and I doubt it'll ever be easy. You've lived through so much already. Is this supposed to make me feel better? Cassie's joke was half-hearted, but it made Laura chuckle anyway. Because I don't think it's working. You're incredible, and I don't always think you know that. Cassie made a disgusted face, and Laura laughed even harder. It's true. You're special, as cheesy as that sounds. And I'm always going to be here to remind you of that, okay? Cassie nodded, but her throat was too thick with emotion to speak. And if it's ever too much for you, I'll build you a cabin in the woods where you never have to talk to anyone ever again, living or dead. Deal? That made Cassie laugh. She found her voice again. Deal. Chapter 33 the sisters had fallen into a quiet silence by the time their father returned to the waiting room. Cassie was the first to spot him. She'd been watching the ghost of an older woman dressed in a nurse's uniform make laps and mime taking people's names when he approached from the side. How is she? She's good. She wants to talk to you. Cassie swallowed. Am I in trouble? He laughed and kissed the top of her head. I don't think so. Just be gentle with her, okay? Cassie nodded and followed the nurse through the set of doors, down a long hallway, and into a room with two beds. Relief flooded through Cassie when she saw the second bed was empty. There was nothing worse than having an audience when you were bearing your soul to someone. The nurse left, and Cassie walked around the curtain that had been half pulled around her mother's bed. Judy Quinn looked the same as always, except for the pulse oximeter clipped to her finger and a couple of electrodes that disappeared under the top of her gown. Her skin had a glow, her eyes were bright, and she was sitting upright in bed. A small glass of water sat on the nightstand next to her phone. Hi, Mom. Cassie, she smiled, and Cassie's shoulders relaxed. Come sit by me. Cassie sat down in the chair and took her mom's hand. How are you feeling? Judy clicked her tongue and rolled her eyes. I'm fine. I had a panic attack. Can you believe that? Thought I was dying for a minute there. So dramatic. You scared everyone. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry too, Mom. I shouldn't have gotten so upset. I shouldn't have left like that. I- Stop. Judy squeezed Cassie's hand and waited until she had her daughter's full attention. None of that was your fault. I got myself worked up. You had a right to be upset. Dad said you thought I wasn't coming back. She shrugged, but she looked sheepish. I'd just gotten you back. I didn't want to lose you again. You won't. Cassie let the weight of her words fall over both of them. I promise, okay? but that means we both have to get better at talking about the stuff that hurts. I know, her eyes sparkled. Where should we start? Cassie chuckled. It was nice seeing her mom this open and vulnerable. If only it didn't come with a hospital fee equal to the price of a college education. 
First, I want to apologize for how I reacted. Cassie held up a hand when her mom argued. I know it's okay, it's behind us, but it's important to me that you understand how sorry I am. I was feeling raw and vulnerable and hurt that you and dad kept secrets from me, secrets about myself. There are bits of me missing, and that's a scary feeling to have. Your father and I love you so much, she sat up a little straighter in bed. We'll always love you. Everything we've ever done was to protect you. When Sarah went missing, it broke something inside me. Up until that point, I'd never been that scared. If the person who took her had chosen the house a few doors down, it could have been one of you girls. I understand, Cassie swallowed. This was going to be the hard part. Can I ask you some questions about Sarah? About the time when she disappeared? Judy chewed the inside of her cheek. You're an adult? I know I don't need to keep those things from you anymore, but it's still difficult. You're always going to be my little girl. Cassie smiled. It was as much permission as she was going to get. But now that the floor was hers, she felt tongue-tied. What she really wanted to ask was, am I the reason Sarah is dead? But her mom would never say she was, even if Cassie could force the question out of her mouth. Instead, she thought back to what she had learned so far and realized it wasn't much. The connection between Sarah, Sebastian, and Ethan was a mystery. Did they ever figure out why Sarah was taken? Did anything happen in the days leading up to her disappearance that made them realize she'd been a target? Not that I can remember. Judy took a sip of water and leaned back into her pillows. A couple kids had already gone missing in the area, and all the parents were being especially careful. We wouldn't let you play outside without one of us watching. You girls hated it, of course, but I didn't care how mad you got at me. Those were the rules, and you listened, for the most part. For the most part? I explained it wasn't safe to go outside without an adult, but I never told you why. No matter how many times you asked. I mean, how do you explain that to a 10-year-old? You can't, Cassie said. Even if I understood it, I doubt it would have felt real. Kids think they're invincible. They don't realize what the world is really like. A few nights before Sarah went missing, I got a call from Sarah's mother. She was furious. She said you had convinced Sarah and your sister to go out into the woods in the middle of the night. She caught all three of you sneaking back in around midnight. I was so mad, I swear I could have spit nails. She let you girls stay the night, but she sent you home first thing in the morning. Cassie could feel the fuzzy edges of a memory coalescing in her mind. She could picture Mrs. Lennox yelling, Laura crying, Sarah trying to tell her mom it wasn't Cassie's fault. And Cassie was so terrified, she thought she'd wet her pants. But not because she'd gotten in trouble, because of what had been in the woods behind Sarah's house. When you got home, your father and I sat you down and had a nice long talk. I asked why you left the house, and you said you thought you saw someone outside the window. Obviously, that didn't go over well. We debated calling the police, but back then, I figured the person was long gone. Her voice caught, and she had to clear it before she could talk again. Over the years, I've wondered if Sarah would have gone missing if I had mentioned something that day. When the police interviewed us later, I brought it up. They interviewed you, but all you said was you saw a woman. You couldn't describe her. Laura didn't remember seeing anyone. The police dropped it after that. Cassie was only half listening to her mother. The mention of a woman out in the woods had caused the fuzzy memory to solidify. Bits and pieces were still wispy at the edges, but she remembered that night with a clarity she hadn't had in over 20 years. Cassie had slept on Sarah's floor that night, wrapped up in a sleeping bag. Normally, Cassie didn't like when her little sister crashed their sleepovers, 
but Sarah had let Laura cuddle up next to her in bed in exchange for Laura taking pictures of them with the camera she'd just gotten for her birthday. It was made for kids, but it used real film their parents would then have to develop. Cassie had been jealous until Laura pretended to be a photographer, using Cassie and Sarah as her models. She couldn't remember why she'd woken up in the middle of the night, only that one minute she was asleep, and the next minute she saw a face staring in through the window. It was the face of a little boy, of Sebastian Thomas. Cassie's heart broke all over again, knowing Sebastian had been there for most of her life, waiting for her to reclaim her abilities and remember him. Sebastian wasn't afraid, and neither was Cassie. She could tell, perhaps psychically, that he needed help. She crawled out of her sleeping bag and shook Sarah awake. Sarah had always believed Cassie when she talked about her imaginary friends or the way she'd have dreams that would inevitably come true. The two girls slipped on their shoes and snuck out of the house. Sebastian was waiting for them in the backyard. When they got close enough to reach him, he'd flicker out of existence and reappear a few feet away, beckoning her to follow. Cassie obliged, and Sarah never questioned her. Sebastian's glow lit their way for a couple hundred yards. It was cold, they hadn't thought to take their jackets, and the pressing darkness made Cassie's hair stand up on the back of her neck. That's when they heard the rustling. A branch snapped. It sounded like a gunshot in the darkness. Sebastian blinked out of view, and somehow, Cassie knew this was what he wanted her to see. His job was over, and he wasn't coming back. Sarah gripped her arm until Cassie's eyes watered from the pain. She could feel someone close by, someone with loud steps and ragged breathing. She even remembered the way her heartbeat had lodged in her throat. It made her want to puke. Cassie? Laura's voice was so tiny, the woods nearly swallowed it whole. Sarah jumped, and Cassie said the only swear word she knew. Shit. The relief that it was just Laura battled with the anger that her little sister had followed them out into the woods. They were big girls. They could do things like that. But Laura was too tiny, too fragile, too afraid of everything. And she'd scared off Sebastian. But when the rustling came again, it was from a different direction than Laura's voice. And it was closer now. Tiny sticks popped, leaves crunched, and pebbles rolled through the underbrush. Cassie's imagination went wild. Was it a person or a monster? Would it leave them be if they stayed very still? Or would it eat them anyway? Cassie? Laura's voice was a little louder this time, and Cassie wanted to slap a hand over her sister's mouth. The night was so dark, she could hardly see her hand in front of her face. There was no moon and the overcast sky had obscured what little light the stars would have given off. Cassie wasn't sure what to do. If she stayed still, Laura might say her name again. Then the monster might find her sister. If Cassie tried walking to Laura, then the monster might come after her instead. If Cassie said something, she'd risk the monster finding both her and Sarah. Before she could decide, Cassie heard Laura shuffling through the leaves toward them. Every crunch sounded like a boom in the night. And she wondered if Laura hadn't heard the monster or was more afraid of being alone than what would happen if it caught her. The rustling stopped as Laura moved closer. Cassie could envision every footstep her sister made. Heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to. The pattern changed as the tip of Laura's toe hit a branch or a rock or a vine. She tripped, and when she hit the ground, her camera bounced. It must have landed at the perfect angle because there was a loud mechanical scraping sound as it went off. Then a flash of light lit up the entire woods. The brightness lasted half a second, but Cassie could have sworn she had time to count every leaf on every tree within a 10 foot radius. There was Sarah standing next to her, eyes wide and hair brushed back into a ponytail. There was Laura on the ground, eyes squeezed shut 
and a cry of pain about to escape her mouth. And there was the monster, hunched over, hair wild, staring directly at Sarah. But it wasn't a monster. It was a woman. She looked older than Cassie's mom because of the wrinkles or the pain in her eyes. They were a golden brown, the same color as her hair. It was frizzy like Laura's when she combed it with the wrong brush. The woman should have had silky smooth curls, but she had a bird's nest on top of her head instead. Cassie froze, as though the woman might not notice her if she didn't move. She stood rooted to the spot while Laura lay in pain on the ground. Sarah was the only one who dared to breathe, and when she took a step back in fear, the woman's gaze snapped to Sarah's face. And then the light went out. Cassie didn't think, she just moved. Whether the woman was a monster, it hardly mattered. No one should have been in the woods that night, least of all three little girls. She sprinted forward, picked Laura up with a strength she didn't know she possessed, and launched herself back toward the house with Sarah right on her heels. The blood pumping through her body drowned out all the other noises, and Cassie couldn't tell if the woman was chasing them or if she'd turned and run in the opposite direction. Either way, Cassie, Sarah, and Laura didn't stop moving until they came crashing through the front door, nearly bowling over Mrs. Lennox in the process. From there, it was a blur of relief and terror and shame for breaking a rule she knew had been in place for her own safety. Chapter 34 The nurse returned to switch Cassie out for Laura, and then it was time to return home. The hospital wanted to keep Judy a few hours longer, and Walter had stayed on the promise to keep the girls updated with any developments. Cassie was still buzzing with her newfound memory. If Laura had said anything to her on the ride home, she couldn't remember. Okay, you're killing me. Laura shifted the car into park. Somehow, they had already made it back to the house. Did you and mom make up? I think so. Cassie unbuckled her seatbelt, but didn't move to get out of the car. We still have some stuff to talk about, but I think she's scared. She wants to keep me at a distance, because she's afraid I'll leave again. And she wants to hold me close, because she's afraid you'll leave again. Exactly. Cassie waited for Laura to open her car door, then mirrored her movements, still in a daze. She waited until they were inside and had kicked off their shoes and hung up their jackets before she spoke again. She told me more about that night Sarah went missing. Anything important? She told me Mrs. Lennox had caught us sneaking back in that night. Then it all came back. I remembered waking up in the middle of the night to a face peeking in the window. Oh my God, that's terrifying. Laura had the coffee pot halfway to their mugs. Do you think it was one of the kidnappers? It was Sebastian. Her jaw dropped. When he was alive? Cassie shook her head. I knew he needed help, so I woke Sarah up and we walked out into the woods. You must have followed us because your camera went off. The flash lit up the whole woods like it was daytime, and there was this crazy woman standing there. Holy shit, that's terrifying. She blew on her coffee with a contemplative look on her face. I remember sneaking out into the woods, following you guys to see what you were up to. I don't remember seeing a woman, though. You had tripped and fallen. That's why your camera went off. I broke it that night. She laughed. Mom and Dad were so mad. They had just gotten it for me. The film was still good, but the lens had cracked. I- Laura broke off, her eyes wide. Cassie looked around like someone was standing behind her. What? My box is upstairs. There was a roll of undeveloped film in one of them. I didn't toss it because I figured one day I'd develop it, and we could laugh at all the ridiculous pictures I took of you guys. Cassie didn't need to hear another word. She sprinted for the staircase with Laura on her heels. They took them two at a time. When they reached the landing, they took off for the sewing room and crashed through the door, nearly tearing it off its hinges. Laura dug out her boxes 
and the two of them ripped through them, tossing stuffed animals, CDs, and old toys around the room. Cassie was about to abandon the box in front of her and start on a new one when she saw the cylindrical container tucked under a stack of T-shirts. She held it up for Laura to see. Do you think that's it? Laura asked. Do you think she's on there? Only one way to find out. It took less than 30 minutes to find a photo lab, drive to the local Walmart, and get the pictures developed. Cassie felt like she was holding on to national secrets as she tucked the envelope of pictures into her purse and resisted sprinting back to the car. She wanted to look at them the second they touched her fingertips, but there was something sacred about looking into the past like this. She didn't want witnesses. Once she and Laura were back in the car, Cassie locked the door and pulled out the envelope. Their heads touched as they both leaned over it. Cassie looked up at her sister. Ready? All Laura could do was nod. Cassie slipped the photos out and took them one by one, deliberately taking in each image, all of which she had in duplicates. A blurry photo of a birthday cake as Laura got used to taking pictures, a too close picture of their mom, then a handful of cameos of the family. You look so happy, Laura said. I was a kid. She leaned in closer. What did I have to be sad about? I know, I guess. Laura shook her head, her voice thick with emotion. I just didn't remember. That sounds awful. I'm sorry. Cassie looked up at her. You don't have to be sorry. I forgot too. So much has happened since then. We all grow up and change. We're not meant to be the same as when we were kids. Yeah but some people get to hold on to that happiness for a little while longer. You never had the chance. Cassie shrugged. She wasn't sure what else to say. She could sit here feeling sorry for herself, but what would that change? For most people, the past was the past, but her past had come back to haunt her, literally. She couldn't change what had happened, but she could change how it affected her. The next few pictures were of Cassie and Sarah, laughing and playing a board game, eating popcorn and watching movies, dancing around the living room in feather boas and sequined shirts. She barely remembered any of those moments in time, and yet here was proof they had happened. The next picture made the sisters gasp. It was so different from the others. Everything before had been bright and colorful, but darkness enshrouded this image. The edges were black, and along the left-hand side, there was a too close tree trunk. But beyond that was what had sent chills down Cassie's spine. The woman was in profile, her skin bright white from the flash. Her eyes were closed against the light, and her hands were halfway to her face. But Cassie could see her. She was real. The monster in the woods had been a woman in her 40s or 50s. Do you recognize her? Laura asked. I've never seen her before. No, not at all. She leaned closer and looked at the curve of her jaw, the point of her nose, the flatness of her forehead. She's no one I know, dead or alive. Laura leaned back and brushed her curls away from her face. Sebastian wanted you to see the woman in the woods that night and he's been pretty insistent that he's connected to Sarah. Could this woman be the kidnapper? They always thought the guy who got arrested had a co-conspirator. And if they were stealing children, then having a woman, a mother figure, would have been smart to keep them all in line. Cassie looked back to the woman. Either we caught her at a very bad time, or she wasn't a very good mother figure. All of this is conjecture without knowing who she is, though. What are we going to do? Cassie stared out the windshield and watched the clouds roll by. She could ask her parents if they knew her, but the woman didn't look like someone they would have called up for a dinner date. Then it hit her. She turned to Laura and smiled. I have an idea. Do tell. Who do you know who has facial recognition software and a data bank of known criminals? Laura's eyes widened. 
the FBI. Cassie tucked the photo back into the envelope and slipped it into her purse. She put the car in gear and couldn't stop her smile from growing. For the first time since Sebastian showed up, she felt close to some actual answers. Hopefully, my new friend, Agent Viotto, won't mind doing me a favor in exchange for the help I've given them on the Grayson case. Chapter 35 After dropping Laura back home, Cassie followed Agent Viotto's directions to meet him outside an apartment building in downtown Charlotte. She could tell just by looking at the structure that it was meant for a certain clientele, and she certainly didn't fit those parameters. The sun bounced off the silver and glass monstrosity, forcing her to shield her eyes. She pulled up behind Viotto's sedan, hopped out, and made her way around the passenger side of his car. Inside it was warm and smelled strongly of vanilla, but the cigarette smoke still lingered. New air freshener? She asked. Nothing will ever remove that stench from this car. It's a losing battle. Viotto pursed his lips. How's your mom? She's fine. Cassie tipped her head back and closed her eyes for a minute. She hadn't realized until this moment just how tired she was. Panic attack, no heart trouble. She'll be having her surgery tomorrow. I hope it goes well. He cleared his throat. And thank you for meeting me here. I know you have a lot going on. Cassie opened one eye and smiled at him. I may have an ulterior motive. Oh? Cassie saw a swirl of curiosity, hope, and something else cross his face and looked away. Now was not the time to divine the truth from his eyes. She pulled out the photo of the strange woman instead. This is a long shot, but I was hoping you could do me a favor. I can certainly try. Who's this? That's what I'd like to know. My sister took this picture when she was five. This woman may have information about a bunch of kidnappings happening while I was growing up. My best friend at the time was one of them. I'm sorry to hear that. Viotto took the picture in his hand and held it as though she'd gifted him something precious. The quality isn't great, but there are enough definable features here that we may be able to pinpoint someone. What other information can you give me that'll help narrow this down? It happened in Savannah, Georgia, in 1995. My friend's name was Sarah Lennox. Sebastian Thomas and Ethan Miller might also be connected. He tucked the photo away. I'll do my best. Thank you. I mean that. You're welcome. Besides, it's a small price to pay to have someone by my side when we interview this person. Yeah? Where's your partner? She looked in the back seat, like maybe he had ducked down on the floor. He didn't want in on the action? More like he warned me to stay away. When Cassie shot him a puzzled look, he shrugged. Things got weird after you left. Davenport hightailed it out of there. He said he was following up on some loose ends. But I think he was just pissed that Anthony Lewis was looking less and less like a suspect. Grayson hasn't been arrested or charged yet, but it's only a matter of time. And Manus took me aside and told me not to kick the hornet's nest. Apex? Viotto nodded. Apparently, it's not the first time he's heard of them. He made them out to sound like the boogeyman. The top echelon of the company is smart enough and rich enough to keep their hands clean. They use trusted employees to do their dirty work but they're also a legitimate business that gets results for their clients. They're untouchable. Sounds like the mob. Cassie couldn't believe she'd never heard of them before, at least in passing. The underlings get arrested, and the bosses replace them with a snap of their finger. Basically. Viotto squinted as he looked up at the building. Grayson's publicist, Anastasia Bolton, lives here. From what I've gathered, She's not too high up on the food chain, but she knows more than Grayson. She might have some idea who killed Connor. I've seen her on TV. I wouldn't want to cross her, or Apex. You're not worried? Oh, I'm terrified. He pushed his door open, and a gust of wind ruffled his hair. 
but she's our only solid lead. We have to follow it. Cassie didn't argue. Instead, she followed Vioto right up to the front of the building and into the gold inlaid front entrance. It was a sprawling lobby dressed in white marble with minimalist touches like a golden bundle of wheat behind the front desk. Everything about it looked like an upscale hotel with all the amenities. Vioto approached the front desk. A young woman with jet black hair and dark rimmed glasses eyed them as they approached. She looked startled when he pulled out his badge and showed it to her. Can you tell us which apartment Anastasia Bolton is in? When the woman stumbled over her reply, he leaned forward and gave her his most charming smile. We're not here to cause any trouble. We just want to chat with her. All I need is her apartment number. She doesn't have to talk to me if she doesn't want to, and I won't press it. The woman's eyes were wide, but she hit a few keys on her keyboard and clicked a few buttons until she found the file she was looking for. Top floor, apartment 3302. Thank you so much. We'll be out of your hair quickly, I promise. The woman nodded and watched as Cassie and Vioto made their way over to a bank of elevators. She was still staring after them when the doors shut. Vioto pressed the button for the 33rd floor, and Cassie took a deep breath. This must be a new building, she said. He looked at her out of the corner of his eye. Why? It's quiet. Older buildings are louder. I can feel the energy when I walk inside them. This one hasn't experienced much tragedy yet. You say a lot of spooky things, don't you? It's been known to happen from time to time. I'll keep that in mind. Cassie blushed, but then tamped down on the feeling. Did she want Vioto to stick around and get used to her weird ramblings? Maybe, but it was never going to happen. Soon enough, they'd part ways, and the chances of them ever running into each other again would be close to zero. When the elevator dinged, she was glad for the distraction. Unlike Mara Young's floor, this one didn't smell like anything. It was just clean and inviting and bright. Everyone here knew how much body spray to apply. They were also more familiar with the kind of drugs whose stench didn't linger in the air. Vioto knocked on the door of apartment 3302. Ten seconds later, Anastasia Bolton opened the door wearing a pencil skirt, a blouse, and stockinged feet. She had a wine glass in one hand, filled with the appropriate amount of a dark red. Cassie was sure she'd never have the money to buy a wine as expensive as this one likely was. Agent Vioto, it's nice to see you again. Anastasia sounded like she truly meant it. Her eyes shifted to Cassie. Who's your friend? This is Cassie Quinn. She's assisting us on the case. May we come in? Anastasia hesitated for a fraction of a second before stepping to the side and letting the pair of them into her apartment. A citrus tang hung in the air, refreshing and clean. The apartment was small and pristine. It was the kind of space that went for a premium in cities like Charlotte, you paid for the convenience and bragging rights, not the square footage. What can I do for you, Agent Vioto? Have you heard about Senator Grayson's current circumstances? That he's been arrested? Oh yes, I'm aware. Vioto gestured to the apartment. I'm surprised you don't have three computers open, six people on hold, and a team of interns working on a way to spin this. Her eyes sparkled. I don't think there's a way to spin this. My sources tell me you have ample evidence on Mr. Grayson. He's not getting out of this one. Cassie caught on quicker than Vioto did. Apex dropped them, didn't they? Smart cookie. She took a sip of wine, and by the look on her face, Grayson's predicament had made it all the sweeter. I don't like to waste my time, and neither does Apex publicity. We're not in the business of backing criminals. Cassie had a retort ready to go, but she bit her tongue. If Manus was right about how dangerous Apex was, it wouldn't do to get on their bad side. Even if Anastasia was no one important, they had to tread carefully. If they got wind that the FBI had an agent sniffing around, there was no telling what they'd do. Your sources, huh? 
Vioto's gears were turning. You wouldn't want to tell you who they are? No, I wouldn't. Anastasia's smile held true delight. Agent Vioto, you know better than that. Do you like working at Apex, Ms. Bolton? I do. She sat down at the table, but didn't offer them a chair. It's a dream job. I've worked with a lot of amazing people, made a lot of money. How much of that money has blood on it? Anastasia paused with her glass halfway to her lips. The wine was the same color as her crimson lipstick. Excuse me? Vioto smiled, but there was a sharpness to it that made Cassie shiver. He wasn't playing games. I asked, how much of the money has blood on it? He didn't wait for Anastasia to answer. I know what Apex really does, Miss Bolton, and I'm not afraid of them, or you. And here Cassie had assumed they were going to be subtle. You should be. Anastasia set her glass down and stood. She wobbled, and for the first time, Cassie saw her as anything but put together. I've seen them ruin careers over less. They're so much bigger than you could ever dream. Do yourself a favor and drop whatever it is you think you're getting yourself into. It sounds like you know much more than Grayson thought. What do you know about his son's murder? The cool professional was back in place. Anastasia smoothed out her skirt and pointed to the door. Get out. Did I say something to upset you? You think you're smart, don't you? A pretty face, a quick wit, and a badge can get you far, but it doesn't make you invincible. A little bit of warmth returned to her eyes. Believe it or not, I like you, Agent Vioto, but you were very dumb. Your partner? He's a bit smarter. He knows not to poke his nose where it doesn't belong. There was a glint of excitement in Vioto's eye now. Is that a threat? I don't threaten people. Anastasia threw her hair over her shoulder. No part of her movement indicated she was anything but stone cold sober. I don't need to, it's not my job. But I will do you the courtesy of warning you. Apex can make your life a living hell. I don't think you deserve that. But if you're not careful, what I think won't matter. Now, she said, ushering them toward the door. I would like you to leave. Cassie filed through the doorway after Vioto, but as she crossed the threshold, she felt Anastasia's tight grip on her arm. And Miss Quinn, that goes for you too. Have a great day. The door shut in Cassie's face before she could decide whether she was grateful for the advice or terrified that she needed it. Chapter 36 Cassie scooted into the passenger seat of Vioto's car and squinted back up at the building in front of them. I have a bad feeling about her. Vioto had his head tipped back and his eyes closed. Is that a psychic thing? A woman thing. She gave him a dirty look he didn't see. Are you sure it was a good idea to press her like that? What if Apex comes after you? I don't think they will. He opened his eyes. I don't have enough information to be a threat. If they come after me, they'll show their hand. Something tells me they're smarter than that. That's a bet you're willing to take? For now. He turned the key in the ignition. We'll see how I feel once we get to the bottom of this case. If we get to the bottom of this case. That gun keeps bothering me, Cassie said. The one that Anthony Lewis said had been confiscated months prior. If Apex is as powerful as Grayson says it is, then they have law enforcement on their payroll. Which means they would have wiped the gun record and used it as evidence in the Grayson case. And if that's true, who knows what else they fabricated. Or compromised. Vioto checked his rearview mirror and pulled out from the curb. How do you feel about going to the scene of the crime? That's usually the best way for me to get insight into a case. But even if I pick up something, it doesn't mean we'll be able to prove what happened. If someone on the force is working for Apex, they might have scrubbed the scene or planted more false evidence. What are they up to? He shook his head and waited until the car came to a complete stop at a red light before he turned to her. 
I get pulling strings and trying to control Washington, but murder is going pretty far. They can afford to buy their way out of a lot of legal trouble, but not murder. Why risk it? World domination? According to Anastasia Bolton, they'd be capable of that. Cassie watched as the light turned green, and they pulled through the intersection. Grayson seems terrified, Manus seems cautious, and Anastasia seems cocky. Even if Apex isn't the big bad they appear to be, they've definitely got a lot of hands and a lot of cookie jaws. Vioto didn't answer. He was looking in the rearview mirror again. Don't look now, but I think we have a tail. Cassie stiffened and resisted the urge to turn around. Seriously? I can't get a good look at them, but they pulled out after us as soon as we left Anastasia's building. They never let more than one car between us. The auto took a right turn. I slowed down for that red light, and they changed lanes so they weren't right behind us. And now they're following again? Yep. What should we do? He took another turn, checked the rearview mirror, eased up on the gas. If we try to lose them, we won't find out who they are. That could end up being even more dangerous down the line. If we head to the crime scene, we might come face to face with them. But I don't like the idea of putting you in danger. If they know I'm involved, I'd feel much better being with you than possibly taking this back home. Crime scene it is then. Vioto kept to the speed limit as they made their way to the parking garage. They'd agreed it would be safer to look for clues there, since the primary focus had been on the alleyway. If the killer had made a mistake, it'd be in or around the car. When they crested the small incline that led to the fifth level, an FBI agent was waiting for them. Vioto raised a hand, and when he got a thumbs up in response, he shifted the car into park, then twisted around and scanned the garage. See anything? Cassie asked. No. He righted himself and popped open the door. If I were them, I'd lie low until we left and start following again. I'm not sure what their intention is, but the fact that they're hanging back tells me they're more interested in observing than intimidating us. Good to know. His smile was reassuring. Catching them on our way out is going to be our best bet. As far as they think, we have no idea they're following us. Or so we hope. He winked. Or so we hope. Cassie followed Vioto under the police tape and up to the side of Connor Grayson's Mercedes. It was a sleek car, obviously expensive, and yet the killer had no interest in stealing it. Vioto must have been thinking the same thing. The window was broken, but nothing was stolen as far as we could tell. Connor's laptop was still inside, and his bag had been dumped into the back seat. Was there anything on the laptop? Anything in his bag? The laptop was clean. Nothing suspicious there, or we would have grabbed Grayson a lot sooner. I think he kept that information on his dad separate from his computer, so it was easier to hide and transport. There was nothing else in his bag. And they never found the car keys, which means the killer probably took them. Probably, but not definitely. He pointed to the driver's side door. Stand over there for a second. She did as she was told. Now what? Pretend you're Connor. I'm the shooter. He mimed holding a gun as he came up to her. If the shooter approached you here, rather than in the alleyway, what would you do? Cassie took in her surroundings. It was an open air parking garage. A cool breeze washed over her, and she could see the city skyline just beyond the wall. I'd want to distract him to escape. If he was after the car keys, I'd throw them, then run in the opposite direction. Which would explain why we never found the keys, but the window was smashed open. Vioto looked at the parking lot around them. But we searched this area, top to the bottom. The keys weren't here. Someone could have taken them. Cassie looked back out at the view. A light bulb went off. Or he threw them where the shooter would never be able to find them. Vioto followed her gaze, and the two of them rushed over to the outside wall of the parking garage. They were on the fifth level, and when Cassie looked straight down, 
Her head swam before she found her legs again. She expected to see straight down to the ground, but instead, she was face to face with metal netting that surrounded the entire building. Whether they were for catching leaves or keeping people from jumping, she didn't know. It didn't matter. A pair of car keys for a Mercedes Benz hung from one of the rods. Vioto had spotted it too. That has to be a one in a million chance. Connor must have thrown the keys and run. The shooter figured they were gone, so he went after Connor instead. Give me a hand. Vioto didn't wait for Cassie to reply. He hauled himself up onto the railing and leaned as far over as possible to grab the keys. She grabbed onto his belt to keep him from tipping over, and a few seconds later, he was holding up the keys with a huge grin on his face. Now we know the killer didn't have the keys. He pulled out a plastic bag and dropped them inside. After he killed Connor, the shooter must have come back. He broke the car window, then searched through the bag. What about the car alarm? Fioto shrugged. Depends on when he went through the car. If no one was around, he'd have enough time to search the car and leave. He was looking for the evidence against Senator Grayson. Probably found it, too. Vioto tucked the keys into his pocket. He thought he had the only copy. He didn't know Connor had also given one to his ex-girlfriend. Until we figured it out. But if the whole point of this was to keep that information out of the media's hands, then he failed. Everyone will know soon enough. And if Apex wants to, they could hang him out to dry. He's gotta keep his head down. Vioto looked around like the garage held all the answers. If he can get away with murder, he's fine. And so is Apex. But if he gets caught, he has a choice. Keep his mouth shut and earn Apex respect, or snitch and try to get immunity. Which do you think he'll choose? Depends on the kind of killer he is. Vioto shook his head. And we just don't have enough on him yet. Cassie paced the area next to the car. We know he killed Connor execution style while he was begging for his life. He had no remorse and didn't even hesitate to pull the trigger. We also know he's smart enough to get away with murder. There was no evidence left behind, no witnesses, and a suspect in custody in under 24 hours. Even if the shooter isn't a cop, he knows someone who could have helped him get away with it. Vioto shook his head, and Cassie could see the anger in his eyes. God. Damn it. Who would have had access to the gun? Who could wipe any record of it? Either someone with a lot of clout or someone with a lot of money. He put his hands on his hips. If Apex has infiltrated the local police department, it could be multiple people. Cassie nodded. Compartmentalize. Each person completes a single step, independent of everyone else. And all of a sudden, you've covered up a murder and half of them don't even know it. There has to be a point person, and that person is most likely the killer. An engine revved somewhere on the other side of the Mercedes. Vioto and Cassie peered over the top of the car and saw Detective Davenport pull up to the FBI agent and exchange words. The detective waved them over. That's the car that followed us here. Vioto shook his head in confusion. I'm sure of it. They approached. Davenport was staring at Cassie. Been looking for you. Me? She looked up at Vioto, then back to the detective. Why? You were right about Lewis. We got him on video across town. There's no way he could have done it. Davenport sighed. You might turn me into a believer after all, Miss Quinn. It always felt good to be appreciated. Glad I could help. I'm hoping you'll do us one more favor. Davenport pulled out a cigarette and stuck it between his lips. The wind carried the click of the lighter. He puffed, then nodded. Now that Lewis is off the hook, I'm getting pressure to close the case. I already screwed up once. Don't plan on doing it a second time. How can I help? Cassie asked. I've got a witness who says they can prove Grayson killed his son. I'm on my way to talk to her right now. He gestured to Cassie with the tip of his cigarette. Truth is, I don't have a good feeling about this. I'd like a little backup of the psychic variety.
Cassie and Vioto exchanged another look. When she shrugged, Vioto nodded to Davenport. Lead the way. Chapter 37 Vioto followed Davenport out of the city until they reached a house at the end of a gravel driveway, surrounded by a grove of pine trees. It was a modest home with two floors. He pulled to a stop behind the detective. No car, Vioto noted. Maybe no one's home. Look, Cassie pointed out the windshield. The door to the house was wide open. Something's wrong. Stay here. Vioto unbuckled his seatbelt, pushed the door open as quietly as he could, and stayed low as he crept along the car and over to Davenport. By that point, Cassie could see they both had their guns out. After a few words passed between them, Vioto led the way up the steps, onto the porch, and through the door. Cassie wasn't sure what to do. Last time she was in a position like this, she had ignored Harris's warning to stay in the car and ended up in the middle of a shootout. Thankfully, this time there were two people on her side. But what did this mean for their witness? Who were they, and why did they have something on Grayson? She didn't think the senator had killed his own child, but she knew Apex would stop at nothing to paint the narrative they wanted everyone to believe. Maybe this was part of their plan. Two minutes passed. She considered pulling out her phone and calling the police. She didn't want to spook the witness if the person was inside, but it would be better to do that than be the reason they ended up dead. Before Cassie could even bring up the dial pad, however, a figure stepped out through the doorway. It took her a moment to see past the sun's glare and spot Davenport's face. He was waving her inside. Cassie let go of the breath she'd been holding. Even though he'd signaled everything was okay, she made sure not to slam her door. Was someone inside? Were they still alive? She hoped she wasn't about to walk into yet another murder scene. As Cassie followed Davenport inside, she didn't get a bad read off the house. In fact, it felt as clean and empty as Anastasia's apartment building. The house might not have been new, but she got a sense someone hadn't been living in it for quite some time. The minute Cassie passed Davenport, her suspicion solidified. She felt the barrel of a gun press against the small of her back. She froze, knowing it was the detective. Don't move. She raised her arms. What's going on? Walk forward, slowly. His breathing was ragged. She hadn't noticed that before. No sudden movements, or you'll end up like him. What did you do? Cassie shuffled her feet, inching her way through the living room and into the kitchen. The house was furnished, but it didn't feel lived in. Where's Vioto? Davenport pushed the gun deeper into her back. Move. Cassie rounded the corner into the kitchen. Vioto slumped against the wall with his hands tied in front of him. There was a trickle of blood coming from his temple. Disregarding Davenport's instructions, she rushed forward and cradled Vioto's head in her hands. He slowly blinked open his eyes. He's fine. Davenport was pacing, but he still had his gun trained on them. I just knocked him out for a second. Where's the witness? He laughed. There is no witness. I own this house. My mother left it to me when she died. Always planned on fixing it up to sell, but I guess that's not going to happen now. Cassie's gaze flicked around the kitchen. Now she could see how dusty it was. No one had been inside for quite some time, which also meant, you won't find anything. Davenport gestured around the room with his gun. Weapons, I mean, don't bother. What do you want? Now that's the first smart question you've asked so far. Davenport clenched his jaw. Let's make sure Agent Vioto is paying attention before I answer it. Cassie turned back to Vioto. His eyes were sharper now. He strained against the ropes that bound his hands, but they were too tight. He wouldn't have a chance to get out of them unless Cassie could figure out a way to cut them without Davenport noticing. Let Cassie go. Vioto's voice was strong, and it made her feel safe. This is between you and me. Actually, 
It's between me and her. Davenport locked his sights on Cassie. If it wasn't for her, Anthony Lewis would go down for Connor Grayson's murder, and the senator wouldn't be sitting in a holding cell. Are you working for him? Cassie asked. No. Davenport sounded like he could spit nails. The man's an idiot. He might have his good looks and his connections, but Apex has been playing him like a fiddle for years. Cassie's eyes widened. You work for Apex. Not anymore. Davenport took a step forward, and Cassie pressed her body against the wall. Thanks to you. She knew no one was coming to get them, but she had to keep Davenport talking. If she wasted enough time, maybe an opportunity would present itself. What do you mean? I mean, you fucked everything up. Spittle flew from his mouth, and he waved the gun around like it was nothing, like it couldn't end her life with the lightest touch of his finger. Lewis would go down for the murder, Grayson would stay out of jail. I'd get a promotion. It was foolproof, except I didn't think I'd be dealing with a psychic. I'm not one to believe in that horse shit, but there's no other way you could have known Lewis didn't pull the trigger. It was you. Cassie ground her teeth together. You killed Connor to protect Grayson, but you didn't do it for the senator. You did it for Apex. If they lost their champion, they'd have to back another horse. That takes a lot of resources. They've got resources, Davenport shook his head. What they don't have is time. They'd have to find someone else to groom for the presidency. Cassie's stomach churned. They must be pretty mad at you. Oh, they are. Davenport's eyes were wild. There was still spittle on his chin. Apex doesn't offer second chances, and I have you to thank for that. Blame me, Vioto said. I'm the one who wanted her on the case. How about I blame both of you? So what, you are going to kill us? Cassie was scared and angry and tired of being at the wrong end of the barrel. How's that going to make anything better? Then you'll go down for three murders instead of just one. I'm aware of the odds, sweetheart. Thank you. Davenport sneered at her, but he lowered his weapon. Luckily for you, I'm willing to negotiate. A floorboard creaked, and a figure appeared behind Davenport. The detective whipped around, but he couldn't raise his gun fast enough. One minute he was standing, and the next, he was laying prone on the ground, with Manus pointing a gun at his head. Chapter 38 Cassie scrambled to untie Vioto, who immediately retrieved his gun from the next room where it must have landed when Davenport had disarmed him. Now the detective had two guns pointed at his face. He didn't dare move a muscle. Been following this asshole for hours. He tailed you from Bolton's apartment building to the crime scene. Color me shocked when I saw him go right up to you two and invite you to follow him here. Saw the tail, didn't know it was him. Vioto glared at Davenport. Said he had a witness he wanted to check out. Technically, I did- Shut up. Vioto clenched his jaw. You won't get a warm welcome when we take you in. Wait. Davenport finally looked worried. You can't take me back there. They'll kill me. Manus holstered his gun and retrieved Davenport's, unloaded it, and tucked it away. What do you propose? Vioto refused to look away from the man on the ground. You've got to be kidding me. He said he's willing to negotiate. We've got nothing on Apex. Let's hear what he has to say. If it's good enough, we take him home with us. If it's not, Manus shrugged. We let his friends deal with him. Vioto backed up, but didn't lower his weapon. Davenport sat up and scooted back against the wall. He kept his hands visible the entire time. I want immunity. The room was silent for a full 10 seconds before Vioto tipped his head back and laughed. Even Manus chuckled. The two agents looked at each other and shook their heads. Vioto made a show of wiping away a tear. I didn't know you were this funny, Davenport. I'm not joking. He leaned forward. His eyes were wild. I turn on Apex. You get me immunity. Manus crossed his arms. You know how this works. You need to get us solid information on Apex, something we can convict someone with. 
something bigger than your murder charge. Then we can talk about immunity. Even if you hadn't assaulted me, held Cassie at gunpoint, and confessed, what do you want to bet we'd have enough to convict you? Apex will let you rot in prison if they don't send someone to kill you first. All that security footage that was missing? All those records someone wiped clean? I'm sure they'll show up sooner rather than later. Don't you think I understand that? Davenport threw up his arms. I'm not stupid. I know what kind of shit I'm in here. I'm trying to stay alive. Be in witness protection. I don't care if one of you watches me wipe my ass every day for the rest of my life. I just want to be alive to do it. He looked at Manus. You know what Apex is capable of. You understand what they can do. Help me. Manus shrugged his shoulders. Give me something I can work with. Davenport licked his lips like he was thirsty for the chance to prove himself. Cassie hadn't seen him so desperate. I can give you every corrupt officer in the precinct. I can give you the names of at least five of them who are on Apex's payroll. Anastasia Bolton? She's a lot more important than you think she is. She's in charge of some of Apex's biggest clients. Grayson was supposed to be the next president of the United States. They don't let just anyone take on a client like that. Did Bolton order you to kill Connor Grayson? Davenport chuckled, but he had that same desperation in his eyes. I have no idea who ordered me to do it. It came through anonymously. Then how did you know it was them? Trust me, I know. Start at the beginning. Viotto's voice was still short, but he sounded invested now. How did you even get involved with them? One of my colleagues approached me. Thought I'd be good for a job they had lined up. What kind of job? Security for one of their clients. Some celebrity. A singer. I can't remember her name. I don't listen to that crap. That's it? Just security? Viotto sounded as doubtful as Cassie felt. Just security. Got a few more jobs like that. It paid good money. I had an inkling I was being felt out, and I was right. A couple months later, they asked for something bigger, and a little less legal. Like what? I'm not going to tell you that. Maybe when I get a little more insurance that you'll give me what I want. Manus held up a hand when Viotto protested. That's fine. This illegal job, how did that go? Went off without a hitch. No problems. They were trusting me more and more, but I knew there were bigger jobs out there. I kept asking my buddy if they had anything else. He told me to be patient. Did you ever come into contact with anyone other than your buddy? Anyone you can tie back to Apex? One person, huge guy, didn't talk much. I didn't get a name, but I could spot him in a lineup, no problem. We'd need to know who he was to put him in a lineup, Theodo said. What about Bolton? Manus asked. Did you have a working relationship with her? Only once I got the Grayson job. How did that go down? A courier handed me a letter. It had specific instructions. I followed them. Could you identify the courier? He was a nobody, not involved. How do you know? I just do. Davenport rolled his eyes. Apex is smart. They won't get caught up on details. The courier won't be someone they employ. There won't be a return address on the envelope. They'll send it out of a random city so it's not tied back to anyone specific. This is the big leagues, guys. You won't catch them on a technicality. Do you still have the letter? Obviously not. Do you have anything? Theodo's gun never wavered, but Cassie could tell he was getting antsy. Can you prove Apex told you to kill Connor Grayson? Can you prove Apex is anything more than a top-tier publicity company? That's your job, not mine. But I have a name that will be of particular interest to you. We're listening. My buddy let it slip that he'd done a job for this particular individual. I didn't believe him at first. Didn't think Apex was that bold. But now I know better. Are you gonna make us guess? Mana sounded tired. Because we might be here for a while. Davenport let the silence hang in the air for a moment. Ashcroft. Stanley Ashcroft. Cassie didn't know the name, but Manus and Viotto exchanged a look. Who's that? She asked. Davenport was first to answer. 
the director of the FBI. What makes you think we'd believe this? Theodo asked. How do we know you're not here on Apex's orders, trying to get us to chase our tails? Davenport threw his head back and laughed. Now you're thinking like Apex. Now you're getting it. I can't prove that he was there or how much he's involved, but a machine this large is an idiot proof. Rome got too big for its britches, and so will Apex. Someone just needs to be brave enough to catch them unawares. Then they'll fall to pieces. Chapter 39 Cassie was still trying to process what Davenport said and what it all meant when Manus cuffed him and put him in the back seat of his car. Cassie and the two agents stepped under the shade of a tree far enough away that the detective wouldn't be able to hear them, but close enough so they could keep an eye on him. Manus put his hands on his hips and stared into the back seat of his car like he could will himself to turn into a telepath. I'm not sure if I believe Davenport, but given how far Apex has reached, it wouldn't come as too much of a surprise. I get Apex wanting to have influence over the FBI, Cassie said, but why would someone like the director need them on his side? Lots of reasons. Political motivation, connections, advice on how to deal with the public, greed. He shook his head. Ashcroft is good at his job, very effective, but he's only human. We all are. We have faults like anyone else. Vioto stared at his partner, looking like he was choosing his words carefully. You seem to know a lot about Apex. Mana smirked. Not the first time I've heard of them. Cassie pointed to Vioto. You warned him about them before he went digging. I think you know a lot more than you're letting on. I've been aware of Apex for about a decade. When Vioto's eyes grew wide, Manus held up a hand. I don't think the company started out with any ill intent. The people involved at the top of the organization were already experts in their fields. They gained traction quickly, found some good clientele, and it took off. It happens all the time, Cassie said, but not all of them turn into this. You're right. I don't know when or why Apex crossed that line, but they did. I imagine the more they got away with, the more they took risks. It's not like this is the first time something like this happened. As long as there are laws, there are those willing to break them, and those who get away with it. Apex is just the next generation of criminal. So what are you going to do about it? Cassie asked. Manus chuckled. Nothing. Vioto looked affronted. How can you say that? What about Davenport's confession? Manus shook his head. This is not the kind of situation you want to jump into without the full picture. You said you've known about them for at least a decade. You don't have a full picture yet? That should tell you everything you need to know about them. Manus took a step toward Vioto, lowered his voice. Don't be stupid, Chris. These guys are a lot smarter than you and have a lot more resources. If they have the director of the FBI in their pocket, you think you can take them down by yourself? Just by taking Davenport's confession, we're gonna be in hot water. The smartest thing we can do is gather evidence, do our job, and if they tell us to walk away, we walk away. How can you say that? Vioto looked more hurt than angry. They're willing to pull strings in Washington, they're willing to get away with murder. I doubt Connor Grayson is the only person they've had killed. You're right. Manus put a hand on Vioto's shoulder. I'm not saying give up on it. But if we're not smart about how we tackle this, about who we can trust, then we're all screwed. They'll either put you in the basement for the rest of your career, or you'll wind up like Connor. The blood drained from Cassie's face. Am I in danger? Manis's smile didn't offer the reassurance she was looking for. Yes and no. You're definitely on their radar now. He looked to Vioto, and so are you. Your name is being added to some list on someone's desk as we speak. You gotta keep your head down and be smart. What about me? Cassie asked. Your name would be on a different sort of list. I'm not sure if they believe in your abilities, but you blew this case wide open. If it weren't for you, Anthony Lewis would be in prison right now. 
They're gonna keep an eye on you, maybe try to recruit you. Word of advice, don't believe anything they tell you. Great, Cassie had trouble swallowing, as if I don't have enough to deal with. You and me both. He looked at his watch, then held out his hand. It was a pleasure to meet you, Ms. Quinn. I'm looking forward to adding my own note to your file. She returned the gesture. I appreciate that, Agent Manis. Thank you. Vioto turned to his partner. I'll drop her off at her car and meet you later. They both watched as Manis got in his car, started the engine, and drove away. What's going to happen to him? Cassie asked. Davenport, I mean. Who knows? We can't turn him over to the locals, but I have a feeling Ashford won't let us hold on to him for long. This is where I enjoy the fact that Manus is the senior agent. Cassie laughed. I don't envy you. I don't have it so bad. Theodo still had a trickle of blood on his temple. It's a good job. You get to meet a lot of interesting people. Cassie blushed as she followed Vioto to his car. They kept it light on the ride back. Cassie told him about some of her favorite eateries in Savannah, in case the FBI ever sent them there on a case. He told her all about Portland, and by the time he'd parked, she was ready to book a flight right then and there. There was a charge inside the car with all the things they'd left unsaid. Their eyes met, and they both burst into laughter. Vioto shook his head. It's crazy. What is? You. Gee, thanks. No, he laughed again. I mean, this is crazy. He gestured between them. I don't trust people. Comes with the territory, obviously. But I trust you. It's a nice feeling. I agree. Cassie was looking anywhere but at him. Unfortunately, I think our time here is done. It is. He didn't sound sad, and the grin on his face surprised her. But I don't think this is the last we'll be seeing of each other. No? She couldn't help but grin back. Are you the psychic now? Maybe. You might be rubbing off on me. She tipped her head back and laughed. I don't think that's how it works. His smile disappeared, but his eyes remained bright. I'm glad you asked me out on that date. Miss Quinn. She rolled her eyes. It wasn't a date, Agent Vioto. But maybe next time? I can take a next time. Cassie knew if she didn't say goodbye now, something more might happen between them. As welcome as that thought was, she had to take care of a few loose ends first. She hooked her fingers around the door handle. Don't lose my number, okay? His eyes sparkled. That's a promise I can keep. Chapter 40 Cassie walked through the door of her parents' house to the smell of some sort of roast in the oven. Her mouth watered. After she hung up her jacket and dumped her purse on the floor, she found her family gathered around the television in the living room. Her sister and father were on the couch and her mom in the recliner, she had a quilt draped over her legs, and Cassie was happy to see she looked back to normal. Lawrence Grayson posted his million dollar bail, but authorities are keeping the former North Carolina state senator on a short leash, urging him to stay close to home until proceedings commence. Grayson has not made any further public statements following the death of his son and his own arrest, but his former publicist, Anastasia Bolton from Apex Publicity, posted a short statement online about an hour ago. Anastasia's face filled the screen. She sat on the couch in her apartment, and Cassie could imagine a glass of wine sitting on the table out of the frame. The words were delivered in a voice of compassion, but Cassie didn't feel any genuine emotion in them. Her eyes stayed dark. Apex publicity is sad to part ways with Senator Grayson, particularly during such a difficult time, but we have a no-tolerance policy for criminal activities. I have worked closely with Mr. Grayson for the past year or so, and I am truly shocked and hurt by his actions. I considered him a colleague and a friend. I wish him the best moving forward and hope the consequences of his actions teach him he cannot win by cutting corners. 
Cassie snorted. She couldn't imagine Anastasia having friends. Colleagues, maybe. Lackeys, definitely. But not friends. The news anchor's voice filled the room again. In shocking news, Detective Calvin Davenport has been charged with the murder of Connor Grayson. We'll bring you updates as the story develops. Judy turned the volume down and looked up at Cassie. Do you know anything about that? Cassie's first instinct was to bristle and lie and be vague in her answer. But she reminded herself that she was past that now. No more secrets from her family. Yes, I was there when they arrested him. Almost no more secrets. She wasn't going to tell her mom Davenport had held her at gunpoint. Why did he do it? Judy's voice cracked. Why did he kill that poor kid? And the senator? This is all too much. Cassie sat down between her sister and her dad. It's complicated. We don't have all the answers yet, but it involves apex publicity. They're not as innocent as they'd like to appear, but I'm not sure the FBI will be able to pin anything on them. They're very smart and very rich. Her dad grunted like he wasn't surprised. Judy tossed the blanket aside and stood at the front of the room, facing them. Now that we're all here, I want to say a few things. Cassie and Laura exchanged looks. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. This is more about me. Judy took a deep breath. I want to apologize to all of you. I haven't been myself lately. When I found out about the brain tumor, I hid it from your father for about a week. I was scared, and even though I knew not talking about it wouldn't make it go away, it made it feel more real to say it out loud. So I didn't. Then it was real, and I didn't want you girls to know because I didn't want you to worry. I was afraid of what it would change. She looked directly at Cassie now. It hasn't been easy not talking these last few years, but I think I'd gotten used to it. I knew if you learned about the tumor, you'd want to visit, and I wasn't sure how to handle that. I was afraid to face the pain I was feeling. It was easier to just ignore it and pretend everything was okay. Cassie wiped a tear from her eye. She knew it was the truth, but it didn't make it any easier to hear. I'm sorry. Thank you for saying that. Judy didn't break eye contact. I'm sorry, too. I'm still nervous about the surgery. I'm afraid I might not wake up. And I want to make sure I tell you all how much I love you. Your father and I have everything set if something happens to either of us. Mom, Laura started. Judy held up her hand. I know it's uncomfortable to talk about, but we need to make sure you girls understand what to do. We have all the paperwork in the upstairs filing cabinet. Money has been set aside for both of you. You'll share the house. But it's all just a precaution. Walter looked at his wife, and Cassie saw the confidence in his eyes. The surgery will be fine. We're living forever. And if we don't, then we're going to haunt you so you can never get rid of us. Cassie swallowed. She saw Laura shoot her a look. Judy didn't miss it. What? Cassie stood and gestured for her mom to take her place on the couch. I have something I want to talk to you about, too, and I want to start off with an apology. Cassie had practiced this speech in her head hundreds of times over the years, and somehow she still struggled to find the words to express how she was really feeling. This trip home had been an emotional roller coaster, but she felt closer to her family in this moment than she'd felt since she was a kid. Even if things weren't perfect, they were okay. And she was starting to realize that was good enough. There are a lot of different reasons why I pushed you guys away after Novak's attack. I didn't want to be coddled or smothered or made to feel weak. You didn't do that on purpose, but I was so afraid all the time after that. I needed to be strong, and doing everything on my own was the only way I could figure out how to feel that way again. She looked directly at her mom. You and I have butted heads a lot over the years. There have been a lot of hard feelings between us. You wanted to help, 
and I pushed you away. I needed space, and you kept pushing. I think we both said and did things we regret, and I hope you can forgive me for staying away all these years. This trip proved to me that there's still a lot to talk about when it comes to what happened back then and what's been going on over the years. I'm ready to own my part in this and work on being a family again. I hope you are too. Of course we are. Judy's voice was soft. She looked at her husband. We both want that. We love you, Walter said. Both of you. Cassie looked at Laura and smiled. Her sister knew what was coming next and nodded. Cassie had trouble looking her parents in the eyes, so she looked at the wall above their heads. There's something else I want to talk to you about. It might be kind of hard for you to take in. I'd like it if you just heard me out and kept your minds open. Her parents exchanged a look. Her mother spoke first. Is everything okay? Cassie met her eyes. It is. Even just a year ago, that would have been difficult for me to say. But it really is. We're proud of you, her father said. Cassie went back to looking at the wall. She took a deep breath. This was it. No turning back now. One of the main reasons I pushed you all away after that first attack was because I started seeing things. I'm not sure how much you were aware of back then, how much I may have talked about it when I was heavily medicated, but everything changed after I almost died. She cleared her throat. There was no easing them into this. I started seeing ghosts, all the time, everywhere. The visions and the psychic feelings came later. Cassie forced herself to look her parents in the eyes. Did they believe her? Did they think she was crazy? Were they going to call someone to have her committed? She rushed on, hoping she could get out as much as she could before they carted her away. It sounds crazy. I thought I was crazy at first, too. But they're real. I've helped a lot of people because of my abilities, solved a lot of cases. She swallowed hard. When Connor died, Mom, I had a vision. I saw the person who shot him. I knew it wasn't Anthony Lewis. Because of that, I was able to help the FBI figure out that it was Detective Davenport. Judy lifted a hand to her mouth. Walter's mouth was slack. He looked at Laura. Did you know about this? About the vision? Yeah, Cassie told me right after she got it. Laura held her father's gaze. About her abilities, I only learned recently too. When I was in Savannah, right before we came here, I helped her solve a murder and a 20-year-old cold case. It's real, Dad. All of it. Whatever Cassie had expected her mother to say next, she wasn't prepared for it. You were always special. Judy lowered her hand. You were always playing with imaginary friends, talking with people who weren't there. You knew things you shouldn't have known. It scared me. I didn't know what it all meant. Cassie tried to keep the emotion out of her voice. I'm sorry. Judy shook her head. You have nothing to apologize for. I just didn't understand. I thought something was wrong, that I did something wrong. And after Sarah went missing, things got worse. We went to that psychologist and soon, it just all went away. I repressed a lot of memories from back then, and I think my abilities went with them. Cassie took out the duplicate of the photograph she'd given to Vioto and handed it to her mother. My abilities came back after the attack. I think they got stronger, but the memories didn't start resurfacing until I heard the name Sarah Lennox again. Going through my stuff from when I was a kid helped a lot, after you told me that story about that woman in the woods, Laura and I found her camera in a box upstairs. This picture was on the undeveloped film when we had it processed. Do you recognize her? Judy studied the face. No, I don't think so. She handed it to Walter, but he shook his head. He gave it back to Cassie. Judy took a minute to compose herself. Does it hurt you? 
seeing the things you see? Sometimes. She wanted to be honest, even if she didn't have the answer her mom was hoping for. But mostly it's worth it. I enjoy helping people. It makes me happy. Walter stood. I won't pretend I understand, but I have to say it explains a lot of what we experienced when you were a kid. And as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. Cassie looked at her mom and saw tears rolling down her face, but she smiled through them. Cassie opened her arms and her parents hugged her. Laura ducked through the forest of arms and wrapped herself around Cassie. They still had a long way to go, but this was a good first step. Chapter 41 Cassie pulled the car into a parking spot at the Savannah Airport and turned to her sister. Ready? To go back to work? No. She stretched and several joints popped. To go back to California and sunshine and far fewer murders, definitely. Sorry about the murders, Cassie smirked. Occupational hazard. Laura pulled out her phone. Mom's calling. She put it on speaker. Hi, girls. It was their dad. You make it okay? Just pulled in at the airport, Cassie said. How's mom? She's right here. There was a rustling of the phone, and then her mom's voice was there. So close to the speaker, it was slightly distorted. Hi, how was the trip? It was good. Laura was smiling. How are you feeling? Pretty good. Exhausted. She sounded like she could sleep for a month and still want to take another nap. They've got some good drugs here. Can't feel a thing. That's good. The sisters had stayed through the surgery and got to say hi to her afterwards. Then they went home with their father, had a good dinner, and went to sleep. They were on the road by the time the sun had crested the horizon. I'm sure you'll feel pretty good for a while. Yeah, how was the trip? Cassie giggled. It was good, thanks for asking again. Laura laughed. Hey, I gotta catch my plane. Don't get into any trouble while I'm in the air. No promises. There was more rustling, and Walter took the phone back. Be careful, okay? Call us when you land. I will. Love you guys. Love you too, both of you. Stay safe. The girls answered in unison. Bye. Laura tucked her phone away. I do have to get going, though. Are you sure you don't want me to take you to the drop-off area? No, no. I need the walk to dry the tears. Her voice caught. I'm really glad I came, Cassie. Me too. Cassie felt tears pricking her eyes. Thank you for everything. Maybe I can visit you soon? Yes, you have to. As soon as you get some more vacation time, okay? Okay. Cassie leaned forward and wrapped her sister in a tight hug. I love you. I love you too. She cleared her throat. Is he still here? Cassie looked in the back seat. Sebastian was sitting there, tucked between suitcases, waiting patiently. Yeah, he's still here. Laura turned to the back seat. She blushed. Thank you, Sebastian, for your help, for Sarah, and for Cassie. She turned back to her sister. Do you think he understood? Sebastian was looking directly at Laura. He didn't smile, but his glow seemed a little brighter. Yeah, I think he understood. Good. She unbuckled her seatbelt and popped open her door, but she didn't get out yet. You think you're ready to talk to her? Cassie took a deep breath. Yesterday, Agent Vioto had texted her a name. Sherry Miller, as in Ethan Miller's mother. After the death of her son, she couldn't hold down a job. She had no other kids, but she used to hang around schools and parks, watching them. The community knew who she was, what had happened to her, but police got complaints regardless. Her record showed she was in and out of mental hospitals from that point on. Cassie understood why. She'd lost her child, her world. She was never the same again.
Vioto had given her Sherry's last known address. Orchard Hills in Savannah, Georgia. It was a long-term mental care facility. He couldn't promise what kind of mental state she was in, but it didn't matter. Cassie would pay her a visit. Not really. She didn't think she'd ever be ready to talk to her, but she didn't have many other options at this point. I hope she can point me in the right direction. Call me tonight, okay? I should be settled in by then. Text me when you land. Laura grabbed her suitcase out of the back. She didn't look back as she walked toward the airport. Cassie was glad. Tears were falling down her cheeks now. This was the happiest, most fulfilled she'd felt in a while. But that made the pain of separation hurt that much more. If Laura turned back now, Cassie was afraid she'd never let her go. Instead, she looked in the rearview mirror. Sebastian was staring back at her. You ready? He didn't answer, but Cassie knew he was. As soon as they had crossed back into Georgia, he'd appeared in the back seat. He knew Cassie's next stop after the airport was Orchard Hills, the psychiatric ward where Sherry Miller was living out the rest of her days. It wasn't far from the airport, and Cassie was walking up to the front of the building within 20 minutes. Her palms were sweaty, but she didn't hesitate to pull the door open and walk right up to the front desk. She was so close to the truth, she could reach out and touch it. The older woman behind the desk smiled as she looked up at her. Good morning. What can I do for you today? I'm here to visit Sherry Miller. Are you a member of her family? No. This was the part Cassie wasn't sure would work. I knew her when I was a little girl. It's been a long time since I've seen her, and I was hoping I could talk to her. The woman's smile was sad. Ms. Miller isn't in the best of health, dear. There's a good chance she won't remember you. I figured there was a chance of that. Would it be okay if I tried? Let me go see how she's feeling today first, okay? Cassie nodded and watched as the woman disappeared through a set of double doors. Five minutes later, she returned with a smile on her face. I can take you back to her. Thank you so much. Cassie's heart fluttered at the same time her stomach dropped. Could you tell me a bit of what she's like these days? She's quiet. The woman held the door open for her. But she'll get talking when she wants to. She's heavily medicated, so she suffers from a little brain fog. She's had a rough life. I'm aware of her arrest record. Is she ever violent? Oh no, not at all. She gets frustrated some days, but she couldn't hurt a fly. She spends most of her days in bed or sitting in front of the window in a wheelchair, watching the birds in the trees. Is her memory okay? Sometimes. They reached the end of the hall and entered a recreation room. It had a few chairs, a couple couches, and several TVs. She's better at remembering the past than she is recent events, so you might have some luck. Thank you. Cassie spotted a woman in a wheelchair by the window. Is that her? Yes, ma'am. We have some orderlies wandering around here. Just grab one of them if you need anything, okay? Cassie nodded and watched as the woman retreated through the double doors. Cassie's feet stuck to the ground. From here, Sherry Miller looked like someone's sweet grandmother with her short, curly gray hair, her large glasses, and the two blankets that covered her legs. A large sweatshirt hit her frame. As much as she tried, Cassie couldn't convince herself this woman and the monster she saw in the woods were the same person. She knew a little of what Sherry had done in the time between then and now, but there were so many unanswered questions. She knew she was tied to Sebastian, that Sebastian was tied to Sarah, and that Sarah was tied to the man who'd been arrested for a singular kidnapping, despite being a suspect in multiple cases. Cassie approached the older woman. When she looked up, Cassie saw just enough light in her eyes to determine that perhaps today was one of her good days. She sat down in a chair next to her. Sherry Miller? Yes. The woman looked at Cassie for a few seconds. 
Who are you? My name is Cassie Quinn. She took a deep breath. I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions. Chapter 42 The woman stared at Cassie for a full minute. Who are you? I met you once, a long time ago. I was just a little girl. Oh. She looked down at her lap. Did I hurt you? In all the scenarios Cassie had gone through in her head, she'd never envisioned the woman would have volunteered the information she was looking for. She opened the voice app on her phone and hit record. No, you didn't hurt me. She didn't want to push the woman too far, too fast. But I think you might have known a friend of mine. The woman stayed silent, but she didn't turn away. Cassie took that as an opportunity to pull up a picture on her phone. She had several to choose from, but she figured Sebastian's would cause the biggest reaction. Sherry cradled the phone. She touched a finger to Sebastian's face. Ethan, she muttered. This is Sebastian Thomas, Cassie corrected. Do you remember him? He looks just like my son. I read about your son. I'm sorry about what happened to him. Sherry looked up. A tear rolled down her face. It was an accident. I didn't mean to. I just turned my back for a minute. I know. Cassie pointed to the picture. Sebastian looked just like Ethan. I couldn't stop staring at him. I thought Ethan had come back to life. Where did you first see Sebastian? Sherry wiped her tear away and handed the phone back to Cassie. She looked out the window, and after a moment of silence, Cassie wasn't sure if she would get an answer. Had she come this far only to hit a dead end? She couldn't make Sherry Miller talk to her, no matter how many questions she asked. In the park. Sherry's voice was shaky. I didn't have anywhere to go, so I used to walk a lot. I saw him in the park. He was there almost every day. I used to watch him. Did he ever come up to you? Did you ever try talking to him? Once. Sherry kept looking out the window. Cassie could just make out her expression in the glass's reflection. She looked wistful. He was playing with his ball, and it went rolling into the grass. I walked up to him and said hi. I asked if his name was Ethan. He said no. I asked him how old he was. Then I asked him if he wanted some ice cream. What did he say? He asked if Miss Paula could have some too. I told him yes, that we would go get it and bring it back to her. Cassie's heart was pounding. Had anyone ever heard this story before? Did anyone know the details except Sherry Miller and Sebastian Thomas? Even Miss Paula, most likely Sebastian's babysitter, didn't know what had happened to him, and she had been there. Did he go with you to get the ice cream? Sherry nodded her head. I brought him home with me. I had a lot of ice cream. I let him eat as much as he wanted. He kept asking to go back to Miss Paula, but I told him I had called her. I said she wanted him to stay with me for a while. With every question, Cassie was sure Sherry would wake up from her memories and decide to stop sharing her story. But Cassie was compelled to keep asking. She needed the truth. How long did he stay with you? After a few days, I couldn't get him to eat. He kept crying and asking for his mommy. I tried to tell him I was his mommy, but he would cry harder. Sherry wrung her hands. I crushed up pills in his applesauce. What kind of pills? The doctors had given them to me to make me calm. I used to give him half, and he'd fall asleep. It'd give me a little peace and quiet. I never meant to hurt him. Cassie figured the pills must have been sedatives, but even half of one meant for an adult, 
would knock a nine-year-old out for more than just a couple of hours. Did Sebastian never get to see his mom again? Cassie knew the answer, but she wanted to hear what Sherry had to say. Once he found out what I'd done, he wouldn't let me. Once who found out? Sherry's mood shifted. A slight tremor coursed through her body, and she looked away from the window like the sun was too much for her to bear. Cassie desperately wanted to force the woman to look at her, to tell her what she knew, but she tamped down on the urge. She barely allowed herself to breathe while she waited to hear what came next. Hank, he could be the sweetest man, or he could be the devil himself. Cassie pulled up another picture on her phone. She held it out for Sherry. Is this him? Sherry looked at the phone, then looked down at her lap. She couldn't stand the sight of him. Yes. Henry Hank Fitzpatrick had been the man convicted of kidnapping and killing one child. He had been tied to many more disappearances, including Sarah's, but there hadn't been enough evidence. A shiver went down Cassie's spine. They had always suspected he had a partner. Was she talking to that very person right now? Tell me more about Hank. I don't want to. It came out like a whisper. I don't want to. Cassie scooted her chair a little closer. Did he hurt you? The woman nodded. Cassie knew this woman had been involved in Sebastian's death. And Sarah's. And countless others. She may have been as bad or worse than Henry, but right now, she was just a little old woman at the end of her days. Cassie felt anger and empathy warring inside her. He can't hurt you anymore. She waited until Sherry looked at her. He's in jail right now. Do you understand? She nodded. Can you tell me about him? How did you meet? He was a... Friend of a friend. Was this before or after Ethan died? After. She wiped another tear away. He used to be the only thing that kept me going. He worked in an adoption agency years ago and said he knew all kinds of people who had lost their kids. People who had adopted a child and felt whole again. He said he would help me. Were you involved with each other? She nodded again. Not at first, but he was so sweet, and he promised me. He promised me. When she broke off and a sob escaped her mouth, Cassie pulled a tissue from a nearby table and handed it to her. She waited until the woman blew her nose to look around. If any of the orderlies saw her crying, would they make Cassie leave? He promised to help you adopt a child? That must have given you a lot of hope. I filled out all the paperwork. He helped me, but they denied me. Do you know why? They didn't think I could handle having another child. A spark of anger flashed across her face, but she didn't have enough energy to carry it through. They said it wouldn't have grown up in a good environment, but they didn't understand. They didn't know I'd do anything for another son. Is that when you saw Sebastian? The little boy in the park? He looked just like Ethan. Just like him. Her eyes misted over. And when Henry found out, he was furious at first. But only at first. Why only at first? He told me he was mad that the agency had rejected my application. That it wasn't right. That they turned away hundreds of people every year who deserved to have kids. He wanted to help people like that, people like me. What did he do with Sebastian? He let me keep him. He told me he wouldn't tell anyone, that it would be our secret. But I had to help him keep a secret too. Cassie leaned forward. It wasn't hard to read between the lines. Sherry must have had a psychotic break after losing her child, and Henry took advantage of that. None of the reports Cassie had ever read about the man had indicated he was delusional like Sherry. Whatever he'd done to those children, he'd done of sound mind and body. 
And he had been smart enough to get away with all but one for several decades. What secret did he want you to keep? Sherry's breathing rattled in her chest. She coughed into the tissue, and Cassie gave her a clean one. It was hard not to keep pressing the woman, knowing that the pauses in between every word, every sentence, every answer, were ticking down the seconds until Cassie's time was up. Hank told me he wanted to help people like me, people who couldn't adopt their own babies. Another cough, another rattling breath. He asked me if I would help him take care of the kids while they were waiting to be adopted. He bought me a house away from the city. All I had to do was take care of everyone. Did you like doing that? Being a mother was the best thing that ever happened to me. But that didn't mean she was good at it. Ethan had died on her watch, and so it seemed, did Sebastian. Whatever happened to that little boy from the park? Sherry looked out the window. Clouds were moving in, and her face was more visible in the glass now. Her lip trembled. He was a good boy, but he cried a lot. Sometimes I couldn't take it. I would get headaches, and I'd get mad. But I never put a hand on him, never. She looked at Cassie to make sure the young woman understood this before she continued. But I would make him sleepy to calm him down. And one day, he didn't wake up. Cassie was full of questions, but every single one of them sounded like an accusation. Her blood was boiling, but even though Sherry Miller was the reason Sebastian died, she knew it was Henry Fitzpatrick who was the real culprit. Do you understand what happened to him, Sherry? Sherry nodded, but her silent sobs kept her from speaking. What happened after that? How did Hank react? Sherry took a moment. He took him away, told me it would be okay, that he'd bring my son back one day. I believed him. Cassie's voice was soft. You already found him once. You thought you'd find him again. When Sherry nodded, Cassie pulled up a photo of Sarah. Do you remember her? Sherry took the phone and held it close. She smiled. Sweet little Sarah. She cried a lot too. I did the best I could, but she upset the others. She was always asking to go home. Henry told me she needed to sleep too. Cassie's stomach churned. Sarah had met the same fate as Sebastian. Is that what happened? She was so tiny. I only gave her a little. I just wanted her to be quiet. But she slept too, just like Ethan. Cassie swallowed the bile stuck in her throat and took her phone back. What about the other kids? Did you make them sleep too? Sherry shook her head. Most of them were good. They'd be quiet if you gave them some food or a toy. Those were the ones we could give to the people who wanted them. She didn't bother keeping the accusation out of her voice this time. You didn't think their parents wanted them? Some of them came in with bruises. Some were bad. They just needed attention and love. I did that, for Ethan. So he would come back to me someday. Cassie took a deep breath. Sarah hadn't had any bruises. She hadn't been a bad kid. It was only because Sherry Miller had seen her out in those woods that night. So, Hank would take the kids, and they wouldn't come back after that. Did that make you sad? Sometimes, but then he would bring more, and I would be happy again. Did he ever find Ethan again? Only in my dreams. She looked around the room. Sometimes he visits me, but he doesn't stay for very long. Cassie followed the woman's gaze, half expecting Sebastian to be standing there in the corner, staring at them. But the room only held the living, and for once, Cassie was glad the little boy wasn't there. Seeing him would make her heart break all over again. What happened to Hank? One day, he took us on a trip. He asked me to put the kids to sleep, so I did. 
Then we all went camping in the woods. Cassie didn't have to ask what happened next, but she felt compelled to anyway. They didn't wake up, did they? They were so peaceful, always happier when they were asleep. Someone cleared their throat behind Cassie. She turned to see a muscular man holding a tray with a sandwich and a bowl of fruit. Sorry to interrupt, but Miss Miller needs to eat her lunch now. That's okay. Can I have one more minute with her? The man nodded and stepped just out of earshot. Cassie turned back to Sherry. She still had so many questions. How she escaped Hank, if she knew the names of the other kids who'd been kidnapped, what happened to the kids who weren't put to sleep. But she only had time for one more. Do you remember where you went camping? Was the drive very long? We didn't drive. We walked. Sherry smiled. The kids were so excited. They weren't usually allowed in the backyard. They're so easy to entertain at that age. Cassie took a deep breath. She was caught between pity and anguish. Thank you for talking to me, Sherry. I appreciate it. Sherry smiled and looked for the man with the tray. He walked over and handed it to her, then wheeled her over to a table. Cassie had learned so much, and yet there were so many gaps in the story. But she knew what had happened to Sebastian, and she knew what had happened to Sarah. She had gotten some semblance of closure. She stopped the recorder. Cassie now had enough information to hand over to the police. It would be up to them to close this case, to ensure Henry Fitzpatrick rotted in jail for the rest of his life. Cassie wasn't sure what would happen to Sherry, given her condition. After Hank's manipulation and years of convincing herself she was trying to help them, Sherry Miller couldn't fully understand what Hank had made her do when she was at the lowest point in her life. And it would be up to a judge to decide if she should spend the rest of her life living with the consequences of her actions. What mattered most now was finding the bodies of the kids she'd put to sleep. Maybe Cassie would finally be able to tell Mrs. Lennox where her little girl was buried. Chapter 43 Cassie held herself together until she reached her car. But as soon as she shut the door behind her, the tears flowed with abandon. There was no controlling them, and she cried until she had no more tears left. Twenty-five years after her best friend had disappeared, Cassie had answers, not only about Sarah, but about herself. Her subconscious had tried to convince her it was her fault Sarah died. Cassie hadn't understood how much that had been weighing her down until she realized it was pure coincidence Sarah had been taken. If they had been staying at Cassie's house that night, she or her sister could have been the next victim. It should have been Cassie, but it wasn't. And she'd never be able to apologize to Sarah for that. Cassie dried her eyes. She put her car into drive. Savannah was a blur as she drove through the city. Purpose kept her from crying again. There was no guarantee they'd recover Sarah's body, but that didn't mean Cassie couldn't pay her respects at her gravesite, even if it was empty. When Cassie pulled into the graveyard parking lot, she let her sadness wash over her again. But this time, it felt different. Instead of guilt or anger or pain, it felt like grief, mourning. She finally had some answers, and soon enough, maybe the rest of the world would too. Cassie dialed David's phone number. It immediately went to voicemail. Part of her was relieved. Her knowledge weighed her down, but she wasn't ready to relive it. Maybe that could wait until tomorrow. Hey, it's me. Sorry to keep bugging you, but I talked to someone today who I think may have information about what happened to Sarah and some of the other kids who went missing around the same time as her. When you have a chance, call me back. I think we can finally give those families the answers they deserve. Cassie tucked her phone in her pocket and pushed open the car door, despite the heaviness of her limbs. 
It felt as though weights had been tied around her ankles, but she dragged herself through the gate and down the left path. She had visited Sarah's grave when she was younger, and even though it had been years, she knew right where to find it. The gravestone was made of pink granite. Despite the clouds in the sky, it still sparkled with the kind of joy Sarah had brought into her life. How different would everything have been if Sarah were still alive? Would Cassie be the person she was? Would she have been attacked by Novak? Would she have ever lost her abilities? Would she be helping people the way she was today? Questions like that did her no good, but they were hard to ignore. Cassie bent down and pressed a hand against Sarah's engraved name. The graves around Sarah's sang to her like a symphony of bones, but Sarah's voice wasn't amongst them. Until they found her body, she'd remain silent forever. When Cassie stood, she saw Sebastian standing a few feet away. The other spirits made a wide berth around them, as though they knew the significance of this moment. Part of her wished Sarah could have been there, but Sebastian held a special place in her heart, too. She would never forget him, and she hoped he would never forget her. Thank you. Her voice was a whisper, but they didn't need words to communicate. For your help, for Sarah, you can rest now. For the first time since she had met him, Sebastian smiled. It was just a quirk of his lips, but it was unmistakable. As he faded, the image was burned into her mind. She would remember his smile for the rest of her life, and it would bring her comfort and hope. Cassie's phone vibrated in her pocket. She wanted to live in the moment for a few minutes longer, but when she saw it was Harris, something deep in the pit of her stomach told her to answer. Hey. Her throat was raw from crying. What's up? Cassie. Harris's voice was low, quiet. Am I interrupting? No. She was on high alert now. What's wrong? I don't really know how to say this. It doesn't feel real. Adelaide. Cassie's heart sank right into the ground next to Sarah's empty grave. What happened? It's David. Cassie felt the bile rising in her throat. She didn't know what to say, didn't know if she could speak anymore, didn't remember how to breathe. He's dead. This has been Symphony of Bones, a Cassie Quinn mystery. Written by L.T. Ryan and K.M. Rott. Narrated by Patricia Santomaso and Sean Patrick Hopkins, members of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2021 by Liquid Mind Media. Production copyright 2021 by Liquid Mind Media.